Story One of Wounds in the Rain War Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. Story One The Price of the Harness. Parts One, Two, and Three. One. Twenty-five men were making a road out of a path up the hillside. The light batteries in the rear were impatient to advance, but first must be done all that digging and smoothing which gains no encrusted metals from war. The men worked like gardeners, and a road was growing from the old pack-animal trail. Trees arched from a field of guinea-grass which resembled young wild corn. The day was still and dry. The men working were dressed in the consistent blue of United States regulars. They looked indifferent, almost stolid, despite the heat and the labor. There was little talking. From time to time a government pack-train, led by a sleek-sided, tender bell-mare, came from one way or the other way, and the men stood aside as the strong, hard, black and tan animals crowded eagerly after their curious little feminine leader. A volunteer staff officer appeared, and, sitting on his horse in the middle of the work, asked the sergeant in command some questions which were apparently not relevant to any military business. Men straggling along on various duties almost invariably spun some kind of a joke as they passed. A corporal and four men were guarding boxes of spare ammunition at the top of the hill, and one of the number often went to the foot of the hill swinging canteens. The day wore down to the Cuban dusk, in which the shadows are all grim and of ghostly shape. The men began to lift their eyes from the shovels and picks, and glance in the direction of their camp. The sun threw his last glance through the foliage. The steep mountain range on the right turned blue and as without detail as a curtain. The tiny ruby of light ahead meant that the ammunition guard were cooking their supper. From somewhere in the world came a single rifle shot. Figures appeared, dim in the shadow of the trees. A murmur, a sigh of quiet relief, arose from the working party. Later they swung up the hill in an unformed formation, being always like soldiers and unable even to carry a spade save like United States regular soldiers. As they passed through some fields, the bland white light of the end of the day feebly touched each hard bronze profile. "'Wonderful get anything to eat,' said Watkins in a low voice. I "'Should think so,' said Nolan in the same tone. They betrayed no impatience, they seemed to feel a kind of awe of the situation. The sergeant turned. One could see the cool grey eye flashing under the brim of the campaign hat. "'What in hell you fellers kickin' about?' he asked. They made no reply, understanding that they were being suppressed. As they moved on, a murmur arose from the tall grass on either side. It was the noise from the bivouac of ten thousand men, although one saw practically nothing from the low-cart roadway. The sergeant led his party up a wet clay bank and into a trampled field. Here were scattered tiny white shelter tents, and in the darkness they were luminous, like the rearing stones in a graveyard. A few fires burned blood-red, and the shadowy figures of men moved with no more expression of detail than there is in the swaying of foliage on a windy night. The working party felt their way to where their tents were pitched. A man suddenly cursed. He had mislaid something, and he knew he was not going to find it that night. Watkins spoke again with the monotony of a clock. "'Wonder if we'll get anything to eat.' Martin, with eyes turned pensively to the stars, began a treatise. Them Spaniards! Oh, quit it! cried Nolan. What the piper do you know about the Spaniards, you fat-headed Dutchman? Better think of your belly, you blundering swine, and what you're going to put in it, grass or dirt. 
A laugh, a sort of a deep growl, arose from the prostrate men. In the meantime the sergeant had reappeared and was standing over them. "'No rations to-night,' he said gruffly, and, turning on his heel, walked away. This announcement was received in silence, but Watkins had flung himself face downward, and putting his lips close to a tuft of grass, he formulated oaths. Martin arose, and, going to his shelter, crawled in sulkily. After a long interval, Nolan said aloud, Hell! Grierson, enlisted for the war, raised a querulous voice, Well, I wonder when we will get fed. From the ground about him came a low chuckle, full of ironical comment about Grierson's lack of certain qualities which the other men felt themselves to possess. 2. In the cold light of dawn the men were on their knees, packing, strapping, and buckling. The comic toy hamlet of shelter tents had been wiped out as if by a cyclone. Through the trees could be seen the crimson of a light battery's blankets, and the wheels creaked like the sound of a musketry fight. Nolan, well gripped by his shelter tent, his blanket, and his cartridge belt, and bearing his rifle, advanced upon a small group of men who were hastily finishing a can of coffee. "'Say, give us a drink, will ya?' he asked wistfully. He was as sad-eyed as an orphan beggar. Every man in the group turned to look him straight in the face. He had asked for the principal ruby out of each one's crown. There was a grim silence. Then one said, "'What fur?' Nolan cast his glance to the ground and went away, abashed. But he espied Watkins and Martin surrounding Grierson, who had gained three pieces of hardtack by mere force of his audacious inexperience. Grierson was fending his comrades off tearfully. "'Now don't be damned pigs,' he cried. "'Hold on a minute.' Here Nolan asserted a claim. Grierson groaned. Kneeling piously, he divided the hardtack with minute care into four portions. The men, who had had their heads together like players watching a wheel of fortune, arose suddenly, each chewing. Nolan interpolated a drink of water, and sighed contentedly. The whole forest seemed to be moving. From the field on the other side of the road a column of men in blue was slowly pouring. The battery had creaked on ahead. From the rear came a hum of advancing regiments. Then from a mile away rang the noise of a shot, then another shot. In a moment the rifles there were drumming, drumming, drumming. The artillery boomed out suddenly. A day of battle was begun. The men made no exclamations. They rolled their eyes in the direction of the sound, and then swept with a calm glance the forests and the hills which surrounded them, implacably mysterious forests and hills, which lent to every rifle shot the ominous quality which belongs to secret assassination. The whole scene would have spoken to the private soldiers of ambushes, sudden flank attacks, terrible disasters, if it were not for those cool gentlemen with shoulder-straps and swords, who, the private soldiers knew, were of another world and omnipotent for the business. The battalions moved out into the mud, and began a leisurely march in the damp shade of the trees. The advance of two batteries had churned the black soil into a formidable paste. The brown leggings of the men, stained with the mud of other days, took on a deeper color. Perspiration broke gently out on the reddish faces. With his heavy roll of blanket and the half of a shelter tent crossing his right shoulder and under his left arm, each man presented the appearance of being clasped from behind, wrestler fashion by a pair of thick white arms. There was something distinctive in the way they carried their rifles. There was the grace of an old hunter somewhere in it, the grace of a man whose rifle has become absolutely a part of himself. Furthermore, almost every blue shirt-sleeve was rolled to the elbow, disclosing forearms of almost incredible brawn. The rifles seemed light, almost fragile, in the hands that were at the end of these arms, 
never fat, but always with rolling muscles and veins that seemed on the point of bursting. And another thing was the silence and the marvellous impassivity of the faces as the column made its slow way toward where the whole forest spluttered and fluttered with battle. Opportunely, the battalion was halted a straddle of a stream, and before it again moved, most of the men had filled their canteens. The firing increased. Ahead and to the left, a battery was booming at methodical intervals, while the infantry racket was that continual drumming, which, after all, often sounds like rain on a roof. Directly ahead, one could hear the deep voices of field pieces. Some wounded Cubans were carried by in litters improvised from hammocks swung on poles. One had a ghastly cut in the throat, probably from a fragment of shell, and his head was turned as if Providence particularly wished to display this wide and lapping gash to the long column that was winding toward the front. And another Cuban, shot through the groin, kept up a continual wail as he swung from the tread of his bearers. Ay, ay, madre mia, madre mia! He sang this bitter ballad into the ears of at least three thousand men as they slowly made way for his bearers on the narrow woodpath. These wounded insurgents were then, to a large part of the advancing army, the visible messengers of bloodshed and death, and the men regarded them with thoughtful awe. This doleful, sobbing cry, Madre Mia, was a tangible, consequent misery of all that firing on in front, into which the men knew they were soon to be plunged. Some of them wished to inquire of the bearers the details of what had happened, but they could not speak Spanish, and so it was as if fate had intentionally sealed the lips of all in order that even meagre information might not leak out concerning this mystery, battle. On the other hand, many unversed private soldiers looked upon the unfortunate as men who had seen thousands maimed and bleeding, and absolutely could not conjure any further interest in such scenes. A young staff officer passed on horseback. The vocal Cuban was always wailing, but the officer wheeled past the bearers without heeding anything, and yet he never before had seen such a sight. His case was different from that of the private soldiers. He heeded nothing because he was busy, immensely busy, and hurried with a multitude of reasons and desires for doing his duty perfectly. His whole life had been a mere period of preliminary reflection for this situation, and he had no clear idea of anything save his obligation as an officer. A man of this kind might be stupid. It is conceivable that in remote cases certain bumps on his head might be composed entirely of wood, but these traditions of fidelity and courage, which have been handed to him from generation to generation, and which he has tenaciously preserved, despite the persecution of legislators and the indifference of his country, make it incredible that in battle he should ever fail to give his best blood and his best thought for his general, for his men, and for himself. And so this young officer in the shapeless hat and the torn and dirty shirt failed to heed the wails of the wounded man, even as the pilgrim fails to heed the world as he raises his illumined face toward his purpose, rightly or wrongly his purpose, his sky of the ideal of duty. And the wonderful part of it is that he is guided by an ideal which he has himself created and has alone protected from attack. The young man was merely an officer in the United States regular army. The column swung across a shallow ford and took a road which passed the right flank of one of the American batteries. On a hill it was booming and belching great clouds of white smoke. The infantry looked up with interest. Arrayed below the hill and behind the battery were the horses and limbers, the riders checking their pawing mounts, 
and behind each rider a red blanket flamed against the fervent green of the bushes as the infantry moved along the road some of the battery horses turned at the noise of the trampling feet and surveyed the men with eyes as deep as wells serene mournful generous eyes lit heart-breakingly with something that was akin to a philosophy a religion of self-sacrifice oh gallant gallant horses i know a feller in that battery said nolan musingly a driver damn sight rather be a gunner said martin why would ye said nolan opposingly well i'd take my chances as a gunner before i'd sit way up in the air on a raw-boned plug and get shot at ah began nolan they've had some losses to-day all right interrupted grierson horses asked watkins horses and men too said grierson how'd you know a feller told me there by the ford they kept only a part of their minds bearing on this discussion because they could already hear high in the air the wire-string note of the enemy's bullets three the road taken by this battalion as it followed other battalions is something less than a mile long in its journey across a heavily wooded plain it is greatly changed now in fact it was metamorphosed in two days but at that time it was a mere track through dense shrubbery from which rose great dignified arching trees it was in fact a path through a jungle the battalion had no sooner left the battery in rear when bullets began to drive overhead they made several different sounds but as these were mainly high shots it was usual for them to make the faint note of a vibrant string touched elusively half dreamily the military balloon a fat wavering yellow thing was leading the advance like some new conception of war god its bloated mass shone above the trees and served incidentally to indicate to the men at the rear that comrades were in advance the track itself exhibited for all its visible length a closely knit procession of soldiers in blue with breasts crossed with white shelter tents the first ominous order of battle came down the line use the cut-off don't use the magazine till you're ordered non-commissioned officers repeated the command gruffly a sound of clicking locks rattled along the columns all men knew that the time had come the front had burst out with a roar like a brush fire the balloon was dying dying a gigantic and public death before the eyes of two armies it quivered sank faded into the trees amid the flurry of a battle that was suddenly and tremendously like a storm the american battery thundered behind the men with a shock that seemed likely to tear the backs of their heads off the spanish shrapnel fled on a line to their left swirling and swishing in supernatural velocity the noise of the rifle bullets broke in their faces like the noise of so many lamp chimneys or sped overhead in swift cruel spitting and in the front the battle sound as if it were simply music was beginning to swell and swell until the volleys rolled like a surf the officers shouted hoarsely come on men hurry up boys come on now hurry up the soldiers running heavily in their accoutrements dashed forward a baggage guard was swiftly detailed the men tore their rolls from their shoulders as if the things were afire the battalion stripped for action again dashed forward come on men come on to them the battle was as yet merely a road through the woods crowded with troops who lowered their heads anxiously as the bullets fled high but a moment later the column wheeled abruptly to the left and entered a field of tall green grass the line scattered to a skirmish formation in front was a series of knolls treed sparsely like orchards and although no enemy was visible these knolls were all popping and spitting with rifle fire in some places there were to be seen long grey lines of dirt 
entrenchments. The American shells were kicking up reddish clouds of dust from the brow of one of the knolls, where stood a pagoda-like house. It was not much like a battle with men. It was a battle with a bit of charming scenery, enigmatically potent for death. Nolan knew that Martin had suddenly fallen. What? he began. They've hit me, said Martin. Jesus, said Nolan. Martin lay on the ground, clutching his left forearm just below the elbow, with all the strength of his right hand. His lips were pursed ruefully. He did not seem to know what to do. He continued to stare at his arm. Then suddenly the bullets drove at them, low and hard. The men flung themselves face downward in the grass. Nolan lost all thought of his friend. Oddly enough, he felt somewhat like a man hiding under a bed, and he was just as sure that he could not raise his head high without being shot as a man hiding under a bed is sure that he cannot raise his head without bumping it. A lieutenant was seated in the grass just behind him. He was in the careless and yet rigid pose of a man balancing a loaded plate on his knee at a picnic. He was talking in soothing, paternal tones. Now don't get rattled. We're all right here. Just as safe as being in church. They're all going high. Don't mind them. Don't mind them. They're all going high. We've got them rattled, and they can't shoot straight. Don't mind them. The sun burned down steadily from a pale blue sky upon the crackling woods and knolls and fields. From the roar of musketry it might have been that the celestial heat was frying this part of the world. Nolan snuggled close to the grass. He watched a gray line of entrenchments, above which floated the veriest gossamer of smoke. A flag lolled on a staff behind it. The men in the trench volleyed whenever an American shell exploded near them. It was some kind of infantile defiance. Frequently a bullet came from the woods directly behind Nolan and his comrades. They thought at the time that these bullets were from the rifle of some incompetent soldier of their own side. There was no cheering. The men would have looked about them, wondering where was the army, if it were not that the crash of the fighting for the distance of a mile denoted plainly enough where was the army. Officially the battalion had not yet fired a shot. There had been merely some irresponsible popping by men on the extreme left flank, but it was known that the lieutenant colonel, who had been in command, was dead, shot through the heart, and that the captains were thinned down to two. At the rear went on a long tragedy, in which men, bent and hasty, hurried to shelter with other men, helpless, dazed, and bloody. Nolan knew of it all from the hoarse and affrighted voices which he heard as he lay flattened in the grass. There came to him a sense of exultation. Here, then, was one of those dread and lurid situations which in a nation's history stand out in crimson letters, becoming a tale of blood to stir generation after generation. And he was in it, and unharmed. If he lived through the battle, he would be a hero of the desperate fight at blank. And here he wondered, for a second, what fate would be pleased to bestow as a name for this battle. But it is quite sure that hardly another man in the battalion was engaged in any thoughts concerning the historic. On the contrary, they deemed it ill that they were being badly cut up on a most unimportant occasion. It would have benefited the conduct of whoever were weak if they had known that they were engaged in a battle that would be famous forever. End of Section 1 Story One of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story One The Price of the Harness, Parts Four, Five, and Six. Four. Martin had picked himself up from where the bullet had knocked him and addressed the lieutenant. I'm hit, sir, he said. 
The lieutenant was very busy. "'All right, all right,' he said, just heeding the man enough to learn where he was wounded. "'Go over that way. You ought to see a dressing station under those trees.' Martin found himself dizzy and sick. The sensation in his arm was distinctly galvanic. The feeling was so strange that he could wonder at times if a wound was really what ailed him. Once, in this dazed way, he examined his arm. He saw the hole. Yes, he was shot. That was it. And more than in any other way it affected him with a profound sadness. As directed by the lieutenant, he went to the clump of trees, but he found no dressing station there. He found only a dead soldier lying with his face buried in his arms and with his shoulders humped high as if he were convulsively sobbing. Martin decided to make his way to the road, deeming that he thus would better his chances of getting to a surgeon. But he suddenly found his way blocked by a fence of barbed wire. Such was his mental condition that he brought up at a rigid halt before this fence and stared stupidly at it. It did not seem to him possible that this obstacle could be defeated by any means. The fence was there, and it stopped his progress. He could not go in that direction. But as he turned he espied that procession of wounded men, strange pilgrims, that had already worn a path in the tall grass. They were passing through a gap in the fence. Martin joined them. The bullets were flying over them in sheets, but many of them bore themselves as men who had now exacted from fate a singular immunity. Generally there were no outcries, no kicking, no talk at all. They too, like Martin, seemed buried in a vague but profound melancholy. But there was one who cried out loudly. A man, shot in the head, was being carried arduously by four comrades, and he continually yelled one word that was terrible in its primitive strength, Bread! 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 Following him and his bearers were a limping crowd of men, less cruelly wounded, who kept their eyes always fixed on him, as if they gained from his extreme agony some balm for their own sufferings. Bread! Give me bread! Martin plucked a man by the sleeve. The man had been shot in the foot, and was making his way with the help of a curved, incompetent stick. It is an axiom of war that wounded men can never find straight sticks. "'What's the matter with that feller?' asked Martin. "'Nutty,' said the man. "'Why is he?' "'Shot in the head,' answered the other, impatiently. The wail of the sufferer arose in the field amidst the swift rasp of bullets and the boom and shatter of shrapnel. Bread! Bread! Oh, God! Can't you give me bread! Bread! The bearers of him were suffering exquisite agony, and often they exchanged glances which exhibited their despair of ever getting free of this tragedy. It seemed endless. Bread! 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 But despite the fact that there was always in the way of this crowd a wistful melancholy, one must know that there were plenty of men who laughed, laughed at their wounds whimsically, quaintly inventing odd humours concerning bicycles and cabs, extracting from this shedding of their blood a wonderful amount of material for cheerful badinage and with their faces twisted from pain as they stepped, they often joked like music-hall stars, and perhaps this was the most tearful part of all. They trudged along a road until they reached a ford. Here, under the eave of the bank, lay a dismal company. In the mud, and in the damp shade of some bushes, were a half-hundred pale-faced men prostrate. Two or three surgeons were working there. Also there was a chaplain, grim-mouthed, resolute, his surtout discarded. Overhead always was that incessant, maddening wail of bullets. Martin was standing gazing drowsily at the scene when a surgeon grabbed him. Here, what's the matter with you? Martin was daunted. He wondered what he had done that the surgeon should be so angry with him. In the arm, he muttered, half shamefacedly. 
after the surgeon had hastily and irritably bandaged the injured member he glared at martin and said you can walk all right can't you yes sir said martin well now you just make tracks down that road yes sir martin went meekly off the doctor had seemed exasperated almost to the point of madness the road was at this time swept with the fire of a body of spanish sharpshooters who had come cunningly around the flanks of the american army and were now hidden in the dense foliage that lined both sides of the road they were shooting at everything the road was as crowded as a street in a city and at an absurdly short range they emptied their rifles at the passing people they were aided always by the oversweep from the regular spanish line of battle martin was sleepy from his wound he saw tragedy follow tragedy but they created in him no feeling of horror a man with a red cross on his arm was leaning against a great tree suddenly he tumbled to the ground and writhed for a moment in the way of a child oppressed with colic a comrade immediately began to bustle importantly here he called to martin help me carry this man will you martin looked at him with dull scorn i'll be damned if i do he said can't carry myself let alone somebody else this answer which rings now so inhuman pitiless did not affect the other man well all right he said here come some other fellers the wounded man had now turned blue-gray his eyes were closed his body shook in a gentle persistent chill occasionally martin came upon dead horses their limbs sticking out and up like stakes one beast mortally shot was besieged by three or four men who were trying to push it into the bushes where it could live its brief time of anguish without thrashing to death any of the wounded men in the gloomy procession the mule train with extra ammunition charged toward the front still led by the tinkling bell mare an ambulance was stuck momentarily in the mud and above the crack of battle one could hear the familiar abjurgations of the driver as he whirled his lash two privates were having a hard time with a wounded captain whom they were supporting to the rear he was half cursing half wailing out the information that he not only would not go another step toward the rear but that he was certainly going to return at once to the front they begged pleaded at great length as they continually headed him off they were not unlike two nurses with an exceptionally bad and headstrong little duke the wounded soldiers paused to look impassively upon this struggle they were always like men who could not be aroused by anything further the visible hospital was mainly straggling thickets intersected with narrow paths the ground being covered with men martin saw a busy person with a book and a pencil but he did not approach him to become officially a member of the hospital all he desired was rest and immunity from nagging he took seat painfully under a bush and leaned his back upon the trunk there he remained thinking his face wooden five my god said nolan squirming on his belly in the grass i can't stand this much longer then suddenly every rifle in the firing line seemed to go off of its own accord it was the result of an order but few men heard the order in the main they had fired because they heard others fire and their sense was so quick that the volley did not sound too ragged these marksmen had been lying for nearly an hour in stony silence their sights adjusted their fingers fondling their rifles their eyes staring at the entrenchments of the enemy the battalion had suffered heavy losses and these losses had been hard to bear for a soldier always reasons that men lost during a period of inaction are men badly lost the line now sounded like a great machine set to running frantically in the open air the bright sunshine of a green field to the prut of the magazine rifles was added the under chorus of the clicking mechanism steady and swift as if the hand of one operator was controlling it all 
It reminds one always of a loom, a great, grand, steel loom, clinking, clanking, plunking, plinking, to weave a woof of thin red threads, the cloth of death. By the men's shoulders, under their eager hands, dropped continually the yellow empty shells spinning into the crushed grass blades to remain there and mark for the belated eye the line of a battalion's fight. All impatience, all rebellious feeling, had passed out of the men as soon as they had been allowed to use their weapons against the enemy. They now were absorbed in this business of hitting something, and all the long training at the rifle ranges, all the pride of the marksmen, which had been so long alive in them, made them forget for the time everything but shooting. They were as deliberate and exact as so many watchmakers. A new sense of safety was rightfully upon them. They knew that those mysterious men in the high, far trenches in front were having the bullets sping in their faces with relentless and remarkable precision. They knew, in fact, that they were now doing the thing which they had been trained endlessly to do, and they knew that they were doing it well. Nolan, for instance, was overjoyed. Plug em, he said, plug em. He laid his face to his rifle as if it were his mistress. He was aiming under the shadow of a certain portico of a fortified house. There he could faintly see a long black line, which he knew to be a loophole cut for riflemen, and he knew that every shot of his was going there under the portico, mayhap through the loophole to the brain of another man like himself. He loaded the awkward magazine of his rifle again and again. He was so intent that he did not know of new orders until he saw the men about him scrambling to their feet and running forward, crouching low as they ran. "'Come on, boys, we can't be last. We're going up, we're going up!' He sprang to his feet, and, stooping, ran with the others. Something fine, soft, gentle, touched his heart as he ran. He had loved the regiment, the army, because the regiment, the army, was his life. He had no other outlook, and now these men, his comrades, were performing his dream scenes for him. They were doing as he had ordained in his visions. It is curious that in this charge he considered himself as rather unworthy. Although he himself was in the assault with the rest of them, it seemed to him that his comrades were dazzlingly courageous. His part, to his mind, was merely that of a man who was going along with the crowd. He saw Grierson biting madly with his pincers at a barbed wire fence. They were halfway up the beautiful sylvan slope. There was no enemy to be seen, and yet the landscape rained bullets. Somebody punched him violently in the stomach. He thought dully to lie down and rest, but instead he fell with a crash. The sparse line of men in blue shirts and dirty slouch hats swept on up the hill. He decided to shut his eyes for a moment, because he felt very dreamy and peaceful. It seemed only a minute before he heard a voice say, There he is! Grierson and Watkins had come to look for him. He searched their faces at once and keenly, for he had a thought that the line might be driven down the hill and leave him in Spanish hands. But he saw that everything was secure, and he prepared no questions. Nolan, said Grierson clumsily, do you know me? The man on the ground smiled softly. Of course I know you, you chowder-faced monkey. Why wouldn't I know you? Watkins knelt beside him. Where did they plug you, old boy? Nolan was somewhat dubious. It ain't much, I don't think, but it's somewheres there. He laid a finger on the pit of his stomach. They lifted his shirt, and then privately they exchanged a glance of horror. Does it hurt, Jimmy? said Grierson hoarsely. No, said Nolan. It don't hurt any, but I feel sort of dead to the world and numb all over. I don't think it's very bad. "'Oh, it's all right,' said Watkins. "'What I need is a drink,' said Nolan, grinning at them. "'I'm chilly, lying on this damp ground.' 
"'It ain't very damp, Jimmy,' said Grierson. "'Well, it is damp,' said Nolan, with sudden irritability. "'I can feel it. I'm wet, I tell you, wet through, just from lying here.' They answered hastily, "'Yes, that's so, Jimmy. It is damp. That's so. Just put your hand under my back and see how wet the ground is,' he said. Uh, "'No,' they answered. "'That's all right, Jimmy. We know it's wet.' "'Well, put your hand under and see,' he cried stubbornly. "'Oh, never mind, Jimmy.' "'No,' he said in a temper. "'See for yourself.' Grierson seemed to be afraid of Nolan's agitation, and so he slipped a hand under the prostrate man, and presently withdrew it covered with blood. Yes, he said, hiding his hand carefully from Nolan's eyes. You were right, Jimmy. Of course I was, said Nolan, contentedly closing his eyes. This hillside holds water like a swamp. After a moment he said, Guess I ought to know. I'm flat here on it, and you fellows are standing up. He did not know he was dying. He thought he was holding an argument on the condition of the turf. 6. "'Cover his face,' said Grierson, in a low and husky voice afterwards. "'What'll I cover it with?' said Watkins. They looked at themselves. They stood in their shirts, trousers, leggings, shoes. They had nothing. "'Oh,' said Grierson, "'here's his hat.' He brought it and laid it on the face of the dead man. They stood for a time. It was apparent that they thought it essential and decent to say or do something. Finally, Watkins said in a broken voice, "'Ah, oh, it's a damn shame!' They moved slowly off toward the firing line. In the blue gloom of evening, in one of the fever tents, the two rows of still figures became hideous charnel. The languid movement of a hand was surrounded with spectral mystery, and the occasional painful twisting of a body under a blanket was terrifying, as if dead men were moving in their graves under the sod. A heavy odor of sickness and medicine hung in the air. "'What regiment are you in?' said a feeble voice. Twenty-ninth Infantry,' answered another voice. Twenty-ninth? Why, the man on the other side of me is in the twenty-ninth. "'He is? Hey there, partner. Are you in the twenty-ninth? A third voice merely answered wearily, Martin, of C Company. What? Jack, is that you? It's part of me. Who are you? Grierson, you fathead. I thought you were wounded. There was the noise of a man gulping a great drink of water, and at its conclusion Martin said, I am. Well, what are you doing in the fever place, then? Martin replied with drowsy impatience, Got the fever, too. Gee, said Grierson. Thereafter there was silence in the fever tent, save for the noise made by a man over in a corner, a kind of man always found in an American crowd, a heroic, implacable comedian and patriot, of a humor that has bitterness and ferocity and love in it, and he was wringing from the situation a grim meaning by singing the star-spangled banner with all the ardor which could be procured from his fever-stricken body. Billy, cried Martin in a low voice, where's Jimmy Nolan? He's dead, said Grierson. A triangle of raw gold light shone on a side of the tent. Somewhere in the valley an engine's bell was ringing, and it sounded of peace and home as if it hung on a cow's neck. And where's Ike Watkins? Well, he ain't dead, but he got shot through the lungs. They say he ain't got much show. Through the clouded odors of sickness and medicine rang the dauntless voice of the man in the corner. End of Section 2 Story 2 of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 2 the Lone Charge of William B. Perkins He could not distinguish between a five-inch quick-firing gun and a nickel-plated ice-pick, and so naturally he had been elected to fill the position of war correspondent. 
The responsible party was the editor of the Minnesota Herald. Perkins had no information of war and no particular rapidity of mind for acquiring it, but he had that rank and fibrous quality of courage which springs from the thick soil of western America. It was morning in Guantanamo Bay. If the Marines encamped on the hill had had time to turn their gaze seaward, they might have seen a small newspaper dispatch boat wending its way toward the entrance of the harbor over the blue sunlit waters of the Caribbean. In the stern of this tug, Perkins was seated upon some coal bags while the breeze gently ruffled his greasy pajamas. He was staring at a brown line of entrenchments surmounted by a flag, which was Camp McCalla. In the harbor were anchored two or three grim gray cruisers and a transport. As the tug steamed up the radiant channel, Perkins could see men moving on shore near the charred ruins of a village. Perkins was deeply moved. Here already was more war than he had ever known in Minnesota. Presently, he, clothed in the essential garments of a war correspondent, was rowed to the sandy beach. Marines in yellow linen were handling an ammunition supply. They paid no attention to the visitor, being morose from the inconveniences of two days and nights of fighting. Perkins toiled up the zigzag path to the top of the hill, and looked with eager eyes at the trenches, the field pieces, the funny little colts, the flag, the grim marines lying wearily on their arms. And still more he looked through the clear air over a thousand yards of mysterious woods, from which emanated at inopportune times repeated flocks of Mauser bullets. Perkins was delighted. He was filled with admiration for these jaded and smoky men, who lay so quietly in the trenches waiting for a resumption of guerrilla enterprise but he wished they would heed him. He wanted to talk about it. Save for sharp, inquiring glances, no one acknowledged his existence. Finally he approached two young lieutenants, and in his innocent western way he asked them if they would like a drink. The effect on the two young lieutenants was immediate and astonishing. With one voice they answered, "'Yes, we would!' Perkins almost wept with joy at this amiable response, and he exclaimed that he would immediately board the tug and bring off a bottle of scotch. This attracted the officers, and in a burst of confidence one explained that there had not been a drop in camp. Perkins lunged down the hill and fled to his boat, where, in his exuberance, he engaged in a preliminary altercation with some whiskey. Consequently, he toiled again up the hill in the blasting sun, with his enthusiasm in no ways abated. The parched officers were very gracious, and such was the state of mind of Perkins that he did not note properly how serious and solemn was his engagement with the whiskey. And because of this fact, and because of his antecedents, there happened the lone charge of William B. Perkins. Now, as Perkins went down the hill, something happened. A private in those high trenches found that a cartridge was clogged in his rifle. It then becomes necessary with most kinds of rifles to explode the cartridge. The private took the rifle to his captain and explained the case. But it would not do in that camp to fire a rifle for mechanical purposes and without warning, because the eloquent sound would bring six hundred tired marines to tension and high expectancy. So the captain turned and in a loud voice announced to the camp that he found it necessary to shoot into the air. The communication rang sharply from voice to voice. Then the captain raised the weapon and fired. Whereupon, and whereupon, a large line of guerrillas lying in the bushes decided swiftly that their presence and position were discovered, and swiftly they volleyed. In a moment the woods and the hills were alive with the crack and sputter of rifles. Men on the warships in the harbor heard the old familiar flut flut fluttery flut 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 from the entrenchments. Incidentally, the launch of the Marblehead, commanded by one of our headlong American ensigns, streaked for the strategic woods like a galloping marine dragoon, 
peppering away with its blunderbuss in the bow. Perkins had arrived at the foot of the hill, where began the arrangement of a hundred and fifty marines that protected the short line of communication between the main body and the beach. These men had all swarmed into line behind fortifications improvised from the boxes of provisions and to them were gathering naked men who had been bathing, naked men who arrayed themselves speedily in cartridge belts and rifles. The woods and the hills went flut, flut, fluttery, flut, flut, fluttery, flut. Under the boughs of a beautiful tree lay five wounded men, thinking vividly. And now it befell Perkins to discover a Spaniard in the bush. The distance was some five hundred yards. In a loud voice he announced his perception. He also declared hoarsely that if he only had a rifle, he would go and possess himself of this particular enemy. Immediately an amiable lad shot in the arm said, Well, take mine. Perkins thus acquired a rifle and a clip of five cartridges. Come on, he shouted. This part of the battalion was lying very tight, not yet being engaged, but not knowing when the business would swirl around to them. To Perkins they replied with a roar, come back here you blank fool do you want to get shot by your own crowd come back blank blank as a detail it might be mentioned that the fire from a part of the hill swept the journey upon which perkins had started now behold the solitary perkins adrift in the storm of fighting even as a champagne jacket of straw is lost in a great surf he found it out quickly Four seconds elapsed before he discovered that he was an almshouse idiot plunging through hot, crackling thickets on a June morning in Cuba. Swing, singing, pop, went the lightning-swift metal grasshoppers over him and beside him. The beauties of rural Minnesota illuminated his conscience with the gold of lazy corn, with the sleeping green of meadows, with the cathedral gloom of pine forests swip swing pop perkins decided that if he cared to extract himself from a tangle of imbecility he must shoot the entire situation was that he must shoot it was necessary that he should shoot nothing would save him but shooting it is a law that men thus decide when the waters of battle close over their minds so, with a prayer that the Americans would not hit him in the back, nor the left side, and that the Spaniards would not hit him in the front, he knelt like a supplicant alone in the desert of Chaparral, and emptied his magazine at his Spaniard before he discovered that his Spaniard was a bit of dried palm branch. Then Perkins flurried like a fish. His reason for being was a Spaniard in the bush. When the Spaniard turned into a dried palm branch, he could no longer furnish himself with one adequate reason. Then did he dream frantically of some anthracite hiding place, some profound dungeon of peace, where blind mules live placidly, chewing the far gathered hay. Swing, bing, pop, pruk, pruk, pruk. Then a field gun spoke. Boom, ra, swa, ra, 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 boom then a colt automatic began to bark crack 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 endlessly raked enfiladed flanked surrounded and overwhelmed what hope was there for william b perkins of the minnesota herald but war is a spirit war provides for those that it loves it provides sometimes death and sometimes a singular and incredible safety there were few ways in which it was possible to preserve perkins one way was by means of a steam boiler perkins espied near him an old rusty steam boiler lying in the bushes war only knows how it was there but there it was a temple shining resplendent with safety with a moan of haste perkins flung himself through that hole which expressed the absence of the steam pipe then, ensconced in his boiler, Perkins comfortably listened to the ring of a fight which seemed to be in the air above him. Sometimes bullets struck their strong, swift blow against the boiler's sides, but none entered to interfere with Perkins' rest. Time passed. The fight, 
short anyhow, dwindled to prut, 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 prut. And when the silence came, Perkins might have been seen cautiously protruding from the boiler. Presently he strolled back toward the marine lines with his hat not able to fit his head for a few bumps of wisdom that were on it. The marines, with an annoyed air, were settling down again when an apparitional figure came from the bushes. There was great excitement. "'It's that crazy man!' they shouted, and as he drew near they gathered tumultuously about him and demanded to know how he had accomplished it. Perkins made a gesture, the gesture of a man escaping from an unintentional mud-bath, the gesture of a man coming out of battle, and then he told them. The incredulity was immediate and general. Yes, you did. What? In an old boiler? An old boiler? Out in that brush? Well, we guess not. They did not believe him until two days later, when a patrol happened to find the rusty boiler, relic of some curious transaction in the ruin of the Cuban sugar industry. The patrol then marveled at the truthfulness of war correspondence until they were almost blind. Soon after his adventure, Perkins boarded the tug, wearing a countenance of poignant thoughtfulness. End of Section 3 Story 3 of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 3 The Clan of No Name, Parts 1 through 6. Unwind my riddle, cruel as hawks the hours fly, wounded men seldom come home to die. The hard waves see an arm flung high, scorn hits strong because of a lie, yet there exists a mystic tie, unwind my riddle. She was out in the garden. Her mother came to her rapidly. Margarita, Margarita, Mr. Smith is here, come. Her mother was fat and commercially excited. Mr. Smith was a matter of some importance to all Tampa people, and since he was really in love with Margarita, he was distinctly of more importance to this particular household. Palm trees tossed their sprays over the fence toward the rutted sand of the street. A little foolish fish pond in the center of the garden emitted a sound of red fins flipping, flipping. No, mamma, said the girl, let Mr. Smith wait. I like the garden in the moonlight. Her mother threw herself into that state of virtuous astonishment, which is the weapon of her kind. Margarita! The girl evidently considered herself to be a privileged belle, for she answered quite carelessly, Oh, let him wait. The mother threw abroad her arms with a semblance of great high-minded suffering and withdrew. Margarita walked alone in the moonlit garden. Also an electric light threw its shivering gleam over part of her parade. There was peace for a time. Then suddenly, through the faint brown palings, was struck an envelope white and square. Margarita approached this envelope with an indifferent stride. She hummed a silly air, she bore herself casually, but there was something that made her grasp it hard, a peculiar muscular exhibition not discernible to indifferent eyes. She did not clutch it, but she took it, simply took it in a way that meant everything, and to measure it by vision it was a picture of the most complete disregard. She stood straight for a moment, then she drew from her bosom a photograph and thrust it through the palings. She walked rapidly into the house. 2. A man in garb of blue and white, something relating to what we call bed-ticking, was seated in a curious little cupola on the top of a Spanish blockhouse. The blockhouse sighted a white military road that curved away from the man's sight into a blur of trees. On all sides of him were fields of tall grass, studded with palms and lined with fences of barbed wire. 
The sun beat aslant through the trees, and the man sped his eyes deep into the dark tropical shadows that seemed velvet with coolness. These tranquil vistas resembled painted scenery in a theatre, and, moreover, a hot, heavy silence lay upon the land. The soldier in the watching-place leaned an unclean Mauser rifle in a corner, and, reaching down, took a glowing coal on a bit of palm-bark handed up to him by a comrade. The men below were mainly asleep. The sergeant in command drowsed near the open door, the arm above his head, showing his long, keen-angled chevrons attached carelessly with safety-pins. The sentry lit his cigarette and puffed languorously. Suddenly he heard from the air around him the querulous, deadly swift spit of rifle bullets, and an instant later the poppity pop of a small volley sounded in his face, close, as if it were fired only ten feet away. Involuntarily he threw back his head quickly, as if he were protecting his nose from a falling tile. He screamed in alarm and fell into the blockhouse. In the gloom of it, men, with their breaths coming sharply between their teeth, were tumbling wildly for positions at the loopholes. The door had been slammed, but the sergeant lay just within, propped up as when he drowsed, but now with blood flowing steadily over the hand that he pressed flatly to his chest. His face was in stark yellow agony. He chokingly repeated, Fuego, por Dios, hombres! The men's ill-conditioned weapons were jammed through the loopholes, and they began to fire from all four sides of the blockhouse, from the simple data, apparently, that the enemy were in the vicinity. The fumes of burnt powder grew stronger and stronger in the little square fortress. The rattling of the magazine locks was incessant, and the interior might have been that of a gloomy manufactory if it were not for the sergeant down under the feet of the men, coughing out, Por Dios, hombres, por Dios, fuego! 3. A string of five Cubans in linen that had turned earthy brown in color slid through the woods at a pace that was neither a walk nor a run. It was a kind of rack. In fact, the whole manner of the men, as they thus moved, bore a rather comic resemblance to the American pacing-horse. But they had come many miles since sun-up over mountainous and half-marked paths, and were plainly still fresh. The men were all practicals, guides. They made no sound in their swift travel, but moved their half-shod feet with the skill of cats. The woods lay around them in a deep silence, such as one might find at the bottom of a lake. Suddenly the leading practico raised his hand. The others pulled up short and dropped the butts of their weapons calmly and noiselessly to the ground. The leader whistled a low note, and immediately another practico appeared from the bushes. He moved close to the leader without a word, and then they spoke in whispers. There are twenty men and a sergeant in the blockhouse. And the road? One company of cavalry passed to the east this morning at seven o'clock. They were escorting four carts. An hour later one horseman rode swiftly to the westward. About noon ten infantry soldiers with a corporal were taken from the big fort and put in the first blockhouse to the east of the fort. There were already twelve men there. We saw a Spanish column moving up toward Mariel. No more? No more. Good. But the cavalry? It is all right. They were going a long march. The expedition is a half-league behind. Go and tell the general. The scout disappeared. The five other men lifted their guns and resumed their rapid and noiseless progress. A moment later no sound broke the stillness save the thump of a mango as it dropped lazily from its tree to the grass. So strange had been the apparition of these men, their dress had been so allied in color to the soil, their passing had so little disturbed the solemn rumination of the forest, and their going had been so like a spectral dissolution that a witness would have wondered if he had dreamed. Four. A small expedition had landed with arms from the United States, and had now come out of the hills and to the edge of a wood. 
Before them was a long grassed, rolling prairie marked with palms. A half mile away was the military road, and they could see the top of a blockhouse. The insurgent scouts were moving somewhere off in the grass. The general sat comfortably under a tree, while his staff of three young officers stood about him, chatting. Their linen clothing was notable from being distinctly whiter than those of the men who, one hundred and fifty in number, lay on the ground in a long brown fringe, ragged, indeed bare in many places, but singularly reposeful, unworried, veteran-like. The general, however, was thoughtful. He pulled continually at his little thin moustache. As far as the heavily patrolled and guarded military road was concerned, the insurgents had been in the habit of dashing across it in small bodies whenever they pleased, but to safely scoot over it with a valuable convoy of arms was decidedly a more important thing. So the general awaited the return of his practicals with anxiety. The still pompous betrayed no sign of their existence. The general gave some orders, and an officer counted off twenty men to go with him, and delay any attempt of the troop of cavalry to return from the eastward. It was not an easy task, but it was a familiar task, checking the advance of a greatly superior force by a very hard fire from concealment. A few rifles had often bade a strong column for sufficient length of time for all strategic purposes. The twenty men pulled themselves together tranquilly. They looked quite indifferent. Indeed, they had the supremely casual manner of old soldiers, hardened to battle as a condition of existence. Thirty men were then told off, whose function it was to worry and rag at the blockhouse, and check any advance from the westward. A hundred men, carrying precious burdens, besides their own equipment, were to pass in as much of a rush as possible between these two wings, cross the road, and skip for the hills, their retreat being covered by a combination of the two firing parties. It was a trick that needed both luck and neat arrangement. Spanish columns were forever prowling through this province in all directions and at all times. Insurgent bands, the lightest of light infantry, were kept on the jump, even when they were not incommoded by fifty boxes, each one large enough for the coffin of a small man, and heavier than if the little man were in it, and fifty small but formidable boxes of ammunition. The carriers stood to their boxes, and the firing parties leaned on their rifles. The general arose and strolled to and fro, his hands behind him. Two of his staff were jesting at the third, a young man with a face less bronzed and with very new accoutrement. On the strap of his cartouche were a gold star and a silver star placed in a horizontal line, denoting that he was a second lieutenant. He seemed very happy. He laughed at all their jests, although his eye roved continually over the sunny grasslands where was going to happen his first fight. One of his stars was bright, like his hopes, the other was pale, like death. Two practicos came racking out of the grass. They spoke rapidly to the general. He turned and nodded to his officers. The two firing parties filed out and diverged toward their positions. The general watched them through his glasses. It was strange to note how soon they were dim to the unaided eye. The little patches of brown in the green grass did not look like men at all. Practicos continually ambled up to the general. Finally he turned and made a sign to the bearers. The first twenty men in line picked up their boxes, and this movement rapidly spread to the tail of the line. The weighted procession moved painfully out upon the sunny prairie. The general, marching at the head of it, glanced continually back as if he were compelled to drag behind him some ponderous iron chain. Besides the obvious mental worry, his face bore an expression of intense physical strain, and he even bent his shoulders, unconsciously tugging at the chain to hurry it through this enemy-crowded valley. Five. 
The fight was opened by eight men who snuggled in the grass within three hundred yards of the blockhouse, suddenly blazed away at the bed ticking figure in the cupola and at the open door where they could see vague outlines. Then they laughed and yelled insulting language, for they knew that as far as the Spaniards were concerned, the surprise was as much as having a diamond bracelet turned to soap. It was this volley that smote the sergeant and caused the man in the cupola to scream and tumble from his perch. The eight men, as well as all the other insurgents within fair range, had chosen good positions for lying close, and for a time they let the blockhouse rage, although the soldiers therein could occasionally hear, above the clamor of their weapons, shrill and almost wolfish calls coming from men whose lips were laid against the ground. But it is not in the nature of them of Spanish blood and armed with rifles to long endure the sight of anything so tangible as an enemy's blockhouse without shooting at it, other conditions being partly favorable. Presently the steaming soldiers in the little fort could hear the spring and shiver of bullets striking the wood that guarded their bodies. A perfectly white smoke floated up over each firing Cuban, the penalty of the Remington rifle. But about the blockhouse there was only the lightest gossamer of blue. The blockhouse stood always for some big, clumsy, and rather incompetent animal while the insurgents, scattered on two sides of it, were little enterprising creatures of another species, too wise to come too near, but joyously raging at its easiest flanks, and drilling the lead into its sides in a way to make it fume and spit and rave like the tomcat when the glad free-band foxhound pups catch him in the lane. The men, outlying in the grass, chuckled deliriously at the fury of the Spanish fire. They howled opprobrium to encourage the Spaniards to fire more ill-used, incapable bullets. Whenever an insurgent was about to fire, he ordinarily prefixed the affair with a speech. Do you want something to eat? Yes. All right. Bang. Eat that. The more common expressions of the incredibly foul Spanish tongue were trifles light as air in this badinage, which was shrieked out from the grass during the spin of bullets and the dull rattle of the shooting. But at some time there came a series of sounds from the east that began in a few disconnected pruts and ended as if an amateur was trying to play the long roll upon a muffled drum. Those of the insurgents in the blockhouse attacking party, who had neighbors in the grass, turned and looked at them seriously. They knew what the new sound meant. It meant that the twenty men who had gone to the eastward were now engaged. A column of some kind was approaching from that direction, and they knew by the clatter that it was a solemn occasion. In the first place they were now on the wrong side of the road. They were obliged to cross it to rejoin the main body, provided, of course, that the main body succeeded itself in crossing it. To accomplish this, the party at the blockhouse would have to move to the eastward until out of sight or good range of the maddened little fort. But judging from the heaviness of the firing, the party of twenty who protected the east were almost sure to be driven immediately back. Hence, travel in that direction would become exceedingly hazardous. Hence, a man looked seriously at his neighbor. It might easily be that in a moment they were to become an isolated force and woefully on the wrong side of the road. Any retreat to the westward was absurd, since primarily they would have to widely circle the blockhouse, and more than that they could hear, even now in that direction, Spanish bugle calling to Spanish bugle, far and near, until one would think that every man in Cuba was a trumpeter, and had come forth to parade his talent. 6. The insurgent general stood in the middle of the road, gnawing his lips. Occasionally he stamped a foot and beat his hands passionately together. The carriers were streaming past him. 
patient, sweating fellows bowed under their burdens, but they could not move fast enough for him when others of his men were engaged both to the east and to the west, and he, too, knew from the sound that those to the east were in a sore way. Moreover, he could hear that accursed bugling, bugling, bugling in the west. He turned suddenly to the new lieutenant who stood beside him, pale and quiet. "'Did you ever think a hundred men were so many?' he cried, incensed to the point of beating them. Then he said longingly, "'Oh, for a half-hour, or even twenty minutes!' A practical racked violently up from the east. It is characteristic of these men that, although they take a certain roadster gait and hold it forever, they cannot really run, sprint, race. "'Captain Rodriguez is attacked by two hundred men, Signor, and the cavalry is behind them. He wishes to know—' The general was furious. He pointed, "'Go! Tell Rodriguez to hold his place for twenty minutes, even if he leaves every man dead.' the practico shambled hastily off. The last of the carriers were swarming across the road. The rifle drumming in the east was swelling out and out, evidently coming slowly nearer. The general bit his nails. He wheeled suddenly upon the young lieutenant. Go to Ba at the blockhouse. Tell him to hold the devil himself for ten minutes, and then bring his men out of that place." The long line of bearers was crawling like a dun worm toward the safety of the foothills. High bullets sang a faint song over the aide as he saluted. The bugles had in the west ceased, and that was more ominous than bugling. It meant that the Spanish troops were about to march, or perhaps that they had marched. The young lieutenant ran along the road until he came to the bend which marked the range of sight from the blockhouse. He drew his machete, his stunning new machete, and hacked feverishly at the barbed wire fence which lined the north side of the road at that point. The first wire was obdurate, because it was too high for his stroke, but two more cut like candy, and he stepped over the remaining one, tearing his trousers in passing on the lively serpentine ends of the severed wires. Once out in the field and bullets seemed to know him and call for him and speak their wish to kill him. But he ran on, because it was his duty and because he would be shamed before men if he did not do his duty, and because he was desolate out there all alone in the fields with death. A man running in this manner from the rear was in immensely greater danger than those who lay snug and close but he did not know it. He thought because he was five hundred, four hundred and fifty, four hundred yards away from the enemy, and the others were only three hundred yards away, that they were in far more peril. He ran to join them because of his opinion. He did not care to do it, but he thought that was what men of his kind would do in such a case. There was a standard, and he must follow it, obey it, because it was a monarch, the prince of conduct. A bewildered and alarmed face raised itself from the grass, and a voice cried to him, Drop, Manolo, drop, drop! He recognized Ba, and flung himself to the earth beside him. Why, he said, panting, what's the matter? Matter, said Ba, you are one of the most desperate and careless officers I know. When I saw you coming, I wouldn't have given a peseta for your life. Oh, no, said the young aide. Then he repeated his orders rapidly. But he was hugely delighted. He knew Ba well. Ba was a pupil of Masio. Ba invariably led his men. He never was a mere spectator of their battle. He was known for it throughout the western end of the island. The new officer had early achieved a part of his ambition to be called a brave man by established brave men. "'Well, if we get away from here quickly, it will be better for us,' said Ba, bitterly. "'I've lost six men killed and more wounded. Rodriguez can't hold his position there, and in a little time more than a thousand men will come from the other direction.' He hissed a low call, and later the young aide saw some of the men sneaking off with the wounded, lugging them on their backs as porters carry sacks. 
The fire from the blockhouse had become a weary, and, as the insurgent fire also slackened, Bas and the young lieutenant lay in the weeds listening to the approach of the eastern fight, which was sliding toward them like a door to shut them off. Bas groaned. I leave my dead. Look there. He swung his hand in a gesture, and the lieutenant, looking, saw a corpse. He was not stricken as he expected. There was very little blood. It was a mere thing. Time to travel, said Ba suddenly. His imperative hissing brought his men near him. There were a few hurried questions and answers. Then, characteristically, the men turned in the grass, lifted their rifles, and fired a last volley into the blockhouse, accompanying it with their shrill cries. Scrambling low to the ground, they were off in a winding line for safety. Breathing hard, the lieutenant stumbled his way forward. Behind him he could hear the men calling each to each, Seke, 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 go on, get out, get! Everybody understood that the peril of crossing the road was compounding from minute to minute. End of section 4「Story three of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story three The Clan of No Name Parts seven through nine. Seven. When they reached the gap through which the expedition had passed, they fled out upon the road like scared wild fowl tracking along a sea beach. A cloud of blue figures far up this dignified shaded avenue fired at once. The men already had begun to laugh as they shied one by one across the road. Seke, seke. The hard part for the nerves had been the lack of information of the amount of danger. Now that they could see it, they accounted it all the more lightly for their previous anxiety. Over in the other field, Ba and the young lieutenant found Rodriguez, his machete in one hand, his revolver in the other, smoky, dirty, sweating. He shrugged his shoulders when he saw them and pointed disconsolately to the brown thread of carriers moving toward the foothills. His own men were crouched in line just in front of him, blazing like a prairie fire. Now began the fight of a scant rear-guard to hold back the pressing Spaniards until the carriers could reach the top of the ridge a mile away. This ridge, by the way, was more steep than any roof. It conformed more to the sides of a French warship. Trees grew vertically from it, however, and a man burdened only with his rifle usually pulled himself wheezingly up in a sort of ladder-climbing process, grabbing the slim trunks above him. How the loaded carriers were to conquer it in a hurry no one knew. Rodriguez shrugged his shoulders as one who would say with philosophy, smiles, tears, courage, isn't this a mess? At an order, the men scattered back for four hundred yards with the rapidity and mystery of a handful of pebbles flung in the night. They left one behind who cried out, but it was now a game in which some were sure to be left behind to cry out. The Spaniards deployed on the road and for twenty minutes remained there, pouring into a field such a fire from their magazines as was hardly heard at Gettysburg. As a matter of truth, the insurgents were at this time doing very little shooting, being chary of ammunition. But it is possible for the soldier to confuse himself with his own noise, and undoubtedly the Spanish troops thought throughout their den that they were being fiercely engaged. Moreover, a firing line, particularly at night or when opposed to a hidden foe, is nothing less than an emotional cord a chord of a harp that sings because a puff of air arrives or when a bit of down touches it. This is always true of new troops or stupid troops, and these troops were rather stupid troops. But the way in which they mowed the verdure in the distance was a sight for a farmer. Presently the insurgents slunk back to another position where they fired enough shots to stir again the Spaniards into an opinion that they were in a heavy fight. But such a misconception could only endure for a number of minutes. 
Presently it was plain that the Spaniards were about to advance, and, moreover, word was brought to Rodriguez that a small band of guerillas were already making an attempt to worm around the right flank. Rodriguez cursed despairingly. He sent both Ba and the young lieutenant to that end of the line to hold the men to their work as long as possible. In reality, the men barely needed the presence of their officers. The kind of fighting left practically everything to the discretion of the individual, and they arrived at concert of action mainly because of the equality of experience in the wisdoms of bushwhacking. The yells of the guerrillas could plainly be heard, and the insurgents answered in kind. The young lieutenant found desperate work on the right flank. The men were raving mad with it, babbling, tearful, almost frothing at the mouth. Two terrible bloody creatures passed him, creeping on all fours, and one in a whimper was calling upon God, his mother, and a saint. The guerrillas, as effectually concealed as the insurgents, were driving their bullets low through the smoke at sight of a flame, a movement of the grass, or sight of a patch of dirty brown coat. They were no column of four soldiers. They were as slinky and snaky and quick as so many Indians. They were, moreover, native Cubans, and because of their treachery to the one-star flag, they never by any chance received quarter if they fell into the hands of the insurgents. Nor, if the case was reversed, did they ever give quarter. It was life and life, death and death. There was no middle ground, no compromise. If a man's crowd was rapidly retreating and he was tumbled over by a slight hit, he should curse the sacred graves that the wound was not through the precise center of his heart. The machete is a fine broad blade, but it is not so nice as a drilled hole in the chest. No man wants his deathbed to be a shambles. The men fighting on the insurgent's right knew that if they fell, they were lost. On the extreme right, the young lieutenant found five men in a little saucer-like hollow. Two were dead, one was wounded and staring blankly at the sky, and two were emptying hot rifles furiously. Some of the guerrillas had snaked into positions only a hundred yards away. The young man rolled in among the men in the saucer. He could hear the barking of the guerrillas and the screams of the two insurgents. The rifles were popping and spitting in his face, it seemed, while the whole land was alive with the noise of rolling and drumming. Men could have gone drunken in all this flashing and flying and snarling and den, but at this time he was very deliberate. He knew that he was thrusting himself into a trap whose door, once closed, opened only when the black hand knocked and every part of him seemed to be in panic-stricken revolt. But something controlled him. Something moved him inexorably in one direction. He perfectly understood that he was only sad, sad with a serene dignity, with the countenance of a mournful young prince. He was of a kind, that seemed to be it, and the men of his kind, on peak or plain, from the dark northern ice-fields to the hot wet jungles, through all wine and want, through all lies and unfamiliar truth, dark or light, the men of his kind were governed by their gods, and each man knew the law, and yet could not give tongue to it. But it was the law, and if the spirits of the men of his kind were all sitting in critical judgment upon him, even then in the sky, he could not have bettered his conduct. He needs must obey the law, and always with the law there is only one way. But from peak and plain, from dark northern ice-fields and hot wet jungles, through wine and want, through all lies and unfamiliar truth, dark or light, he heard breathed to him the approval and the benediction of his brethren. He stooped and gently took a dead man's rifle and some cartridges. The battle was hurrying, 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 but he was in no haste. His glance caught the staring eye of the wounded soldier, and he smiled at him quietly. The man, simple, doomed peasant, was not of his kind, but the law on fidelity was clear. 
He thrust a cartridge into the Remington and crept up beside the two unhurt men. Even as he did so, three or four bullets cut so close to him that all his flesh tingled. He fired carefully into the smoke. The guerrillas were certainly not now more than fifty yards away. He raised him coolly for his second shot, and almost instantly it was as if some giant had struck him in the chest with a beam. It whirled him in a great spasm back into the saucer. As he put his two hands to his breast, he could hear the guerrillas screeching exultantly, every throat vomiting forth all the infamy of a language prolific in the phrasing of infamy. One of the other men came rolling slowly down the slope while his rifle followed him, and striking another rifle, clanged out. Almost immediately the survivor howled and fled wildly. A whole volley missed him, and then one or more shots caught him as a bird is caught on the wing. The young lieutenant's body seemed galvanized from head to foot. He concluded that he was not hurt very badly, but when he tried to move he found that he could not lift his hands from his breast. He had turned to lead. He had had a plan of taking a photograph from his pocket and looking at it. There was a stir in the grass at the edge of the saucer, and a man appeared there, looking where lay the four insurgents. His negro face was not an eminently ferocious one in its lines, but now it was lit with an illimitable blood-greed. He and the young lieutenant exchanged a singular glance, then he came stepping eagerly down. The young lieutenant closed his eyes, for he did not want to see the flash of the machete. 8. The Spanish colonel was in a rage, and yet immensely proud, immensely proud, and yet in a rage of disappointment. There had been a fight, and the insurgents had retreated, leaving their dead. But still a valuable expedition had broken through his lines and escaped to the mountains. As a matter of truth, he was not sure whether to be wholly delighted or wholly angry, for well he knew that the importance lay not so much in the truthful account of the action as it did in the heroic prose of the official report, and in the fight itself lay material for a purple, splendid poem. The insurgents had run away. No one could deny it. It was plain even to whatever privates had fired with their eyes shut. This was worth a loud blow and splutter. However, when all was said and done, he could not help but reflect that if he had captured this expedition he would have been a brigadier-general, if not more. He was a short, heavy man with a beard who walked in a manner common to all elderly Spanish officers and to many young ones. That is to say, he walked as if his spine was a stick and a little longer than his body as if he suffered from some disease of the backbone, which allowed him but scant use of his legs. He toddled along the road, gesticulating disdainfully and muttering, Tsa! 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 He berated some soldiers for an immaterial thing, and as he approached the men stepped precipitately back as if he were a fire-engine. They were most of them young fellows, who displayed, when under orders, the manner of so many faithful dogs. At present they were black, tongue-hanging, thirsty boys, bathed in the nervous weariness of the after-battle time. Whatever he may truly have been in character, the colonel closely resembled a gluttonous and libidinous old pig, filled from head to foot with the pollution of a sinful life. Tsa! he snarled as he toddled, Sa! Sa! The soldiers saluted as they backed to the side of the road. The air was full of the odor of burnt rags. Over on the prairie, guerrillas and regulars were rummaging the grass. A few unimportant shots sounded from near the base of the hills. A guerrilla, glad with plunder, came to a Spanish captain. He held in his hand a photograph, Mira, senor, I took this from the body of an officer whom I killed machete to machete. The captain shot from the corner of his eye a cynical glance at the gorilla, a glance which commented upon the last part of the statement. Hm, he said. 
He took the photograph and gazed with a slow, faint smile, the smile of a man who knows bloodshed and homes and love, at the face of a girl. He turned the photograph presently, and on the back of it was written, One lesson in English I will give you, this, I love you, Margarita. The photograph had been taken in Tampa. The officer was silent for a half-minute, while his face still wore the slow, faint smile. Pobrecito, he murmured finally, with a philosophic sigh, which was brother to a shrug. Without deigning a word to the gorilla, he thrust the photograph in his pocket and walked away. High over the green earth, in the dizzy blue heights, some great birds were slowly circling with down-turned beaks. 9. Margarita was in the gardens. The blue electric rays shone through the plumes of the palm and shivered in feathery images on the walk. In the little foolish fish-pond some stalwart fish was apparently bullying the others, for often there sounded a frantic splashing. Her mother came to her rapidly. "'Margarita! Mr. Smith is here! Come!' "'Oh, is he?' cried the girl. She followed her mother to the house. She swept into the little parlour with a grand air, the egotism of a savage. Smith had heard the whirl of her skirts in the hall, and his heart, as usual, thumped hard enough to make him gasp. Every time he called he would sit waiting, with the dull fear in his breast that her mother would enter and indifferently announce that she had gone up to heaven, or off to New York with one of his dream rivals, and he would never see her again in this wide world. And he would conjure up tricks to then escape from the house without any one observing his face break up into furrows. It was part of his love to believe in the absolute treachery of his adored one. So whenever he heard the whirl of her skirts in the hall, he felt that he had again least happiness from a dark fate. She was rosily beaming, and all in white. "'Why, Mr. Smith!' she exclaimed, as if he was the last man in the world she expected to see. "'Good evening,' he said, shaking hands nervously. He was always awkward, and unlike himself, at the beginning of one of these calls. It took him some time to get into form. She posed her figure in operatic style on a chair before him, and immediately galloped off a mile of questions, information of herself, gossip, and general outcries, which left him no obligation but to look beamingly intelligent, and from time to time say, yes. His personal joy, however, was to stare at her beauty. When she stopped and wandered, as if uncertain which way to talk, there was a minute of silence, which each of them had been educated to feel was very incorrect, very incorrect indeed. Polite people always babbled at each other like two brooks. He knew that the responsibility was upon him, and although his mind was mainly upon the form of the proposal of marriage which he intended to make later, it was necessary that he should maintain his reputation as a well-bred man by saying something at once. It flashed upon him to ask, "'Won't you please play?' But the time for the piano ruse was not yet. It was too early. So he said the first thing that came into his head. Too bad about young Manolo Pratt being killed over there in Cuba, wasn't it? "'Wasn't it a pity?' she answered. They say his mother is heartbroken, he continued. They're afraid she's going to die. And wasn't it queer that we didn't hear about it for almost two months? Well, it's no use trying to get quick news from there. Presently they advanced to matters more personal, and she used upon him a series of star-like glances which rumpled him at once to squalid slavery. He gloated upon her, afraid afraid, yet more avaricious than a thousand misers. She fully comprehended. She laughed and taunted him with her eyes. She impressed upon him that she was like a will-o'-the-wisp, beautiful beyond compare, but impossible, almost impossible, at least very difficult, 
then again suddenly impossible, impossible, impossible. He was glum. He would never dare propose to this radiance. It was like asking to be Pope. A moment later there chimed into the room something that he knew to be a more tender note. The girl became dreamy as she looked at him, her voice lowered to a delicious intimacy of tone. He leaned forward. He was about to outpour his bully-ragged soul in fine words, when, presto, she was the most casual person he had ever laid eyes upon, and was asking him about the route of the proposed trolley-line. But nothing short of a fire could stop him now. He grabbed her hand. Margarita, he murmured gutturally, I want you to marry me. She glared at him in the most perfect lie of astonishment. What do you say? He arose, and she thereupon arose also, and fled back a step. He could only stammer out her name, and thus they stood, defying the principles of the dramatic art. I love you, he said at last. How, how do I know you really, truly love me, she said, raising her eyes timorously to his face, and this timorous glance, this one timorous glance, made him the superior person in an instant. He went forward as confident as a grenadier, and, taking both her hands, kissed her. That night she took a stained photograph from her dressing-table, and, holding it over the candle, burned it to nothing, her red lips meanwhile parted with the intentness of her occupation. On the back of the photograph was written, One lesson in English I will give you, this, I love you. For the word is clear only to the kind who, on peak or plain, from dark northern ice-fields to the hot wet jungles, through all wine and want, through lies and unfamiliar truth, dark or light, are governed by the unknown gods, and, though each man knows the law, no man may give tongue to it. End of section 5 Story 4 of Wounds in the Rain, War Stories, by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 4, God Rest Ye, Merry Gentlemen. Little Nell, sometimes called the Blessed Demoiselle, was a war correspondent for the New York Eclipse, and at sea on the dispatch boats he wore pajamas, and on shore he wore whatever fate allowed him, which clothing was in the main unsuitable to the climate. He had been cruising in the Caribbean on a small tug, a wash always, habitable never, wildly looking for Severa's fleet. Although what he was going to do with four armored cruisers and two destroyers in the event of his really finding them had not been explained by the managing editor. The cable instructions read, Take tug, go find Cervera's fleet. If his unfortunate nine-knot craft should happen to find these great twenty-knot ships, with their two spiteful and faster attendants, little Nell had wondered how he was going to lose them again. He had marveled, both publicly and in secret, on the uncompromising asininity of managing editors at odd moments, but he had wasted little time. The Jefferson G. Johnson was already cold, so he passed the word to his skipper, bought some tinned meats, cigars, and beer, and soon the Johnson sailed on her mission, tooting her whistle in graceful farewell to some friends of hers in the bay. So the Johnson crawled giddily to one wave height after another, and fell aslant into one valley after another for a longer period than was good for the hearts of the men, because the Johnson was merely a harbor tug with no architectural intention of parading the high seas, and the crew had never seen the decks all white water like a mere sunken reef. As for the cook, he blasphemed hopelessly hour in and hour out, meanwhile pursuing the equipment of his trade frantically from side to side of the galley. 
little nell dealt with a great deal of grumbling but he knew it was not the real evil grumbling it was merely the unhappy words of men who wished expression of comradeship for their wet forlorn half-starved lives to which they explained they were not accustomed and for which they explained they were not properly paid little nell condoled and condoled without difficulty he laid words of gentle sympathy before them and smothered his own misery behind the face of a reporter of the new york eclipse but they tossed themselves in their cockle-shell even as far as martinique they knew many races and many flags but they did not find cervera's fleet if they had found that elusive squadron this timid story would never have been written there would probably have been a lyric the johnson limped one morning into the mole st nicholas and there little nell received this dispatch can't understand your inaction what are you doing with the boat report immediately fleet transports already left tampa expected destination near santiago proceed there immediately place yourself under orders rogers eclipse one day steaming along the high luminous blue coast of santiago province they fetched into view the fleets a knot of masts and funnels looking incredibly inshore as if they were glued to the mountains then mast left mast and funnel left funnel slowly slowly and the shore remained still but the fleets seemed to move out toward the eager johnson at the speed of nine knots an hour the scene separated into its parts on an easily rolling sea under a crystal sky black hulled transports erstwhile packets lay waiting while grey cruisers and gunboats lay near shore shelling the beach and some woods from their grey sides came thin red flashes belches of white smoke and then over the water sounded boom 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 the crew of the jefferson g johnson forgave little nell all the suffering of a previous fortnight to the westward about the mouth of santiago harbor sat a row of castellated gray battleships their eyes turned another way waiting the johnson swung past a transport whose decks and riggings were aswarm with black figures as if a tribe of bees had alighted upon a log she swung past a cruiser indignant at being left out of the game her deck thick with white-clothed tars watching the play of their luckier brethren the cold blue lifting seas tilted the big ships easily slowly and heaved the little ones in the usual sinful way as if very little babes had surreptitiously mounted sixteen-hand trotting hunters the johnson leered and tumbled her way through a community of ships the bombardment ceased and some of the troop ships edged in near the land soon boats black with men and towed by launches were almost lost to view in the scintillant mystery of light which appeared where the sea met the land a disembarkation had begun the johnson sped on at her nine knots and little nell chaffed exceedingly gloating upon the shore through his glasses anon glancing irritably over the side to note the efforts of the excited tug then at last they were in a sort of a cove with troop ships newspaper boats and cruisers on all sides of them and over the water came a great hum of human voices punctuated frequently by the clang of engine-room gongs as the steamers manoeuvred to avoid jostling in reality it was the great moment the moment for which men ships islands and continents had been waiting for months but somehow it did not look it it was very calm a certain strip of high green rocky shore was being rapidly populated from boat after boat that was all like many preconceived moments it refused to be supreme but nothing lessened little nell's frenzy he knew that the army was landing he could see it and little did he care if the great moment did not look its part it was his virtue as a correspondent to recognize the great moment in any disguise 
the johnson lowered a boat for him and he dropped into it swiftly forgetting everything however the mate a bearded philanthropist flung after him a mackintosh and a bottle of whisky little nell's face was turned towards those other boats filled with men all eyes upon the placid gentle noiseless shore little nell saw many soldiers seated stiffly beside upright rifle barrows their blue breasts crossed with white shelter tent and blanket rolls launches screeched jack tars pushed or pulled with their boat hooks a beach was alive with working soldiers some of them stark naked little nell's boat touched the shore amid a babble of tongues dominated at that time by a single stern voice which was repeating fall in b company he took his mackintosh and his bottle of whisky and invaded cuba it was a trifle bewildering companies of those same men in blue and brown were being rapidly formed and marched off across a little open space near a pool near some palm trees near a house into the hills at one side a mulatto in dirty linen and an old straw hat was hospitably using a machete to cut open some green coconuts for a group of idle invaders at the other side up a bank a blockhouse was burning furiously while near it some railway sheds were smouldering with a little rogers engine standing amid the ruins gray almost white with ashes until it resembled a ghost little nell dodged the encrimsoned blockhouse and proceeded where he saw a little village street lined with flimsy wooden cottages some ragged cuban cavalrymen were tranquilly tending their horses in a shed which had not yet grown cold of the spanish occupation three american soldiers were trying to explain to a cuban that they wished to buy drinks a native rode by clubbing his pony as always the sky was blue the sea talked with a gravelly accent at the feet of some rocks upon its bosom the ships sat quiet as gulls there was no mention directly of invasion invasion for war save in the roar of the flames at the blockhouse but none even heeded this conflagration excepting to note that it threw out a great heat it was warm very warm it was really hard for little nell to keep from thinking of his own affairs his debts other misfortunes loves prospects of happiness nobody was in a flurry the cubans were not tearfully grateful the american troops were visibly glad of being released from those ill transports and the men often asked with interest where's the spaniards and yet it must have been a great moment it was a great moment it seemed made to prove that the emphatic time of history is not the emphatic time of the common man who throughout the change of nations feels an itch on his shin a pain in his head hunger thirst a lack of sleep the influence of his memory of past firesides glasses of beer girls theatres ideals religions parents faces hurts joy little nell was hailed from a comfortable veranda and looking up saw walkley of the eclipse stretched in a yellow and green hammock smoking his pipe with an air of having always lived in that house in that village oh dear little nell how glad i am to see your angel face again there don't try to hide it i can see it did you bring a corkscrew too you're superseded as master of the slaves did you know it and by rogers too rogers is a sadducee a cadaver and a pelican appointed to the post of chief correspondent no doubt because of his rare gift of incapacity never mind where is he now asked little nell taking seat on the steps he is down interfering with the landing of the troops answered walkley swinging a leg i hope you have the johnson well stocked with food as well as with cigars cigarettes and tobaccos ales wines and liquors we shall need them there is already famine in the house of walkley 
I have discovered that the system of transportation for our gallant soldiery does not strike in me the admiration which I have often felt when viewing the management of an ordinary bun-shop. A hunger, stifling, jammed together amid odours, and everybody irritable. Ye gods, how irritable! And so I, well, look, look! The Jefferson G. Johnson, well known to them at an incredible distance, could be seen striding the broad sea, the smoke belching from her funnel, headed for Jamaica. The army lands in Cuba, shrieked Walkley. Shafter's army lands near Santiago, special type, half the front page, oh, the Sadducee, the cadaver, the pelican. Little Nell was dumb with astonishment and fear. Walkley, however, was at least not dumb. That's the pelican. That's Mr. Rogers making his first impression upon the situation. He has engraved himself upon us. We are tattooed with him. There will be a fight to-morrow, sure, and we will cover it even as you found Cervera's fleet. No food, no horses, no money. I am transport lame. You are sea-weak. We will never see our salaries again whereby Rogers is a fool. "'Anybody else here?' asked Little Nell wearily. "'Only young Point.' Point was an artist on the eclipse. "'But he has nothing. Pity there wasn't an almshouse in this godforsaken country. Here comes Point now.' A sad-faced man came along, carrying much luggage. "'Hello, Point. Lithographer and genius. Have you food?' "'Food?' Well, then, you had better return yourself to Tampa by wire. You are no good here. Only one more little mouth to feed. Point seated himself near Little Nell. I haven't had anything to eat since daybreak, he said gloomily, and I don't care much, for I am simply dog-tired. Don't tell me you are dog-tired, my talented friend, cried Walkley from his hammock. Think of me, and now what's to be done? They stared for a time disconsolately at where, over the rim of the sea, trailed black smoke from the Johnson. From the landing-place below and to the right came the howls of a man who was superintending the disembarkation of some mules. The burning blockhouse still rendered its hollow roar. Suddenly the men-crowded landing set up its cheer, and the steamers all whistled long and raucously. Tiny black figures were raising an American flag over a blockhouse on the top of a great hill. "'That's mighty fine Sunday stuff,' said Little Nell. "'Well, I'll go and get the order in which the regiments landed, and who was first ashore, and all that. Then I'll go and try to find General Lawton's headquarters. His division has got the advance, I think. "'And, lo, I will write a burning description of the raising of the flag,' said Walkley, "'while the brilliant point buskies for food, and makes damn sure he gets it,' he added fiercely. Little Nell thereupon wandered over the face of the earth, threading out the story of the landing of the regiments. He only found about fifty men, who had been the first American soldier to set foot on Cuba, and of these he took the most probable. The army was going forward in detail as soon as the pieces were landed. There was a house something like a crude country tavern. The soldiers in it were looking over their rifles and talking. There was a well of water quite hot, more palm trees, an inscrutable background. When he arrived again at Walkley's mansion, he found the veranda crowded with correspondents in khaki, duck, dungaree, and flannel. They wore riding breeches, but that was mainly forethought. They could see now that fate intended them to walk. Some were writing copy, while Walkley discoursed from his hammock. Rhodes, doomed to be shot in action some days later, was trying to borrow a canteen from men who had one, and from men who had none. Young Point, wan, utterly worn out, was asleep on the floor. Walkley pointed to him. That is how he appears after his foraging journey, during which he ran all Cuba through a sieve. Oh, yes, a can of corn and a half-bottle of lime-juice. 
Say, does anybody know the name of the commander of the 26th Infantry? Who commands the 1st Brigade of Kent's Division? What was the name of the chap that raised the flag? What time is it? And a woeful man was wandering here and there with a cold pipe, saying plaintively, Who's got a match? Anybody here got a match? Little Nell's left boot hurt him at the heel, and so he removed it, taking great care and whistling through his teeth. The heated dust was upon them all, making everybody feel that bathing was unknown and shattering their tempers. Young Point developed a snore which brought grim sarcasm from all quarters. Always below hummed the traffic of the landing place. When night came, little Nell thought best not to go to bed until late, because he recognized the Mackintosh as but a feeble comfort. The evening was a glory. A breeze came from the sea, fanning spurts of flame out of the ashes and charred remains of the sheds, while overhead lay a splendid summer night sky, a flash with great tranquil stars. In the streets of the village were two or three fires, frequently and suddenly reddening with their glare the figures of low-voiced men who moved here and there. The lights of the transports blinked on the murmuring plain in front of the village, and far to the westward little Nell could sometimes note a subtle indication of a playing searchlight, which alone marked the presence of the invisible battleships, half-mooned about the entrance of Santiago Harbor, waiting, waiting, waiting. When little Nell returned to the veranda, he stumbled along a man-strewn place, until he came to the spot where he left his Mackintosh, but he found it gone. His curses mingled then with those of the men upon whose bodies he had trodden. Two English correspondents, lying awake to smoke a last pipe, reared and looked at him lazily. "'What's wrong, old chap?' murmured one. "'Huh? Lost it, huh? Well, look here. Come here and take a bit of my blanket. It's a jolly big one. Ah, no trouble at all, man. There you are. Got enough? Comfy? Good night.' A sleepy voice arose in the darkness. If this hammock breaks, I shall hit at least ten of those Indians down there. Never mind, this is war. The men slept. Once the sound of three or four shots rang across the windy night, and one head uprose swiftly from the veranda, two eyes looked dazedly at nothing, and the head as swiftly sank. Again a sleepy voice was heard usual thing, nervous sentries. The men slept. Before dawn a pulseless, penetrating chill came into the air, and the correspondence awakened, shivering into a blue world. Some of the fires still smoldered. Walkley and Little Nell kicked vigorously into Point's framework. Come on, brilliance, wake up, talent. Don't be sodgering. It's too cold to sleep, but it's not too cold to hustle. Point sat up dolefully. Upon his face was a childish expression. "'Where are we going to get breakfast?' he asked, sulking. "'There's no breakfast for you, you hound. Get up and hustle.' Accordingly they hustled. With exceeding difficulty they learned that nothing emotional had happened during the night, save the killing of two Cubans who were so secure in ignorance that they could not understand the challenge of two American sentries. Then Walkley ran a gamut of commanding officers, and Little Nell pumped privates for their impressions of Cuba. When his indignation at the absence of breakfast allowed him, Point made sketches. At the full break of day, the Adolphus and Eclipse dispatch boat sent a boat ashore with Taylor and Shackles in it, and Walkley departed tearlessly for Jamaica. Soon after he had bestowed upon his friends much tinned goods and blankets. "'Well, we've got our stuff off,' said little Nell. "'Now Point and I must breakfast.' Shackles, for some reason, carried a great hunting-knife, and with it little Nell opened a tin of beans. "'Fall to,' he said amiably, to point. There were some hard biscuits. Afterwards they, the four of them, marched off on the route of the troops. 
they were well loaded with luggage, particularly young Point, who had somehow made a great gathering of unnecessary things. Hills covered with verdure soon enclosed them. They heard that the army had advanced some nine miles with no fighting. Evidences of the rapid advance were here and there, coats, gauntlets, blanket rolls on the ground. Mule trains came herding back along the narrow trail to the sound of a little tinkling bell. Cubans were appropriating the coats and blanket rolls. The four correspondents hurried onward. The surety of impending battle weighed upon them always, but there was a score of minor things more intimate. Little Nell's left heel had chafed until it must have been quite raw, and every moment he wished to take a seat by the roadside and console himself from pain. Shackles and Point disliked each other extremely, and often they foolishly quarrelled over something or nothing. The blanket rolls and packages for the hand oppressed everybody. It was like being burned out of a boarding-house and having to carry one's trunk eight miles to the nearest neighbor. Moreover, Point, since he had stupidly overloaded, with great wisdom placed various cameras and other trifles in the hands of his three less burdened and more sensible friends. This made them fume and gnash, but in complete silence, since he was hideously youthful and innocent and unaware. They all wished to rebel, but none of them saw their way clear, because they did not understand. But somehow it seemed a barbarous project. No one wanted to say anything, cursed him privately for a little ass, but said nothing. For instance, Little Nell wished to remark, Point, you are not a thoroughbred in a half of a way. You are an inconsiderate, thoughtless little swine. But in truth, he said, Point, when you started out you looked like a Christmas tree. If we keep on robbing you of your bundles there soon won't be anything left for the children. Point asked dubiously, What do you mean? Little Nell merely laughed with deceptive good nature. They were always very thirsty. There was always a howl for the half-bottle of lime-juice. Five or six drops from it were simply heavenly in the warm water from the canteens. Point seemed to try to keep the lime-juice in his possession in order that he might get more benefit of it. Before the war was ended, the others found themselves declaring vehemently that they loathed Point, and yet when men asked them the reason, they grew quite inarticulate. The reasons seemed then so small, so childish, as the reasons of a lot of women, and yet at the time his offences loomed enormous. The surety of impending battle still weighed upon them. Then it came that Shackles turned seriously ill. Suddenly he dropped his own and much of Point's traps upon the trail, wriggled out of his blanket-roll, flung it away, and took seat heavily at the roadside. They saw with surprise that his face was pale as death, and yet streaming with sweat. "'Boys,' he said in his ordinary voice, "'I'm clean played out. I can't go another step. You fellows go on, and leave me to come as soon as I am able.' "'Oh, no, that wouldn't do at all,' said Little Nell and Taylor together. Point moved over to a soft place, and dropped, amid whatever traps he was himself carrying. "'Don't know whether it's ancestral or merely from the sun, but I've got a stroke,' said Shackles, and gently slumped over to a prostrate position before either Little Nell or Taylor could reach him. Thereafter Shackles was parental. It was Little Nell and Taylor who were really suffering from a stroke, either ancestral or from the sun. "'Put my blanket-roll under my head, Nell, me son,' he said gently. "'There, now, that is very nice. It is delicious. Why, I'm all right, only, only tired.' He closed his eyes, and something like an easy slumber came over him. Once he opened his eyes. "'Don't trouble about me,' he remarked. But the two fussed about him, nervous, worried, discussing this plan and that plan. It was Point who first made a business-like statement. 
seated carelessly and indifferently upon his soft place, he finally blurted out, "'Say, look here, some of us have got to go on. We can't all stay here. Some of us have got to go on.' It was quite true. The eclipse could take no account of strokes. In the end, Point and Taylor went on, leaving little Nell to bring on shackles as soon as possible. The latter two spent many hours in the grass by the roadside. They made numerous abrupt acquaintances with passing staff officers, privates, muleteers, many stopping to inquire the wherefore of the death-faced figure on the ground. Favors were done often and often by peer and peasant, small things of no consequence, and yet warming. It was dark when Shackles and Little Nell had come slowly to where they could hear the murmur of the army's bivouac. Shack gasped Little Nell to the man leaning forlornly upon him. I guess we'd better bunk down here where we stand. All right, old boy, anything you say, replied Shackles in the bass and hollow voice which arrives with such condition. They crawled into some bushes and distributed their belongings upon the ground. Little Nell spread out the blankets and generally played housemaid. Then they lay down, supperless, being too weary to eat. The men slept. At dawn Little Nell awakened and looked wildly for Shackles, whose empty blanket was pressed flat like a wet newspaper on the ground. But at nearly the same moment Shackles appeared elate. "'Come on!' he cried. "'I've rustled an invitation for breakfast.' Little Nell came on with celerity. "'Where? Who?' he said. "'Oh, some officers,' replied Shackles airily. If he had been ill the previous day, he showed it now only in some curious kind of deference he paid to Little Nell. Shackles conducted his comrade, and soon they arrived at where a captain and his one subaltern arose courteously from where they were squatting near a fire of little sticks. They wore the wide white trouser stripes of infantry officers, and upon the shoulders of their blue campaign shirts were the little marks of their rank. But otherwise there was little beyond their manners to render them different from the men who were busy with breakfast near them. The captain was old, grizzled, a common type of captain in the tiny American army, overjoyed at the active service, confident of his business, and yet breathing out in some way a note of pathos. The war was come too late. Age was grappling him, and honors were only for his widow and his children, merely a better life insurance policy. He had spent his life policing Indians with much labor, cold and heat, but with no glory for him nor his fellows. All he could now do was to die at the head of his men. If he had youthfully dreamed of a general's stars, they were now impossible to him, and he knew it. He was too old to leap so far. His sole honor was a new invitation to face death and yet, with his ambitions lying half-strangled, he was going to take his men into any sort of holocaust, because his traditions were of gentlemen and soldiers, and because, he loved it for itself, the thing itself, the whirl, the unknown. If he had been degraded at that moment to be a pot-wrestler, no power could have starved him from going through the campaign as a spectator. Why, the army! It was in each drop of his blood. The lieutenant was very young. Perhaps he had been hurried out of West Point at the last moment upon a shortage of officers appearing. To him all was opportunity. He was, in fact, in great luck. Instead of going off in 1898 to grill for an indefinite period on some godforsaken heap of red-hot sand in New Mexico, he was here, in Cuba, on real business with his regiment. When the big engagement came, he was sure to emerge from it either horizontally or at the head of a company, and what more could a boy ask? He was a very modest lad, and talked nothing of his frame of mind, but an expression of blissful contentment was ever upon his face. He really accounted himself the most fortunate boy of his time, 
and he felt almost certain that he would do well. It was necessary to do well. He would do well. And yet, in many ways, these two were alike. The grizzled captain with his gently mournful countenance, too late, and the elate young second lieutenant, his commission hardly dry. Here again it was the influence of the army. After all, they were both children of the army. It is possible to spring into the future here and chronicle what happened later. The captain, after thirty-five years of waiting for his chance, took his Mauser bullet through the brain at the foot of San Juan Hill in the very beginning of the battle and the boy arrived on the crest panting, sweating, but unscratched, and not sure whether he commanded one company or a whole battalion. Thus fate dealt to the hosts of Shackles and Little Nell. The breakfast was of canned tomatoes stewed with hard bread, more hard bread, and coffee. It was very good fare, almost royal. Shackles and Little Nell were absurdly grateful as they felt the hot bitter coffee tingle in them. But they departed joyfully before the sun was fairly up and passed into Siboney. They never saw the captain again. The beach at Siboney was furious with traffic, even as had been the beach at Daiquiri. Launches shouted, jack tars prodded with their boat hooks, and load of men followed load of men. Straight, parade-like, on the shore stood a trumpeter playing familiar calls to the troop horses who swam towards him eagerly through the salt seas. Crowding closely into the cove were transport of all sizes and ages. To the left and to the right of the little landing beach green hills shot upward like the wings in a theatre. They were scarred here and there with blockhouses and rifle pits. Up one hill a regiment was crawling, seemingly inch by inch. Shackles and Little Nell walked among palms and scrubby bushes, near pools, over spaces of sand, holding little monuments of biscuit boxes, ammunition boxes, and supplies of all kinds. Some regiment was just collecting itself from the ships, and the men made great patches of blue on the brown sand. Shackles asked a question of a man accidentally, "'Where's that regiment going to?' He pointed to the force that was crawling up the hill. The man grinned and said, "'They're going to look for a fight.' "'Looking for a fight,' said Shackles and Little Nell together. They stared into each other's eyes. Then they set off for the foot of the hill. The hill was long and toilsome. Below them spread wider and wider a vista of ships, quiet on a grey sea. A busy, black, disembarkation place, tall, still, green hills, a village of well-separated cottages, palms, a bit of road, soldiers marching. They passed vacant Spanish trenches, little twelve-foot blockhouses. Soon they were on a fine upland near the sea. The path, under ordinary conditions, must have been a beautiful wooded way. It wound in the shade of thickets of fine trees, then through rank growths of bushes with revealed and fantastic roots, then through a grassy space which had all the beauty of a neglected orchard. But always from under their feet scuttled noisy land crabs, demons to the nerves, which in some way possessed a semblance of moon-like faces upon their blue or red bodies, and these faces were turned with expressions of deepest horror upon Shackles and Little Nell as they sped to overtake the pugnacious regiment. The route was paved with coats, hats, tent and blanket rolls, ration tins, haversacks, anything but ammunition belts, rifles and canteens. They heard a dull noise of voices in front of them, men talking too loud for the etiquette of the forest, and presently they came upon two or three soldiers lying by the roadside, flame-faced, utterly spent from the hurried march in the heat. One man came limping back along the path. He looked to them anxiously for sympathy and comprehension. Hurt my knee. I swear I couldn't keep up with the boys. I had to leave them. Wasn't that tough luck? 
his collar rolled away from a red muscular neck and his bare forearms were better than stanchions yet he was almost babyishly tearful in his attempt to make the two correspondents feel that he had not turned back because he was afraid they gave him scant courtesy tinctured with one drop of sympathetic yet cynical understanding soon they overtook the hospital squad men addressing chaste language to some pack mules a talkative sergeant two amiable cool-eyed young surgeons soon they were amid the rear troops of the dismounted volunteer cavalry regiment which was moving to attack the men strode easily along arguing one to another on ulterior matters if they were going into battle they either did not know it or they concealed it well they were more like men going into a bar at one o'clock in the morning their laughter rang through the cuban woods and in the meantime soft mellow sweet sang the voice of the cuban wood dove the spanish gorilla calling to his mate forest music on the flanks deep back on both flanks the adorable wood dove singing only of love some of the advancing americans said it was beautiful it was beautiful the spanish gorilla called to his mate what could be more beautiful shackles and little nell rushed precariously through waist-high bushes until they reached the centre of the single-filed regiment the firing then broke out in front all the woods set up a hot sputtering the bullets sped along the path and across it from both sides the thickets presented nothing but dense masses of light green foliage out of which these swift steel things were borne supernaturally it was a volunteer regiment going into its first action against an enemy of unknown force in a country where the vegetation was thicker than fur on a cat there might have been a dreadful mess but in military matters the only way to deal with a situation of this kind is to take it frankly by the throat and squeeze it to death shackles and little nell felt the thrill of the orders come ahead men keep right ahead men come on the volunteer cavalry regiment with all the willingness in the world went ahead into the angle of v-shaped spanish formation it seemed that every leaf had turned into a soda bottle and was popping its cork some of the explosions seemed to be against the men's very faces often against the backs of their necks now men keep going ahead keep on going the forward troops were already engaged they at least had something at which to shoot now captain if you're ready stop that swearing there got a match steady now men a gate appeared in a barbed wire fence within were billowy fields of long grass dotted with palms and luxuriant mango trees it was elysian a place for lovers fair as eden in its radiance of sun under its blue sky one might have expected to see white-robed figures walking slowly in the shadows a dead man with a bloody face lay twisted in a curious contortion at the waist some one was shot in the leg his pins knocked cleanly from under him keep going men the air roared and the ground fled reelingly under their feet light shadow trees grass bullets spat from every side once they were in a thicket and the men blanched and bewildered turned one way and then another not knowing which way to turn keep going men soon they were in the sunlight again they could see the long scant line which was being drained man by man one might say drop by drop the musketry rolled forth in a great full measure from the magazine carbines keep going men christ i'm shot they're flanking us sir we're being fired into by our own crowd sir keep going men a low ridge before them was a bottling establishment blowing up in detail from the right it seemed at that time to be the far right they could hear steady crashing volleys the united states regulars in action then suddenly to use a phrase of the street the whole bottom of the thing fell out it was suddenly and mysteriously ended 
The Spaniards had run away, and some of the regulars were chasing them. It was a victory. When the wounded men dropped in the tall grass, they quite disappeared, as if they had sunk in water. Little Nell and Shackles were walking along through the fields, disputing. "'Well, damn it, man!' cried Shackles. "'We must get a list of the killed and wounded.' "'That is not nearly so important,' quoth Little Nell academically, "'as to get the first account to New York of the first action of the army in Cuba.' They came upon Taylor, lying with a bared torso and a small red hole through his left lung. He was calm, but evidently out of temper. "'Good God, Taylor!' they cried, dropping to their knees like two pagans. "'Are you hurt, old boy?' "'Hurt?' he said gently. "'No, tis not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church-door. But tis enough, do you see? You understand, do you? Idiots!' Then he became very official. Shackles, feel and see what's under my leg. It's a small stone or a burr or something. Don't be clumsy now. Be careful. Be careful. Then he said angrily, Oh, you didn't find it at all, damn it. In reality there was nothing there, and so Shackles could not have removed it. Sorry, old boy, he said meekly. Well, you may observe that I can't stay here more than a year, said Taylor, with some oratory, and the hospital people have their own work in hand. It behooves you, Nell, to fly to Saboni, arrest a dispatch boat, get a cot and some things, and some minions to carry me. If I get once down to the base, I'm all right, but if I stay here, I'm dead. Meantime, Shackles can stay here and try to look as if he liked it. There was no disobeying the man. Lying there with a little red hole in his left lung, he dominated them through his helplessness and through their fear that if they angered him he would move and bleed. Well, said Little Nell. Yes, said Shackles, nodding. Little Nell departed. That blanket you lent me, Taylor called after him, is back there somewhere with point. Little Nell noted that many of the men who were wandering among the wounded seemed so spent with the toil and excitement of their first action that they could hardly drag one leg after the other. He found himself suddenly in the same condition. His face, his neck, even his mouth felt dry as sun-baked bricks, and his legs were foreign to him. But he swung desperately into his five-mile task. On the way he passed many things, bleeding men carried by comrades, others making their way grimly with encrimsoned arms, then the little settlement of the hospital squad, men on the ground everywhere, many in the path, one young captain dying with great gasps, his body pale blue and glistening like the inside of a rabbit's skin. But the voice of the Cuban wood-dove, soft, mellow, sweet, singing only of love, was no longer heard from the wealth of foliage. Presently the hurrying correspondent met another regiment coming to assist, a line of a thousand men in a single file through the jungle. "'Well, how's it going, old man? How is it coming on? Are we doing em? Then, after an interval, came other regiments moving out. He had to take to the bush to let these long lines pass him, and he was delayed, and had to flounder amid brambles. But at last, like a successful pilgrim, he arrived at the brow of the great hill overlooking Siboni. His practiced eye scanned the fine broad brow of the sea with its clustering ships, but he saw thereon no eclipse dispatch boats. He zigzagged heavily down the hill, and arrived finally amid the dust and outcries of the base. He seemed to ask a thousand men if they had seen an eclipse boat on the water, or an eclipse correspondent on the shore. They all answered no. He was like a poverty-stricken and unknown suppliant at a foreign court. Even his plea got only ill hearings. He had expected the news of the serious wounding of Taylor to appall the other correspondents, but they took it quite calmly. It was as if their sense of an impending great battle between two large armies 
had quite got them out of focus for these minor tragedies. Taylor was hurt, yes? They looked at little Nell, dazed. How curious that Taylor should be almost the first. How very curious, yes. But as far as arousing them to any enthusiasm of active pity, it seemed impossible. He was lying up there in the grass, was he? Eh, too bad, too bad, too bad. Little Nell went alone and lay down in the sand with his back against a rock. Taylor was prostrate up there in the grass. Never mind. Nothing was to be done. The whole situation was too colossal. Then into his zone came Walkley, the invincible. Walkley! yelled Little Nell. Walkley came quickly, and Little Nell lay weakly against his rock and talked. In thirty seconds Walkley understood everything, had hurled a drink of whiskey into Little Nell, had admonished him to lie quiet, and had gone to organize and manipulate. When he returned he was a trifle dubious and backward. Behind him was a singular squad of volunteers from the Adolphus, carrying among them a wire-woven bed. "'Look here, Nell,' said Walkley, in bashful accents. "'I've collected a battalion here which is willing to go bring Taylor, but they say you, you can't show them where he is?' Yes, said little Nell, arising. When the party arrived at Saboni and deposited Taylor in the best place, Walkley had found a house and stocked it with canned soups. Therein Shackles and little Nell reveled for a time, and then rolled on the floor in their blankets. Little Nell tossed a great deal. Oh, I'm so tired! Good God, I'm tired! I'm tired! In the morning a voice aroused them. It was a swollen, important circus voice saying, Where is Mr. Nell? I wish to see him immediately. Here I am, Rogers, cried little Nell. Oh, Nell, said Rogers, here's a dispatch to me which I thought you had better read. Little Nell took the dispatch. It was, Tell Nell can't understand his inaction. Tell him come home first steamer from Port Antonio, Jamaica. End of section six. Story five of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five The Revenge of the Adolphus, parts one through four. One. Stand by! Shackles had come down from the bridge of the Adolphus and flung this command at three fellow correspondents who in the galley were busy with pencils trying to write something exciting and interesting from four days' quiet cruising. They looked up casually. What for? They did not intend to arouse for nothing. Ever since Shackles had heard the men of the Navy directing each other to stand by for this thing and that thing, he had used the two words as his pet phrase, and was continually telling his friends to stand by. Sometimes its portentous and emphatic reiteration became highly exasperating, and men were apt to retort sharply, "'Well, I am standing by, ain't I?' On this occasion they detected that he was serious. "'Well, what for?' they repeated. In his answer Shackles was reproachful as well as impressive. "'Stand by? Stand by for a Spanish gunboat. A Spanish gunboat in chase. Stand by for two Spanish gunboats, both of them in chase.' The others looked at him for a brief space and were almost certain that they saw truth written upon his countenance whereupon they tumbled out of the galley and galloped up to the bridge. The cook, with a mere inkling of tragedy, was now out on deck bawling, "'What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter?' Aft, the grimy head of a stoker, was thrust suddenly up through the deck, so to speak. The eyes flashed in a quick look astern, and then the head vanished. The correspondents were scrambling on the bridge. "'Where's my glasses, damn it?' here let me take a look are they spaniards captain are you sure 
The skipper of the _Adolphus_ was at the wheel. The pilot house was so arranged that he could not see astern without hanging forth from one of the side windows, but apparently he had made early investigation. He did not reply at once. At sea he never replied at once to questions. At the very first, Shackles had discovered the merits of this deliberate manner, and had taken delight in it. He invariably detailed his talk with the captain to the other correspondents. "'Look here, I've just been to see the skipper. I said, I would like to put up into Cape Hatian. Then he took a little think. Finally he said, "'All right.' Then I said, "'I suppose we'll need to take on more coal there?' He took another little think. I said, "'Ever ran into that port before?' He took another little think. Finally he said, "'Yes.' I said, "'Have a cigar?' He took another little think. "'See, that's where I fooled them.' While the correspondents spun the hurried questions at him, the captain of the Adolphus stood with his brown hands on the wheel and his cold glance aligned straight over the bow of his ship. "'Are they Spanish gunboats, Captain? Are they, Captain?' After a profound pause he said, "'Yes.' The four correspondents hastily, and in perfect time, presented their backs to him and fastened their gaze on the pursuing foe. They saw a dull grey curve of sea going to the feet of the high green and blue coastline of northeastern Cuba, and on this sea were two miniature ships with clouds of iron-coloured smoke pouring from their funnels. One of the correspondents strolled elaborately to the pilot-house, ah captain he drawled do you think they can catch us the captain's glance was still aligned over the bow of his ship ultimately he answered i don't know from the top of the little adolphus stack thick dark smoke swept level for a few yards and then went rolling to leeward in great hot obscuring clouds from time to time the grimy head was thrust through the deck the eyes took the quick look astern, and then the head vanished. The cook was trying to get somebody to listen to him. "'Well, you know, damn it all, it won't be no fun to be catched by them Spaniards. By God, it won't. Look here, what do you think they'll do to us, eh? Say, I don't like this, you know. I'm damned if I do.' The sea, cut by the hurried bow of the Adolphus, flung its waters astern in the formation of a wide angle, and the lines of the angle ruffled and hissed as they fled, while the thumping screw tormented the water at the stern. The frame of the steamer underwent regular convulsions as in the strenuous sobbing of a child. The mate was standing near the pilot-house. Without looking at him, the captain spoke his name. Ed? Yes, sir, cried the mate with alacrity. The captain reflected for a moment. Then he said, are they gaining on us? The mate took another anxious survey of the race. No, yes, I think they are, a little. After a pause, the captain said, Tell the chief to shake her up more. The mate, glad of an occupation in these tense minutes, flew down to the engine-room door. Skipper says, shake her up more, he bawled. The head of the chief engineer appeared, a grisly head, now wet with oil and sweat. What? he shouted angrily. It was as if he had been propelling the ship with his own arms. Now he was told that his best was not good enough. What? Shake her up more? Why, she can't carry another pound, I tell you, not another ounce. We'd— Suddenly he ran forward and climbed to the bridge. Captain, he cried in the loud, harsh voice of one who lived usually amid the thunder of machinery, she can't do it, sir. By God, she can't. She's turning over now faster than she ever did in her life, and will all blow to hell. The low-toned, impassive voice of the captain suddenly checked the chief's clamor. I'll blow her up, he said, but I won't get catched if I can help it. Even then the listening correspondents found a second in which to marvel that the captain had actually explained his point of view to another human being. The engineer stood blank. Then suddenly he cried, "'All right, sir.' 
He threw a hurried look of despair at the correspondents, the deck of the _Adolphus_, the pursuing enemy, Cuba, the sky, and the sea. He vanished in the direction of his post. A correspondent was suddenly regifted with the power of prolonged speech. "'Well, you see, the game is up, damn it. See? We can't get out of it. The skipper will blow up the whole bunch before he'll let his ship be taken, and the Spaniards are gaining. Well, that's what comes from going to war in an eight-knot tub.' He bitterly accused himself, the others, and the dark, sightless, indifferent world. This certainty of coming evil affected each one differently. One was made garrulous, one kept absent-mindedly snapping his fingers and gazing at the sea. Another stepped nervously to and fro, looking everywhere, as if for employment for his mind. As for Shackles, he was silent and smiling, but it was a new smile that caused the lines about his mouth to betray quivering weakness and each man looked at the others to discover their degree of fear, and did his best to conceal his own, holding his crackling nerves with all his strength. As the Adolphus rushed on, the sun suddenly emerged from behind grey clouds, and its rays dealt titanic blows so that in a few minutes the sea was a glowing blue plain with the golden shine dancing at the tips of the waves. The coast of Cuba glowed with light. The pursuers displayed detail after detail in the new atmosphere. The voice of the cook was heard in high vexation. "'Am I to get dinner as usual? How do I know? Nobody tells me what to do. Am I to get dinner as usual?' The mate answered ferociously, "'Of course you are. What do you suppose? Ain't you the cook, you damn fool?' The cook retorted in a mutinous scream. Well, how would I know? If this ship is a-going to blow up... 2. The captain called from the pilot-house, Mr. Shackles! Oh, Mr. Shackles! The correspondent moved hastily to a window. What is a captain? The skipper of the Adolphus raised a battered finger and pointed over the bows. See here? he asked, laconic but quietly jubilant. Another steamer was smoking at full speed over the sunlit seas. A great billow of pure white was on her bows. "'Great Scott!' cried Shackles. "'Another Spaniard?' "'No,' said the captain. "'That there is a United States cruiser.' "'What?' Shackles was dumbfounded into muscular paralysis. "'No. Are you sure?' The captain nodded. "'Sure. Take the glass. See her ensign? Two funnels, two masts with fighting tops.' She ought to be the Chancellorville. Shackles choked. Well, I'm blowed. Ed, said the captain. Yes, sir. Tell the chief there is no hurry. Shackles suddenly bethought him of his companions. He dashed to them and was full of quick scorn of their gloomy faces. Eh, brace up there. Are you blind? Can't you see her? See what? Why, the Chancellorville, you blind mice, roared Shackles. See her? See her? See her? The others sprang, saw, and collapsed. Shackles was a madman for the purpose of distributing the news. Cook! he shrieked. Don't you see her, Cook? Good God, man, don't you see her? He ran to the lower deck and howled his information everywhere. Suddenly the whole ship smiled. Men clapped each other on the shoulder and joyously shouted. The captain thrust his head from the pilot house to look back at the Spanish ships. Then he looked at the American cruiser. "'Now we'll see,' he said grimly, and vindictively to the mate. "'Guess somebody else will do some running,' the mate chuckled. The two gunboats were still headed hard for the Adolphus, and she kept on her way. The American cruiser was coming swiftly. "'It's the Chancellorville,' cried Shackles. "'I know her. We'll see a fight at sea, my boys, a fight at sea.' The enthusiastic correspondents pranced in Indian revels. The Chancellorville, two thousand tons, eighteen point six knots, ten five-inch guns, came on tempestuously, shearing the water high with her sharp bow. From her funnels the smoke raced away in driven sheets. She loomed with extraordinary rapidity like a ship bulging and growing out of the sea. 
she swept by the _Adolphus_ so close that one could have thrown a walnut on board. She was a glistening grey apparition with a blood red water line, with brown gun muzzles, and white clothed, motionless jack tars, and in her rush she was silent, deadly silent. Probably there entered the mind of every man on board the _Adolphus_ a feeling of almost idolatry for this living thing, stern but to their thought incomparably beautiful. They would have cheered, but that each man seemed to feel that a cheer would be too puny a tribute. It was at first as if she did not see the Adolphus. She was going to pass without heeding this little vagabond of the high seas. But suddenly a megaphone gaped over the rail of her bridge, and a voice was heard measuredly, calmly, intoning, Hello there! Keep well to the northard and out of my way, and I'll go in and see what those people want. Then nothing was heard but the swirl of water. In a moment the Adolphus was looking at a high gray stern. On the quarter deck, sailors were poised about the breech of the after pivot gun. The correspondents were reveling. Captain, yelled Shackles, we can't miss this, we must see it. But the skipper had already flung over the wheel. Sure, he answered almost at once, we can't miss it. The cook was arrogantly, grossly triumphant. His voice rang along the deck. There now, how will the spinachers like that? Now it's our turn. We've been doing the running away, but now we'll do the chasin'. Apparently feeling some twinge of nerves from the former strain, he suddenly demanded, "'Say, who's got any whiskey? I'm near dead for a drink.' When the Adolphus came about, she laid her course for a position to the northward of a coming battle, but the situation suddenly became complicated. When the Spanish ships discovered the identity of the ship that was steaming toward them, they did not hesitate over their plan of action. With one accord they turned and ran for port. Laughter arose from the Adolphus. The captain broke his orders, and, instead of keeping to the northard, he headed in the wake of the impetuous Chancellorville. The correspondents crowded on the bow. The Spaniards, when their broadsides became visible, were seen to be ships of no importance, mere little gunboats, for work in the shallows back of the reefs, and it was certainly discreet to refuse encounter with the five-inch guns of the Chancellorville. But the joyful Adolphus took no account of this discretion. The pursuit of the Spaniards had been so ferocious that the quick change to heels-overhead flight filled that corner of the mind which is devoted to the spirit of revenge. It was this that moved Shackles to yell taunts futilely at the faraway ships. Well, how do you like it, huh? How do you like it? The Adolphus was drinking compensation for her previous agony. The mountains of the shore now shadowed high into the sky, and the square white houses of a town could be seen near a vague cleft which seemed to mark the entrance to a port. The gunboats were now near to it. Suddenly white smoke streamed from the bow of the Chancellorville and developed swiftly into a great bulb which drifted in fragments down the wind. Presently the deep-throated boom of the gun came to the ears on board the Adolphus. The shot kicked up a high jet of water into the air astern of the last gunboat. The black smoke from the funnels of the cruiser made her look like a collier on fire, and in her desperation she tried many more long shots, but presently the Adolphus, murmuring disappointment, saw the Chancellorville sheer from the chase. In time they came up with her, and she was an indignant ship. Gloom and wrath was on the forecastle, and wrath and gloom was on the quarter-deck. A sad voice from the bridge said, "'Just missed em. Shackles gained permission to board the cruiser, and in the cabin he talked to Lieutenant Commander Surrey, tall, bald-headed, and angry. "'Shoals,' said the captain of the Chancellorville, "'I can't go any nearer, and those gunboats could steam along a stone sidewalk, if only it was wet.' Then his bright eyes became brighter. "'I'll tell you what. The Chicken, the Holy Moses, and the Mongolian are on station off Nuevitas. 
If you will do me a favor, why, to morrow I will give those people a game. 3. The Chancellorville lay all night watching off the port of the two gunboats, and soon after daylight the lookout descried three smokes to the westward, and they were later made out to be the Chicken, the Holy Moses, and the Adolphus, the latter tagging hurriedly after the United States vessels. The Chicken had been a harbor tug, but she was now the USS Chicken, by your leave. She carried a six-pounder forward and a six-pounder aft, and her main point was her conspicuous vulnerability. The Holy Moses had been the private yacht of a Philadelphia millionaire. She carried six six-pounders, and her main point was the chaste beauty of the officers' quarters. On the bridge of the Chancellorville, Lieutenant Commander Surrey surveyed his squadron with considerable satisfaction. Presently he signaled to the lieutenant, who commanded the Holy Moses, and to the boatswain, who commanded the chicken, to come aboard the flagship. This was all very well for the captain of the yacht, but it was not so easy for the captain of the tugboat, who had two heavy lifeboats swung fifteen feet above the water. He had been accustomed to talking with senior officers from his own pilot house through the intercession of the blessed megaphone. However, he got a lifeboat overside, and was pulled to the Chancellorville by three men, which cut his crew almost into halves. In the cabin of the Chancellorville, Surrey disclosed to his two captains his desires concerning the Spanish gunboats, and they were glad for being ordered down from the Nuevite station, where life was very dull. He also announced that there was a shore battery containing, he believed, four field guns, three point twos. His draft, he spoke of it as his draft, would enable him to go in close enough to engage the battery at moderate range, but he pointed out that the main parts of the attempt to destroy the Spanish gunboats must be left to the Holy Moses and the Chicken. His business, he thought, could only be to keep the air so singing about the ears of the battery that the men at the guns would be unable to take an interest in the dash of the smaller American craft into the bay. The officers spoke in their turns. The captain of the chicken announced that he saw no difficulties. The squadron would follow the senior officer in line ahead. The S.O. would engage the batteries as soon as possible, she would turn to starboard when the depth of water forced her to do so, and the Holy Moses and the Chicken would run past her into the bay and fight the Spanish ships wherever they were to be found. The captain of the Holy Moses, after some moments of dignified thought, said that he had no suggestions to make that would better this plan. Surrey pressed an electric bell. A marine orderly appeared. He was sent with a message. The message brought the navigating officer of the Chancellorville to the cabin, and the four men nosed over a chart. In the end, Surrey declared that he had made up his mind, and the juniors remained in expectant silence for three minutes while he stared at the bulkhead. Then he said that the plan of the chicken's captain seemed to him correct in the main. He would make one change. It was that he should first steam in and engage the battery, and the other vessels should remain in their present positions until he signaled them to run into the bay. If the squadron steamed ahead in line, the battery could, if it chose, divide its fire between the cruiser and the gunboats, constituting the more important attack. He had no doubt, he said, that he could soon silence the battery by tumbling the earthworks on to the guns and driving away the men, even if he did not succeed in hitting the pieces. Of course, he had no doubt of being able to silence the battery in twenty minutes. Then he would signal for the Holy Moses and the Chicken to make their rush, and of course he would support them with his fire as much as conditions enabled him. He arose then, indicating that the conference was at an end. In the few moments more that all four men remained in the cabin, the talk changed its character completely. It was now unofficial, and the sharp badinage concealed furtive affections, academy friendships, the feelings of old-time shipmates, hiding everything under a veil of jokes. "'Well, good luck to you, old boy. Don't get that valuable packet of yours sunk under you.' Think how it would weaken the Navy. 
Would you mind buying me three pairs of pajamas in the town yonder? If your engines get disabled, tote her under your arm. You can do it. Good-bye, old man. Don't forget to come out all right. When the captains of the Holy Moses and the Chicken emerged from the cabin, they strode the deck with a new step. They were proud men. The marine on duty above their boats looked at them curiously and with awe. He detected something which meant action, conflict. The boat's crews saw it also. As they pulled their steady stroke, they studied fleetingly the face of the officer in the stern sheets. In both cases they perceived a glad man, and yet a man filled with a profound consideration of the future. 4. A bird-like whistle stirred the decks of the Chancellorville. It was followed by the hoarse bellowing of the boatswain's mate. As the cruiser turned her bow toward the shore, she happened to steam near the Adolphus. The usual calm voice hailed the dispatch boat. Keep that gauze undershirt of yours well out of the line of fire. Aye, aye, sir. The cruiser then moved slowly toward the shore, watched by every eye in the smaller American vessels. She was deliberate and steady, and this was reasonable even to the impatience of the other craft, because the wooded shore was likely to suddenly develop new factors. Slowly she swung to starboard, smoke belched over her, and the roar of a gun came along the water. The battery was indicated by a long, thin streak of yellow earth. The first shot went high, ploughing the chaparral on the hillside. The Chancellorville wore an air for a moment of being deep in meditation. She flung another shell, which landed squarely on the earthwork, making a great dun cloud. Before the smoke had settled, there was a crimson flash from the battery. To the watchers at sea, it was smaller than a needle. The shot made a geyser of crystal water four hundred yards from the Chancellorville. The cruiser, having made up her mind, suddenly went at the battery, hammer, and tongs. She moved to and fro casually, but the thunder of her guns was gruff and angry. Sometimes she was quite hidden in her own smoke, but with exceeding regularity the earth of the battery spurted into the air. The Spanish shells, for the most part, went high and wide of the cruiser, jetting the water far away. Once a Spanish gunner took a festive sideshow chance at the waiting group of the three nondescripts. It went like a flash over the Adolphus, singing a wistful metallic note. Whereupon the Adolphus broke hurriedly for the open sea, and men on the Holy Moses and the Chicken laughed hoarsely and cruelly. The correspondents had been standing excitedly on top of the pilot-house, but at the passing of the shell they promptly eliminated themselves by dropping with a thud to the deck below. The cook again was giving tongue. "'Oh, say, this won't do. I'm damned if it will. We ain't no armored cruiser, you know. If one of them shells hits us, well, we finish right there. Tain't like as if it was our business fooling around within the range of them guns.' There's no sense in it. Them other fellows don't seem to mind it, but it's their business. If it's your business, you go ahead and you do it. But if it ain't you, look at that, would you? The Chancellorville had sent up a spread of flags, and the Holy Moses and the Chicken were steaming in. End of Section 7 Story 5 of Wounds in the Rain, War Stories, by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 5, The Revenge of the Adolphus, Parts 5 through 7. 5. They, on the Chancellorville, sometimes could see into the bay, and they perceived the enemy's gunboats moving out as if to give battle. Surrey feared that this impulse would not endure, or that it was some mere pretense for the edification of the town's people and the garrison, so he hastily signalled the Holy Moses and the Chicken to go in. Thankful for small favours, they came on like charging bantams. The battery had ceased firing. As the two auxiliaries passed under the stern of the cruiser, the megaphone hailed them. "'You will see the 
en a my soon as you round the point a fine chance good luck as a matter of fact the spanish gunboats had not been informed of the presence of the holy moses and the chicken off the bar and they were just blustering down the bay over the protective shoals to make it appear that they scorned the chancellorville but suddenly from around the point there burst into view a steam yacht closely followed by a harbor tug the gunboats took one swift look at this horrible sight and fled screaming lieutenant reigate commanding the holy moses had under his feet a craft that was capable of some speed although before a solemn tribunal one would have to admit that she conscientiously belied almost everything that the contractors had said of her originally boatswain pent commanding the chicken was in possession of an utterly different kind the holy moses was an antelope the chicken was a man who could carry a piano on his back in this race pent had the mortification of seeing his vessel outstripped badly the entrance of the two american craft had had a curious effect upon the shores of the bay apparently every one had slept in the assurance that the chancellorville could not cross the bar and that the chancellorville was the only hostile ship consequently the appearance of the holy moses and the chicken created a curious and complete emotion reigate on the bridge of the holy moses laughed when he heard the bugles shrilling and saw through his glasses the wee figures of men running hither and thither on the shore it was the panic of the china when the bull entered the shop the whole bay was bright with sun every detail of the shore was plain from a brown hut a beam of the holy moses some little men ran out waving their arms and turning their tiny faces to look at the enemy directly ahead some four miles appeared the scattered white houses of a town with a wharf and some schooners in front of it the gunboats were making for the town there was a stone fort on the hill overshadowing but reigate conjectured that there was no artillery in it there was a sense of something intimate and impudent in the minds of the americans it was like climbing over a wall and fighting a man in his own garden it was not that they could be in any wise shaken in their resolve it was simply that the overwhelmingly spanish aspect of things made them feel like gruff intruders like many of the emotions of wartime this emotion had nothing at all to do with war Reigate's only commissioned subordinate called up from the bow gun, "'May I open fire, sir? I think I can fetch that last one.' "'Yes.' Immediately the six-pounder crashed, and in the air was the spinning-wire noise of the flying shot. It struck so close to the last gunboat that it appeared that the spray went aboard. The swift-handed men at the gun spoke of it. "'Gave him a bath that time, anyhow. First one they've ever had.' dry him off this time jim the young ensign said steady and so the holy moses raced in firing until the whole town fort waterfront and shipping were as plain as if they had been done on paper by a mechanical draughtsman the gunboats were trying to hide in the bosom of the town one was frantically tying up to the wharf and the other was anchoring within a hundred yards of the shore the spanish infantry of course had dug trenches along the beach and suddenly the air over the holy moses sung with bullets the shore line thrummed with musketry also some antique shells screamed six the chicken was doing her best pence posture at the wheel seemed to indicate that her best was about thirty-four knots in his eagerness he was braced as if he alone was taking in a ten thousand ton battleship through hellgate but the chicken was not too far in the rear and pent could see clearly that he was to have no minor part to play some of the antique shells had struck the holy moses and he could see the escaped steam shooting up from her she lay close inshore and was lashing out with four six-pounders as if this was the last opportunity she would have to fire them she had made the spanish gunboats very sick a solitary gun on the one moored to the wharf 
was from time to time firing wildly. Otherwise the gunboats were silent. But the beach in front of the town was a line of fire. The chicken headed for the Holy Moses, and as soon as possible the six-pounder in her bow began to crack at the gunboat moored to the wharf. In the meantime the Chancellorville prowled off the bar, listening to the firing, anxious, acutely anxious, and feeling her impotency in every inch of her small steel frame. And in the meantime the Adolphus squatted on the waves and brazenly waited for news. One could thoughtfully count the seconds and reckon that in this second and that second a man had died, if one chose, but no one did it. Undoubtedly the spirit was that the flag should come away with honour, honour complete, perfect, leaving no loose unfinished end over which the Spaniards could erect a monument of satisfaction, glorification. The distant guns boomed to the ears of the silent blue jackets at their stations on the cruiser. The chicken steamed up to the Holy Moses, and took into her nostrils the odor of steam, gunpowder, and burnt things. Rifle bullets simply steamed over them both. In the merest flash of time, Pent took into his remembrance the body of a dead quartermaster on the bridge of his consort. The two megaphones uplifted together, but Pent's eager voice cried out first, "'Are you injured, sir?' "'No, not completely. My engines can get me out after, after we have sunk those gunboats.' The voice had been utterly conventional, but it changed to sharpness. "'Go in and sink that gunboat at anchor.' As the chicken rounded the Holy Moses and started inshore, a man called to him from the depths of finished disgust. "'They're taken to their boats, sir.' Pent looked and saw the men of the anchored gunboat lower their boats and pull like mad for shore. The chicken, assisted by the Holy Moses, began a methodical killing of the anchored gunboat. The Spanish infantry on shore fired frenziedly at the chicken. Pent, giving the wheel to a waiting sailor, stepped out to a point where he could see the men at the guns. One bullet spanged past him and into the pilot-house. He ducked his head into the window. "'That hit you, Murray?' he inquired with interest. Uh, "'No, sir,' cheerfully responded the man at the wheel. Pent became very busy superintending the fire of his absurd battery. The anchored gunboat simply would not sink. It evinced that unnatural stubbornness which is sometimes displayed by inanimate objects. The gunboat at the wharf had sunk as if she had been scuttled, but this riddled thing at anchor would not even take fire. Pent began to grow flurried, privately. He could not stay there forever. Why didn't the damn gunboat admit its destruction? Why— He was at the forward gun when one of his engine-room force came to him and, after saluting, said serenely, the men at the after-gun are all down, sir. It was one of those curious lifts which an enlisted man, without in any way knowing it, can give his officer. The impudent tranquillity of the man at once set Pent to rights, and the stoker departed, admiring the extraordinary coolness of his captain. The next few moments contained little but heat, an odor, applied mechanics, and an expectation of death. Pent developed a fervid and amazed appreciation of the men, his men, men he knew very well, but strange men. What explained them? He was doing his best because he was captain of the chicken, and he lived or died by the chicken. But what could move these men to watch his eye in bright anticipation of his orders, and then obey them with enthusiastic rapidity? What caused them to speak of the action as some kind of a joke, particularly when they knew he could overhear them? What manner of men! And he anointed them secretly with his fullest affection. Perhaps Pent did not think all this during the battle. Perhaps he thought it so soon after the battle that his full mind became confused as to the time. At any rate, it stands as an expression of his feeling. 
The enemy had gotten a field gun round to the shore, and with it they began to throw three-inch shells at the chicken. In this war it was usual that the downtrodden Spaniards, in their ignorance, should use smokeless powder, while the Americans, by the power of the consistent everlasting three-ply wire-woven double back-action imbecility of a hayseed government, used powder which on sea and on land cried their position to heaven, and accordingly good men got killed without reason. At first Pent could not locate the field gun at all, but as soon as he found it, he ran aft with one man and brought the after six-pounder again into action. He paid little heed to the old gun crew. One was lying on his face apparently dead, another was prone with a wound in the chest, while the third sat with his back to the deck-house holding a smitten arm. This last one called out huskily, "'Give em hell, sir!' The minutes of the battle were either days, years, or they were flashes of a second. Once Pent, looking up, was astonished to see three shell-holes in the chicken's funnel, made surreptitiously, so to speak. "'If we don't silence that field-gun, she'll sink us, boys!' The eyes of the man sitting with his back against the deck-house were looking from out his ghastly face at the new gun-crew. He spoke with the supreme laziness of a wounded man. "'Give him hell!' Pent felt a sudden twist of his shoulder. He was wounded, slightly. The anchored gunboat was in flames. 7. Pent took his little blood-stained towboat out to the Holy Moses. The yacht was already under way for the bay entrance. As they were passing out of range, the Spaniards heroically redoubled their fire which is their custom. Pent, moving busily about the decks, stopped suddenly at the door of the engine-room. His face was set, and his eyes were steely. He spoke to one of the engineers. "'During the action I saw you firing at the enemy with a rifle. I told you once to stop, and then I saw you at it again. Pegging away with a rifle is no part of your business. I want you to understand that you are in trouble.' The humbled man did not raise his eyes from the deck. Presently the Holy Moses displayed an anxiety for the chicken's health. "'One killed and four wounded, sir. Have you enough men left to work your ship?' After deliberation Pent answered, "'No, sir. Shall I send you assistance?' "'No, sir. I can get to sea all right.' As they neared the point, they were edified by the sudden appearance of a serial comic ally. The Chancellorville at last had been unable to stand the strain, and had sent in her launch with an ensign, five seamen, and a number of marksmen marines. She swept hot-foot around the point, bent on terrible slaughter. The one-pounder of her bow presented a formidable appearance. The Holy Moses and the Chicken laughed until they brought indignation to the brow of the young ensign, but he forgot it when, with some of his men, he boarded the Chicken to do what was possible for the wounded. The nearest surgeon was aboard the Chancellorville. There was absolute silence on board the cruiser as the Holy Moses steamed up to report. The Blue Jackets listened with all their ears. The commander of the yacht spoke slowly into his megaphone. We have destroyed the two gunboats, sir. There was a burst of confused cheering on the forecastle of the Chancellorville, but an officer's cry quelled it. Very good. Will you come aboard? Two correspondents were already on the deck of the cruiser. Before the last of the wounded were hoisted aboard the cruiser, the Adolphus was on her way to Key West. When she arrived at that port of desolation, Shackles fled to file the telegrams, and the other correspondents fled to the hotel for clothes, good clothes, clean clothes, and food, good food, much food, and drink, much drink, any kind of drink. Days afterward, when the officers of the noble squadron received the newspapers containing an account of their performance, they looked at each other somewhat dejectedly. Heroic assault! 
grand daring of Boatswain Pent, superb accuracy of the Holy Moses fire, gallant taws of the chicken, their names should be remembered as long as America stands, terrible losses of the enemy. When the Secretary of the Navy ultimately read the report of Commander Surrey, S.O.P., he had to prick himself with a dagger in order to remember that anything at all out of the ordinary had occurred. End of Section 8 Story 6 of Wounds in the Rain, War Stories, by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 6 The Sergeant's Private Madhouse the moonlight was almost steady blue flame, and all this radiance was lavished out upon a still, lifeless wilderness of stunted trees and cactus plants. The shadows lay upon the ground, pools of black and sharply outlined, resembling substances, fabrics, and not shadows at all. From afar came the sound of the sea coughing among the hollows in the coral rock. The land was very empty. One could easily imagine that Cuba was a simple, vast solitude. One could wonder at the moon taking all the trouble of this splendid illumination. There was no wind. Nothing seemed to live. But in a particular large group of shadows lay an outpost of some forty United States Marines. If it had been possible to approach them from any direction without encountering one of their sentries, one could have gone stumbling among sleeping men, and men who sat waiting, their blankets tented over their heads. One would have been in among them before one's mind could have decided whether they were men or devils. If a marine moved, he took the care and the time of one who walks across a death chamber. The lieutenant in command reached for his watch, and the nickel chain gave forth the faintest tinkling sound. He could see the glistening five or six pairs of eyes that slowly turned to regard him. His sergeant lay near him, and he bent his face down to whisper, "'Who's on the post behind the big cactus plant?' "'Dryden,' replied the sergeant, just over his breath. After a pause, the lieutenant murmured, "'He's got too many nerves. I shouldn't have put him there.' The sergeant asked if he should crawl down and look into affairs at Dryden's post. The young officer nodded assent, and the sergeant, softly cocking his rifle, went away on his hands and knees. The lieutenant, with his back to a dwarf tree, sat watching the sergeant's progress for the few minutes that he could see him moving from one shadow to another. Afterward, the officer waited to hear Dryden's quick but low-voiced challenge. But time passed, and no sound came from the direction of the post behind the cactus bush. The sergeant, as he came nearer and nearer to this cactus bush, a number of peculiarly dignified columns throwing shadows of inky darkness, had slowed his pace, for he did not wish to trifle with the feelings of the sentry, and he was expecting the stern hail, and was ready with the immediate answer which turns away wrath. He was not made anxious by the fact that he could not yet see Dryden, for he knew that the man would be hidden in a way practiced by sentry marines since the time when two men had been killed by a disease of excessive confidence on picket. Indeed, as the sergeant went still nearer, he became more and more angry. Dryden was evidently a most proper sentry. Finally, he arrived at a point where he could see Dryden seated in the shadow, staring into the bushes ahead of him, his rifle ready on his knee. The sergeant, in his rage, longed for the peaceful precincts of the Washington Marine barracks, where there would have been no situation to prevent the most complete non-commissioned oratory. He felt indecent in his capacity of a man able to creep up to the back of a G Company member on guard duty. Never mind, in the morning, back at camp. But suddenly he felt afraid. There was something wrong with Dryden. He remembered old tales of comrades creeping out to find a picket seated against a tree, 
perhaps upright enough, but stone dead." The sergeant paused and gave the inscrutable back of the sentry a long stare. Dubious, he again moved forward. At three paces he hissed like a little snake. Dryden did not show a sign of hearing. At last the sergeant was in a position from which he was able to reach out and touch Dryden on the arm, whereupon was turned to him the face of a man livid with mad fright. The sergeant grabbed him by the wrist and with discreet fury shook him. Here, pull yourself together. Dryden paid no heed, but turned his wild face from the newcomer to the ground in front. Don't you see him, sergeant? Don't you see him? Where? whispered the sergeant. Ahead, and a little on the right flank. A regular skirmish line. Didn't you see him? Nah, whispered the sergeant. Dryden began to shake. He began moving one hand from his head to his knee, and from his knee to his head rapidly, in a way that is without explanation. I don't dare fire, he wept. If I do, they'll see me, and oh, how they'll pepper me. The sergeant, lying on his belly, understood one thing. Dryden had gone mad. Dryden was the March Hare. The old man gulped down his uproarious emotions as well as he was able, and used the most simple device. Go, he said, and tell the lieutenant while I cover your post for you. No, they'll see me, they'll see me, and then they'll pepper me, oh, how they'll pepper me. The sergeant was face to face with the biggest situation of his life. In the first place he knew that at night a large or small force of Spanish guerrillas was never more than easy rifle range from any marine outpost, both sides maintaining a secrecy as absolute as possible in regard to their real position and strength. Everything was on a watch-spring foundation. A loud word might be paid for by a night attack, which would involve five hundred men who needed their earned sleep, not to speak of some of them who would need their lives. The slip of a foot and the rolling of a pint of gravel might go from consequence to consequence until various crews went to general quarters on their ships in the harbor, their batteries booming as the swift searchlight flashes tore through the foliage. Men would get killed, notably the sergeant and Dryden, and outposts would be cut off, and the whole night would be one pitiless turmoil. And so Sergeant George H. Peasley began to run his private madhouse behind the cactus bush. Dryden, said the sergeant, you do as I tell you, and go tell the lieutenant. I don't dare move shivered the man. They'll see me if I move. They'll see me. They're almost up now. Let's hide. Well, then, you stay here a moment, and I'll go and— Dryden turned upon him a look so tigerish that the old man felt his hair move. Don't you stir, he hissed. You want to give me away? You want them to see me? Don't you stir. The sergeant decided not to stir. He became aware of the slow wheeling of eternity, its majestic incomprehensibility of movement. Seconds, minutes, were quaint little things tangible as toys, and there were billions of them, all alike. Dryden, he whispered at the end of a century, in which, curiously, he had never joined the Marine Corps at all, but had taken up another walk of life, and prospered greatly in it. Dryden! This is foolishness. He thought of the expedient of smashing the man over the head with his rifle, but Dryden was so supernaturally alert that there surely would issue some small scuffle, and there could be not even the fraction of a scuffle. The sergeant relapsed into the contemplation of another century. His patient had one fine virtue. He was in such terror of the phantom skirmish line that his voice never went above a whisper, whereas his delusion might have expressed itself in hyena yells and shots from his rifle. The sergeant, shuddering, had visions of how it might have been, the mad private leaping into the air and howling and shooting at his friends and making them the centre of the enemy's eager attention. This, to his mind, would have been conventional conduct for a maniac. The trembling victim of an idea was somewhat puzzling. The sergeant decided from time to time he would reason with his patient. 
"Look here, Dryden, you don't see any real Spaniards. You've been drinking or something. Now " But Dryden only glared him into silence. Dryden was inspired with such a profound contempt of him that it was become hatred. "Don't you stir!" And it was clear that if the sergeant did stir, the mad private would introduce calamity. Now, said Peasley to himself, if those guerrillas should take a crack at us tonight, they'd find a lunatic asylum right in the front, and it would be astonishing. The silence of the night was broken by the quick low voice of a sentry to the left some distance. The breathless stillness brought an effect to the words as if they had been spoken in one's ear. Halt! Who's there? Halt, or I'll fire! Bang! At the moment of sudden attack, particularly at night, it is improbable that a man registers much detail of either thought or action. He may afterwards say, I was here, he may say, I was there, I did this, I did that. But there remains a great incoherency because of the tumultuous thought which sees through the head. Is this defeat? At night, in a wilderness, and against skilful foes half seen, one does not trouble to ask if it is also death. Defeat is death, then, save for the miraculous, but the exaggerating magnifying first thought subsides in the ordered mind of the soldier, and he knows soon what he is doing and how much of it. The sergeant's immediate impulse had been to squeeze close to the ground and listen, listen, above all else, listen. But the next moment he grabbed his private asylum by the scruff of its neck, jerked it to its feet, and started to retreat upon the main outpost. To the left, rifle flashes were bursting from the shadows. To the rear, the lieutenant was giving some hoarse orders or admonition. Through the air swept some Spanish bullets, very high, as if they had been fired at a man in a tree. The private asylum came on so hastily that the sergeant found he could remove his grip, and soon they were in the midst of the men of the outpost. Here there was no occasion for enlightening the lieutenant. In the first place, such surprises required statement, question, and answer. It is impossible to get a grossly original and fantastic idea through a man's head in less than one minute of rapid talk and the sergeant knew the lieutenant could not spare the minute. He himself had no minutes to devote to anything but the business of the outpost, and the madman disappeared from his pen, and he forgot about him. It was a long night, and the little fight was as long as the night. It was a heartbreaking work. The forty marines lay in an irregular oval. From all sides the Mauser bullets sang low and hard. Their occupation was to prevent a rush, and to this end they potted carefully at the flash of a Mauser, save when they got excited for a moment, in which case their magazines rattled like a great Waterbury watch. Then they settled again to a systematic potting. The enemy were not of the regular Spanish forces. They were of a corps of guerrillas, native-born Cubans, who preferred the flag of Spain. They were all men who knew the craft of the woods, and were all recruited from the district. They fought more like Red Indians than any people but the Red Indians themselves. Each seemed to possess an individuality, a fighting individuality, which is only found in the highest order of irregular soldiers. Personally they were as distinct as possible but through equality of knowledge and experience they arrived at concert of action. So long as they operated in the wilderness they were formidable troops. It mattered little whether it was daylight or dark, they were mainly invisible. They had schooled from the Cubans insurgent to Spain. As the Cubans fought the Spanish troops, so would these particular Spanish troops fight the Americans. It was wisdom. The Marines thoroughly understood the game. They must lie close and fight until daylight, when the guerrillas promptly would go away. They had withstood other nights of this kind, and now their principal emotion was probably a sort of frantic annoyance. 
Back at the main camp, whenever the roaring volleys lulled, the men in the trenches could hear their comrades of the outpost and the guerillas pattering away interminably. The moonlight faded and left an equal darkness upon the wilderness. A man could barely see the comrade at his side. Sometimes guerillas crept so close that the flame from their rifles seemed to scorch the faces of the marines, and the reports sounded as if from two or three inches of their very noses. If a pause came, one could hear the guerillas gabbling to each other in a kind of drunken delirium. The lieutenant was praying that the ammunition would last. Everybody was praying for daybreak. A black hour came, finally, when the men were not fit to have their troubles increased. The enemy made a wild attack on one portion of the oval, which was held by about fifteen men. The remainder of the force was busy enough, and the fifteen were naturally left to their devices. Amid the whirl of it, a loud voice suddenly broke out in song. When shepherds guard their flocks by night all seated on the ground, an angel of the Lord came down, and glory shone around. Who the hell is that? demanded the lieutenant, from a throat full of smoke. There was almost a full stop of the firing. The Americans were somewhat puzzled. Practical ones muttered that the fool should have a bayonet hilt shoved down his throat. Others felt a thrill at the strangeness of the thing. Perhaps it was a sign. The minstrel boy to war was gone, in the ranks of death you'll find him. His father's sword he has girded on, and his wild harp slung behind him. This croak was as lugubrious as a coffin. Who is it? Who is it? snapped the lieutenant. Stop him, somebody. It's Dryden, sir, said old Sergeant Peasley, as he felt around in the darkness for his madhouse. I can't find him. Yet. Please, oh, please, oh, oh, do not let me fall, your g ugh, ugh. The sergeant had pounced upon him. This singing had had an effect upon the Spaniards. At first they had fired frenziedly at the voice, but they soon ceased, perhaps from sheer amazement. Both sides took a spell of meditation. The sergeant was having some difficulty with his charge. Here, you, grab him, take him by the throat. Be quiet, you devil. One of the fifteen men, who had been hard-pressed, called out, "'We've only got about one clip apiece, lieutenant. If they come again—' The lieutenant crawled to and fro among his men, taking clips of cartridges from those who had many. He came upon the sergeant and his madhouse. He felt Dryden's belt and found it simply stuffed with ammunition. He examined Dryden's rifle and found in it a full clip. The madhouse had not fired a shot. The lieutenant distributed these valuable prizes among the fifteen men. As the men gratefully took them, one said, "'If they had come again hard enough, they would have had us, sir. Maybe.' But the Spaniards did not come again. At the first indication of daybreak, they fired their customary good-bye volley. The Marines lay tight while the slow dawn crept over the land. Finally the lieutenant arose among them, and he was a bewildered man, but very angry. "'Now, where is that idiot, sergeant?' "'Here he is, sir,' said the old man cheerfully. He was seated on the ground beside the recumbent Dryden, who, with an innocent smile on his face, was sound asleep. "'Wake him up,' said the lieutenant briefly. The sergeant shook the sleeper. "'Here, minstrel boy, turn out. The lieutenant wants you.' Dryden climbed to his feet and saluted the officer with a dazed and childish air. "'Yes, sir?' The lieutenant was obviously having difficulty in governing his feelings, but he managed to say with calmness, "'You seemed to be fond of singing, Dryden. Sergeant, see if he has any whisky on him.' "'Sir?' said the madhouse, stupefied. "'Singing?' fond of singing?" Here the sergeant interposed gently, and he and the lieutenant held palaver apart from the others. The marines, hitching more comfortably their almost empty belts, spoke with grins of the madhouse. Well, the minstrel boy made em clear out. They couldn't stand it. But I wouldn't want to be in his boots. 
He'll see fireworks when the old man interviews him on the uses of grand opera in modern warfare. How do you think he managed to smuggle a bottle along without us finding it out? When the weary outpost was relieved and marched back to camp, the men could not rest until they had told a tale of the voice in the wilderness. In the meantime, the sergeant took Dryden aboard a ship, and to those who took charge of the man, he defined him as the most useful blank blank crazy man in the service of the United States. End of section nine. Story seven of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven Virtue in War Parts one through three. One Gates had left the regular army in eighteen ninety, those parts of him which had not been frozen having been well fried. He took with him nothing but an oaken constitution and a knowledge of the plains and the best wishes of his fellow officers. The Standard Oil Company differs from the United States government in that it understands the value of the loyal and intelligent services of good men, and is almost certain to reward them at the expense of incapable men. This curious practice emanates from no beneficent emotion of the Standard Oil Company, on whose feelings you could not make a scar with a hammer and chisel. It is simply that the Standard Oil Company knows more than the United States government, and makes use of virtue whenever virtue is to its advantage. In 1890 Gates really felt in his bones that if he lived a rigorously correct life, and several score of his classmates and intimate friends died off, he would get command of a troop of horse by the time he was unfitted by age to be an active cavalry leader. He left the service of the United States and entered the service of the Standard Oil Company. In the course of time he knew that if he lived a rigorously correct life, his position and income would develop strictly in parallel with the worth of his wisdom and experience, and he would not have to walk on the corpses of his friends. But he was not happier. Part of his heart was in a barracks, and it was not enough to discourse of the old regiment over the port and cigars to ears which were polite enough to betray a languid ignorance. Finally came the year 1898, and Gates dropped the Standard Oil Company as if it were hot. He hit the steel rail to Washington, and there fought the first serious action of the war. Like most Americans, he had a native state, and one morning he found himself major in a volunteer infantry regiment, whose voice had a peculiar sharp twang to it, which he could remember from childhood. The colonel welcomed the West Pointer with loud cries of joy. The lieutenant colonel looked at him with the pebbly eye of distrust, and the senior major, having had up to this time the best battalion in the regiment, strongly disapproved of him. There were only two majors, so the lieutenant colonel commanded the first battalion, which gave him an occupation. Lieutenant colonels under the new rules do not always have occupations. Gates got the 3rd Battalion, four companies commanded by intelligent officers who could gauge the opinions of their men at 2,000 yards and govern themselves accordingly. The battalion was immensely interested in the new major. It thought it ought to develop views about him. It thought it was its blankety-blank business to find out immediately if it liked him personally. In the company streets the talk was nothing else. Among the non-commissioned officers there were eleven old soldiers of the regular army, and they knew, and cared, that Gates had held commission in the 16th Cavalry, as Harper's Weekly says. Over this fact they rejoiced and were glad, and they stood by to jump lively when he took command. He would know his work, and he would know their work, and then in battle there would be killed only what men were absolutely necessary, and the sick list would be comparatively free of fools. 
the commander of the second battalion had been called by an Atlanta paper Major Ricketts C. Carmony, the commander of the second battalion of the 307th Blank, is when at home one of the biggest wholesale hardware dealers in his state. Last evening he had ice cream, at his own expense, served out at the regular mess of the battalion, and after dinner the men gathered about his tent where three hearty cheers for the popular major were given. Carmony had bought twelve copies of this newspaper and mailed them home to his friends. In Gates's battalion there were more kicks than ice cream, and there was no ice cream at all. Indignation ran high at the rapid manner in which he proceeded to make soldiers of them. Some of his officers hinted finally that the men wouldn't stand it. They were saying that they had enlisted to fight for their country. Yes, but they weren't going to be bullied day in and day out by a perfect stranger. They were patriots, they were, and just as good men as ever stepped, just as good as Gates or anybody like him. But gradually, despite itself, the battalion progressed. The men were not altogether conscious of it. They evolved rather blindly. Presently there were fights with Carmony's crowd as to which was the better battalion at drills, and at last there was no argument. It was generally admitted that Gates commanded the crack battalion. The men, believing that the beginning and the end of all soldiering was in these drills of precision, were somewhat reconciled to their major when they began to understand more of what he was trying to do for them. But they were still fiery, untamed patriots of lofty pride, and they resented his manner toward them. It was abrupt and sharp. The time came when everybody knew that the Fifth Army Corps was the corps designated for the first active service in Cuba. The officers and men of the 307th observed with despair that their regiment was not in the Fifth Army Corps. The colonel was a strategist. He understood everything in a flash. Without a moment's hesitation he obtained leave and mounted the night express for Washington. There he drove senators and congressmen in span, tandem, and foreign hand. With the telegraph he stirred so deeply the governor, the people, and the newspapers of his state, that whenever on a quiet night the president put his head out of the White House he could hear the distant, vast commonwealth humming with indignation. And, as it is well known that the chief executive listens to the voice of the people, the 307th was transferred to the 5th Army Corps. It was sent at once to Tampa, where it was brigaded with two dusty regiments of regulars, who looked at it calmly and said nothing. The brigade commander happened to be no less a person than Gates's old colonel in the 16th Cavalry, as Harper's Weekly says, and Gates was cheered. The old man's rather solemn look brightened when he saw Gates in the 307th, there was a great deal of battering and pounding and banging for the 307th at Tampa, but the men stood it more in wonder than in anger. The two regular regiments carried them along when they could, and when they couldn't, waited impatiently for them to come up. Undoubtedly the regulars wished the volunteers were in garrison at Sitka, but they said practically nothing. They minded their own regiments. The colonel was an invaluable man in a telegraph office. When came the scramble for transports, the colonel retired to a telegraph office and talked so ably to Washington that the authorities pushed a number of corps aside and made way for the 307th, as if on it depended everything. The regiment got one of the best transports, and after a series of delays and some starts and an equal number of returns, they finally sailed for Cuba. 2. Now Gates had a singular adventure on the second morning after his arrival at Atlanta to take his post as major of the 307th. He was in his tent, writing, when suddenly the flap was flung away and a tall young private stepped inside. "'Well, Mage,' said the newcomer genially, "'how goes it?' The major's head flashed up, but he spoke without heat. "'Come to attention and salute.' "'Huh?' said the private. "'Come to attention and salute.' 
The private looked at him in resentful amazement, and then inquired, "'You ain't mad, are you? Ain't nothing to get huffy about, is there?' "'I come to attention and salute.' Well, drawled the private as he stared, seein' as ye are so darn particular, I don't care if I do, and if it'll make your meals set on your stomach any better. Drawing a long breath and grinning ironically, he lazily pulled his heels together and saluted with a flourish. There, he said with a return to his earlier genial manner, how's that suit ye, mage? There was a silence which to an impartial observer would have seemed pregnant with dynamite and bloody death. Then the major cleared his throat and coldly said, "'And now what is your business?' "'Who, me?' asked the private. Oh, "'I just sort of dropped in.' With a deeper meaning he added, "'Sort of dropped in in a friendly way, thinking you was maybe a different kind of feller from what you be.' The inference was clearly marked. It was now Gates's turn to stare, and stare he unfeignedly did. "'Go back to your quarters,' he said at length. The volunteer became very angry. "'Oh, you needn't be so up in the air, need ye? Don't knows I'm dead anxious to inflict my company on yer, since I've had a good look at ye. There may be men in this here battalion what's had just as much education as you have, and I'm damned if they ain't got better manners. Good morning, he said with dignity, and passing out of the tent, he flung the flap back in place with an air of slamming it as if it had been a door. He made his way back to his company street, striding high. He was furious. He met a large crowd of his comrades. "'What's the matter, Lige?' asked one, who noted his temper. "'Oh, nothing,' answered Lige, with terrible feeling. "'Nothing. i just been looking over the new major, that's all.' "'What's he like?' asked another. "'Like?' cried Lige. "'He's like nothing. He ain't out in the same kiddle as us is. No, God made him all by himself, separate. He's a special product, he is, and he won't have no truck with just common men like you be. He made a venomous gesture, which included them all. Did he set on ye? asked a soldier. Set on me? No, replied Lige with contempt. I set on him. I sized him up in a minute. Oh, I don't know, I says as I was coming out. Guess you ain't the only man in the world, I says. For a time, Lige Wigwam was quite a hero. He endlessly repeated the tale of his adventure, and men admired him for so soon taking the conceit out of the new officer. Lige was proud to think of himself as a plain and simple patriot who had refused to endure any high-soaring nonsense. But he came to believe that he had not disturbed the singular composure of the major, and this concreted his hatred. He hated Gates, not as a soldier sometimes hates an officer, a hatred half of fear. Lige hated as man to man, and he was enraged to see that so far from gaining any hatred in return, he seemed incapable of making Gates have any thought of him save as a unit in a body of three hundred men. Lige might just as well have gone and grimaced at the obelisk in Central Park. When the battalion became the best in the regiment, he had no part in the pride of the companies. He was sorry when men began to speak well of Gates. He was really a very consistent hater. 3. The transport occupied by the 307th was commanded by some sort of a Scandinavian who was afraid of the shadows of his own topmasts. He would have run his steamer away from a floating Gainsborough hat, and in fact he ran her away from less on some occasions. The officers, wishing to arrive with the other transports, sometimes remonstrated, and to them he talked of his owners. Every officer in the convoying warships loathed him, for in case any hostile vessel should appear they did not see how they were going to protect this rabbit, who would probably manage during a fight to be in about a hundred places on the broad, broad sea, and all of them offensive to the Navy's plan. 
When he was not talking of his owners, he was remarking to the officers of the regiment that a steamer really was not like a valise, and that he was unable to take his ship under his arm and climb trees with it. He further said that them naval fellows were not near so smart as they thought they were. From an indigo sea arose the lonely shore of Cuba. Ultimately the fleet was near Santiago, and most of the transports were bidden to wait a minute while the leaders found out their minds. The skipper, to whom the 307th were prisoners, waited for thirty hours halfway between Jamaica and Cuba. He explained that the Spanish fleet might emerge from Santiago Harbor at any time, and he did not propose to be caught. His owners— whereupon the colonel arose as one having nine hundred men at his back and he passed up to the bridge and he spake with the captain he explained indirectly that each individual of his nine hundred men had decided to be the first american soldier to land for this campaign and that in order to accomplish the marvel it was necessary for the transport to be nearer than forty-five miles from the cuban coast if the skipper would only land the regiment, the colonel would consent to his then taking his interesting old ship and going to H with it. And the skipper spake with the colonel. He pointed out that as far as he officially was concerned, the United States government did not exist. He was responsible solely to his owners. The colonel pondered these sayings. He perceived that the skipper meant that he was running his ship as he deemed best, in consideration of the capital invested by his owners, and that he was not at all concerned with the feelings of a certain American military expedition to Cuba. He was a free son of the sea. He was a sovereign citizen of the Republic of the Ways. He was like Lige. However, the skipper ultimately incurred the danger of taking his ship under the terrible guns of the New York, Iowa, Oregon, Massachusetts, Indiana, Brooklyn, Texas, and a score of cruisers and gunboats. It was a brave act for the captain of a United States transport, and he was visibly nervous until he could again get to sea, where he offered praises that the accursed 307th was no longer sitting on his head. For almost a week he rambled at his cheerful will over the adjacent high seas, having in his hold a great quantity of military stores, as successfully secreted as if they had been buried in a copper box in the cornerstone of a new public building in Boston. He had had his master's certificate for twenty-one years, and those people couldn't tell a marlin spike from the starboard side of the ship. The 307th was landed in Cuba, but to their disgust they found that about 10,000 regulars were ahead of them. They got immediate orders to move out from the base on the road to Santiago. Gates was interested to note that the only delay was caused by the fact that many men of the other battalions strayed off sightseeing. In time the long regiment wound slowly among hills that shut them from the sight of the sea. For the men to admire there were palm trees, little brown huts, passive, uninterested Cuban soldiers, much worn from carrying American rations inside and outside. The weather was not oppressively warm, and the journey was said to be only about seven miles. There were no rumors save that there had been one short fight, and the army had advanced to within sight of Santiago. Having a peculiar faculty for the derision of the romantic, the 307th began to laugh. Actually there was not anything in the world which turned out to be as books describe it. Here they had landed from the transport, expecting to be at once flung into line of battle and sent on some kind of furious charge, and now they were trudging along a quiet trail lined with somnolent trees and grass. The whole business so far struck them as being a highly tedious burlesque. After a time they came to where the camps of regular regiments marked the sides of the road, little villages of tents no higher than a man's waist. The colonel found his brigade commander, and the 307th was sent off into a field of long grass, where the men grew suddenly solemn with the importance of getting their supper. In the early evening some regulars told one of Gates's companies 
that at daybreak this division would move to an attack upon something. How'd you know? said the company, deeply awed. Heard it. Well, what are we to attack? Dunno. The 307th was not at all afraid, but each man began to imagine the morrow. The regulars seemed to have as much interest in the morrow as they did in the last Christmas. It was none of their affair, apparently. "'Look here,' said Lige Wigwam to a man in the 17th Regular Infantry. "'Whereabouts are we going tomorrow, and who do we run up against, do you know?' The 17th soldier replied truculently, "'If I catch the blank, blank, blank what stole my terbacker, I'll whirl in and break every blank, blank bone in his body.' Gates's friends in the regular regiments asked him numerous questions as to the reliability of his organization. Would the 307th stand the racket? They were certainly not contemptuous. They simply did not seem to consider it important whether the 307th would or whether it would not. Well, said Gates, they won't run the length of a tent peg if they can gain any idea of what they're fighting. They won't bunch if they've about six acres of open ground to move in. They won't get rattled at all if they see you fellows taking it easy, and they'll fight like the devil as long as they thoroughly, completely, absolutely, satisfactorily, exhaustively understand what the business is. They're lawyers. All except in my battalion. End of Section 10「Story Seven of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story Seven Virtue in War Parts Four and Five. Four Lige awakened into a world obscured by blue fog. Somebody was gently shaking him. Get up, we're going to move. The regiment was buckling up itself. From the trail came the loud creak of a light battery moving ahead. The tones of all men were low, the faces of the officers were composed, serious. The regiment found itself moving along behind the battery before it had time to ask itself more than a hundred questions. The trail wound through a dense tall jungle, dark, heavy with dew. The battle broke with a snap, far ahead. Presently Lige heard from the air above him a faint low note as if somebody were blowing softly in the mouth of a bottle. It was a stray bullet which had wandered a mile to tell him that war was before him. He nearly broke his neck looking upward. Did you hear that? But the men were fretting to get out of this gloomy jungle. They wanted to see something. The faint rup, 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 rup on in the front told them that the fight had begun death was abroad, and so the mystery of this wilderness excited them. This wilderness was portentously still and dark. They passed the battery aligned on a hill above the trail, and they had not gone far when the gruff guns began to roar, and they could hear the rocket-like swish of the flying shells. Presently everybody must have called out for the assistance of the 307th. Aides and couriers came flying back to them. Is this the 307th? Hurry up your men, please, Colonel. You're needed more every minute. Oh, they were, were they? Then the regulars were not going to do all the fighting. The old 307th was bitterly proud, or proudly bitter. They left their blanket rolls under the guard of God and pushed on, which is one of the reasons why the Cubans of that part of that country were later so well equipped. There began to appear fields hot, golden-green in the sun. On some palm-dotted knolls before them they could see little lines of black dots, the American advance. A few men fell, struck down by other men who, perhaps half a mile away, were aiming at somebody else. The loss was wholly in Carmony's battalion, which immediately bunched and backed away, coming with a shock against Gates's advance company. This shock sent a tremor through all of Gates's battalion until men in the very last files cried out nervously, Well, what in hell is up now? There came an order to deploy and advance. An occasional hoarse yell from the regulars could be heard. 
The deploying made Gates's heart bleed for the Colonel. The old man stood there directing the movement, straight, fearless, somberly defiant of, well, everything. Carmony's four companies were like four herds, and all the time the bullets from no living man knows where kept pecking at them and pecking at them. Gates, the excellent Gates, the highly educated and strictly military Gates, grew rankly insubordinate. He knew that the regiment was suffering from nothing but the deadly range and oversweep of the modern rifle, of which many proud and confident nations know nothing save that they have killed savages with it, which is the least of all informations. Gates rushed upon Carmony. Blank blanket, man, if you can't get your people to deploy for blank's sake, give me a chance. I'm stuck in the woods. Carmony gave nothing but Gates took all he could get, and his battalion deployed and advanced like men. The old colonel almost burst into tears, and he cast one quick glance of gratitude at Gates, which the younger officer wore on his heart like a secret decoration. There was a wild scramble uphill, down dale, through thorny thickets. Death smote them with a kind of slow rhythm, leisurely taking a man now here now there but the cat spit sound of the bullets was always a large number of the men of carmony's battalion came on with gates they were willing to do anything anything they had no real fault unless it was that early conclusion that any brave high-minded youth was necessarily a good soldier immediately from the beginning in them had been born a swift feeling that the unpopular gates knew everything and they followed the trained soldier if they followed him he certainly took them into it as they swung heavily up one steep hill like so many wind-blown horses they came suddenly out into the real advance little blue groups of men were making frantic rushes forward and then flopping down on their bellies to fire volleys while other groups made rushes ahead they could see a heavy house-like fort which was inadequate to explain from whence came the myriad bullets the remainder of the scene was landscape pale men yellow men blue men came out of this landscape quiet and sad-eyed with wounds often they were grimly facetious there is nothing in the American regulars so amazing as his conduct when he is wounded, his apologetic limp, his deprecatory arm-sling, his embarrassed and ashamed shot-hole through the lungs. The men of the 307th looked at calm creatures who had diverse punctures, and they were made better. These men told them that it was only necessary to keep a-goin'. They of the 307th lay on their bellies, red, sweating, and panting, and heeded the voice of the elder brother. Gates walked back of his line, very white of face, but hard and stern, past anything his men knew of him. After they had violently abjured him to lie down, and he had given weak backs a cold, stiff touch, the 307th charged by rushes. The hatless colonel made frenzied speech, but the man of the time was Gates. The men seemed to feel that this was his business. Some of the regular officers said afterward that the advance of the 307th was very respectable indeed. They were rather surprised, they said. At least five of the crack regiments of the regular army were in this division, and the 307th could win no more than a feeling of kindly appreciation yes it was very good very good indeed but did you notice what was being done at the same moment by the twelfth the seventeenth the seventh the eighth the twenty-fifth the gates felt that his charge was being a success he was carrying out a successful function two captains fell bang on the grass and a lieutenant slumped quietly down with a death wound many men sprawled suddenly Gates was keeping his men almost even with the regulars who were charging on his flanks. Suddenly he thought that he must have come close to the fort, and that a Spaniard had tumbled a great stone block down upon his leg. Twelve hands reached out to help him, but he cried, "'No, damn your souls! Go on! Go on!' 
He closed his eyes for a moment, and it really was only for a moment. When he opened them he found himself alone with Lige Wigram, who lay on the ground near him. Mage said Lige, you're a good man. I've been a-follerin' you all day, and I want to say you're a good man. The Major turned a coldly scornful eye upon the private. Where are you wounded? Can you walk? Well, if you can, go to the rear and leave me alone. I'm bleeding to death, and you bother me. Lige, despite the pain in his wounded shoulder, grew indignant. Well, he mumbled. You and me have been on the outs for a long time, and I only wanted to tell yer that what I seen o' you today has made me feel mighty different. Go to the rear, if you can walk, said the major. Now, Mage, look here, a little thing like that. Go to the rear. Lige gulped with sobs. Mage, I know I didn't understand you at first, but rather than let a little thing like that come between us, I'd... I'd go to the rear in this reiteration lige discovered a resemblance to that first old offensive phrase come to attention and salute he pondered over the resemblance and he saw that nothing had changed the man bleeding to death was the same man to whom he had once paid a friendly visit with unfriendly results he thought now that he perceived a certain hopeless gulf a gulf which is real or unreal, according to circumstances. Sometimes all men are equal. Occasionally they are not. If Gates had ever criticized Lige's manipulation of a hay-fork on the farm at home, Lige would have furiously disdained his hate or blame. He saw now that he must not openly approve the Major's conduct in war. The Major's pride was in his business, and his, Lige's, congratulations were beyond all enduring. The place where they were lying suddenly fell under a new heavy rain of bullets. They sputtered about the men, making the noise of large grasshoppers. "'Major!' cried Lige. "'Major Gates! It won't do for you to be left here, sir. You'll be killed!' "'But you can't help it, lad. You take care of yourself.' I'm damned if I do, said the private vehemently. If I can't get you out, I'll stay and wait. The officer gazed at his man with that same icy, contemptuous gaze. I'm, I'm a dead man anyhow. You go to the rear, do you hear? No. The dying major drew his revolver, cocked it, and aimed it unsteadily at Lige's head. Will you obey orders? No. One? No. Two? No. Gates weakly dropped his revolver. Go to the devil, then. You're no soldier, but— He tried to add something, but— He heaved a long moan. But you, you— Oh, I'm so tired. Five. After the battle, three correspondents happened to meet on the trail. They were hot, dusty, weary, hungry, and thirsty and they repaired to the shade of a mango-tree and sprawled luxuriously. Among them they mustered two-score friends who on that day had gone to the far shore of the hereafter, but their senses were no longer resonant. Shackles was babbling plaintively about mint juleps, and others were bidding him to have done. "'By the way,' said one at last, "'it's too bad about poor old Gates of the 307th. He bled to death. His men were crazy.' They were blubbering and cursing around there like wild people. It seemed that when they got back there to look for him, they found him just about gone, and another wounded man was trying to stop the flow with his hat. His hat, mind you. Poor old Gatesy. Oh, no, Shackles, said the third man of the party. Oh, no, you're wrong. The best mint juleps in the world were made right in New York, Philadelphia or Boston, that Kentucky idea is only a tradition. A wounded man approached them. He had been shot through the shoulder, and his shirt had been diagonally cut away, leaving much bare skin. Over the bullet's point of entry there was a kind of white spider shaped from pieces of adhesive plaster. Over the point of departure there was a bloody bulb of cotton strapped to the flesh by other pieces of adhesive plaster. His eyes were dreamy, wistful, sad. "'Say, gents, 
"'Any of you got a bottle?' he asked. A correspondent raised himself suddenly and looked with bright eyes at the soldier. "'Well, you have got a nerve,' he said, grinning. "'Have we got a bottle, eh? Huh? Who in hell do you think we are? If we had a bottle of good liquor, do you suppose we could let the whole army drink out of it? You have too much faith in the generosity of men, my friend.' The soldier stared, ox-like, and finally said, "'Huh?' "'I say,' continued the correspondent, somewhat more loudly, "'that if we had had a bottle we would have probably finished it ourselves by this time.' "'But,' said the other, dazed, "'I meant an empty bottle. I didn't mean no full bottle.' The correspondent was humorously irascible. "'An empty bottle? You must be crazy. Who ever heard of a man looking for an empty bottle? It ain't sense.' I've seen a million men looking for full bottles, but you're the first man I ever saw who insisted on the bottles being empty. What in the world do you want it for?" "'Well, you see, mister,' explained Lige slowly, "'our major he was killed this morning, and we're just going to bury him, and I thought I'd just take a look round and see if I couldn't borrow an empty bottle, and then I'd take and write his name and regiment on a paper and put it in the bottle and bury it with him, so's when they come for to dig him up some time and take him home, there sure wouldn't be no mistake." Oh. End of section 11「Story Eight of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story Eight Marines Signaling Under Fire at Guantanamo. They were four Guantanamo Marines, officially known for the time as signalmen, and it was their duty to lie in the trenches of Camp Macala that faced the water, and by day signal the Marblehead with a flag and by night signaled the marblehead with lanterns. It was my good fortune, at that time I considered it my bad fortune indeed, to be with them on two of the nights when a wild storm of fighting was peeling about the hill, and of all the actions of the war none were so hard on the nerves, none strained courage so near the panic point, as those swift nights in Camp Macalla, With a thousand rifles rattling, with the field guns booming in your ears, with the diabolic Colt automatic clacking, with the roar of the Marblehead coming from the bay, and last with Mauser bullets sneering always in the air a few inches over one's head, and with this enduring from dusk to dawn, it is extremely doubtful if any one who was there will be able to forget it easily the noise, the impenetrable darkness, the knowledge from the sound of the bullets that the enemy was on three sides of the camp, the infrequent bloody stumbling and death of some man with whom perhaps one had messed two hours previous, the weariness of the body and the more terrible weariness of the mind at the endlessness of the thing, made it wonderful that at least some of the men did not come out of it with their nerves hopelessly in shreds. But, as this interesting ceremony proceeded in the darkness, it was necessary for the signal squad to coolly take and send messages. Captain McCullough always participated in the defense of the camp by raking the woods on two of its sides with the guns of the Marblehead. Moreover, he was the senior officer present, and he wanted to know what was happening. All night long the crews of the ships in the bay would stare sleeplessly into the blackness toward the roaring hill. The signal squad had an old cracker box placed on top of the trench. When not signaling, they hid the lantern in this box, but as soon as an order to send a message was received, it became necessary for one of the men to stand up and expose the lights. And then, oh my eye! How the gorillas hidden in the gulf of night would turn loose at those yellow gleams! Signaling in this way is done by letting one lantern remain stationary, on top of the cracker box in this case, and moving the other over to the left and right, and so on in the regular gestures of the wigwagging code. It is a very simple system of night communication, but one can see that it presents rare possibilities when used in front of an enemy 
who, a few hundred yards away, is overjoyed at sighting so definite a mark. How, in the name of wonders, those four men at Camp McCalla were not riddled from head to foot and sent home more as repositories of Spanish ammunition than as marines is beyond all comprehension. To make a confession, when one of these men stood up to wave his lantern, I, lying in the trench, invariably rolled a little to the right or left in order that when he was shot he would not fall on me. But the squad came off scatheless, despite the best efforts of the most formidable corps in the Spanish army, the Escudera de Guantanamo. That it was the most formidable corps in the Spanish army of occupation has been told me by many Spanish officers, and also by General Menacal and other insurgent officers. General Menacal was Garcia's chief of staff when the latter was operating busily in Santiago province. The regiment was composed solely of practicals, or guides, who knew every shrub and tree on the ground over which they moved. Whenever the adjutant, Lieutenant Draper, came plunging along through the darkness with an order, such as, Ask the Marblehead to please shell the woods to the left, my heart would come into my mouth, for I knew then that one of my pals was going to stand up behind the lanterns and have all Spain shoot at him. The answer was always upon the instant, Yes, sir. Then the bullets began to snap, snap, snap at his head, while all the woods began to crackle like burning straw. I could lie near and watch the face of the signalman, illumined as it was by the yellow shine of lantern light, and the absence of excitement, fright, or any emotion at all on his countenance was something to astonish all theories out of one's mind. The face was in every instance merely that of a man intent upon his business, the business of wigwagging into the gulf of night where a light on the marble head was seen to move slowly. These times on the hill resembled in some ways those terrible scenes on the stage, scenes of intense gloom, blinding lightning, with a cloaked devil or assassin or other appropriate character muttering deeply amid the awful roll of the thunder-drums. It was theatric beyond words. One felt like a leaf in this booming chaos, this prolonged tragedy of the night. Amid it all one could see from time to time the yellow light on the face of a preoccupied signalman. Possibly no man who was there ever before understood the true eloquence of the breaking of the day. We would lie staring into the east, fairly ravenous for the dawn. Utterly worn to rags, with our nerves standing on end like so many bristles, we lay and watched the east, the unspeakably obdurate and slow east. It was a wonder that the eyes of some of us did not turn to glass balls from the fixity of our gaze. Then there would come into the sky a patch of faint blue light. It was like a piece of moonshine. Some would say it was the beginning of daybreak, and others would declare it was nothing of the kind. Men would get very disgusted with each other in these low-toned arguments held in the trenches. For my part, this development in the eastern sky destroyed many of my ideas and theories concerning the dawning of the day, but then I had never before had occasion to give it such solemn attention. This patch widened and whitened in about the speed of a man's accomplishment if he should be in the way of painting Madison Square Garden with a camel's hair brush. The guerrillas always set out to whoop it up about this time, because they knew the occasion was approaching when it would be expedient for them to elope. I, at least, always grew furious with this wretched sunrise. I thought I could have walked around the world in the time required for the old thing to get up above the horizon. One midnight, when an important message was to be sent to the Marblehead, Colonel Huntington came himself to the signal place with Adjutant Draper and Captain Macaulay, the quartermaster. When the man stood up to signal, the colonel stood beside him. At sight of the lights, the Spaniards performed as usual. They drove enough bullets into that immediate vicinity to kill all the Marines in the Corps. Lieutenant Draper was agitated for his chief. "'Colonel, won't you step down, sir?' 
"'Why, I guess not,' said the gray old veteran in his slow, sad, always gentle way. "'I am in no more danger than the man.' "'But, sir,' began the adjutant, "'oh, it's all right, Draper.' So the colonel and the private stood side to side and took the heavy fire without either moving a muscle. Day was always obliged to come at last, punctuated by a final exchange of scattering shots. And the light shone on the marines, the dumb guns, the flag. Grimy yellow face looked into grimy yellow face and grinned with weary satisfaction. Coffee! Usually it was impossible for many of the men to sleep at once. It always took me, for instance, some hours to get my nerves combed down. But then it was great joy to lie in the trench with the four signalmen and understand thoroughly that that night was fully over at last, and that, although the future might have in store other bad nights, that one could never escape from the prison-house which we call the past. At the wild little fight at Cusco there were some splendid exhibitions of wigwagging under fire. Action began when an advanced detachment of marines under Lieutenant Lucas with the Cuban guides had reached the summit of a ridge overlooking a small valley where there was a house, a well, and a thicket of some kind of shrub with great broad oily leaves. This thicket, which was perhaps an acre in extent, contained the guerrillas. The valley was open to the sea. The distance from the top of the ridge to the thicket was barely two hundred yards. The dolphin had sailed up the coast in line with the marine advance, ready with her guns to assist in any action. Captain Elliot, who commanded the two hundred marines in this fight, suddenly called out for a signalman. He wanted a man to tell the dolphin to open fire on the house and the thicket. It was a blazing, bitter-hot day on top of the ridge, with its shriveled chaparral and its straight, tall cactus plants. The sky was bare and blue and hurt like brass. In two minutes the prostrate marines were red and sweating like so many hull-buried stokers in the tropics. Captain Elliot called out, "'Where's a signalman? Who's a signalman here?' A red-headed Mick, I think his name was Clancy, at any rate it will do to call him Clancy, twisted his head from where he lay on his stomach, pumping his lee, and, saluting, said that he was a signalman. There was no regulation flag with the expedition, so Clancy was obliged to tie his blue polka-dot neckerchief on the end of his rifle. It did not make a very good flag. At first Clancy moved a ways down the safe side of the ridge, and wigwagged there very busily. But what with the flag being so poor for the purpose, and the background of the ridge being so dark, those on the dolphin did not see it. So Clancy had to return to the top of the ridge and outline himself and his flag against the sky. The usual thing happened. As soon as the Spaniards caught sight of this silhouette, they let go like mad at it. To make things more comfortable for Clancy, the situation demanded that he face the sea and turn his back to the Spanish bullets. This was a hard game, mark you, to stand with a small of your back to volley firing. Clancy thought so. Everybody thought so. We all cleared out of his neighborhood. If he wanted sole possession of any particular spot on that hill, he could have it, for all we would interfere with him. It cannot be denied that Clancy was in a hurry. I watched him. He was so occupied with the bullets that snarled close to his ears that he was obliged to repeat the letters of his message softly to himself. It seemed an intolerable time before the dolphin answered the little signal. Meanwhile we gazed at him, marveling every second that he had not yet pitched headlong. He swore at times. Finally the dolphin replied to his frantic gesticulation, and he delivered his message. As his part of the transaction was quite finished, whoop! He dropped like a brick into the firing line and began to shoot, began to get hunky with all those people who had been plugging at him. The blue polka-dot neckerchief still fluttered from the barrel of his rifle. I am quite certain that he let it remain there until the end of the fight. 
The shells of the dolphin began to plow up the thicket, kicking the bushes, stones, and soil into the air as if somebody was blasting there. Meanwhile, this force of two hundred marines and fifty Cubans, and the force of probably six companies of Spanish guerrillas, were making such an awful din that the distant Camp Macalla was all alive with excitement. Colonel Huntington sent out strong parties to critical points on the road to facilitate, if necessary, a safe retreat, and also sent forty men under Lieutenant McGill to come up on the left flank of the two companies in action under Captain Elliott. Lieutenant McGill and his men had crowned a hill which covered entirely the flank of the fighting companies, but when the dolphin opened fire it happened that McGill was in the line of the shots. It became necessary to stop the dolphin at once. Captain Elliott was not near Clancy at this time, and he called hurriedly for another signalman. Sergeant Quick arose and announced that he was a signalman. He produced from somewhere a blue polka-dot neckerchief as large as a quilt. He tied it on a long crooked stick. Then he went to the top of the ridge, and turning his back to the Spanish fire, began to signal to the dolphin. Again we gave a man sole possession of a particular part of the ridge. We didn't want it. He could have it and welcome. If the young sergeant had had the smallpox, the cholera, and the yellow fever, we could not have slid out with more celerity. As men have often said, it seemed as if there was in this war a god of battles who held his mighty hand before the Americans. As I looked at Sergeant Quick wigwagging there against the sky, I would not have given a tin tobacco tag for his life. Escape for him seemed impossible. It seemed absurd to hope that he would not be hit. I only hoped that he would be hit just a little in the arm the shoulder, or the leg. I watched his face, and it was as grave and serene as that of a man writing in his own library. He was the very embodiment of tranquillity in occupation. He stood there amid the animal-like babble of the Cubans, the crack of rifles, and the whistling snarl of the bullets, and wigwagged whatever he had to wigwag without heeding anything but his business. There was not a single trace of nervousness or haste. To say the least, a fight at close range is absorbing as a spectacle. No man wants to take his eyes from it until that time comes when he makes up his mind to run away. To deliberately stand up and turn your back to a battle is in itself hard work. To deliberately stand up and turn your back to a battle and hear immediate evidences of the boundless enthusiasm with which a large company of the enemy shoot at you from an adjacent thicket is, to my mind at least, a very great feat. One need not dwell upon the detail of keeping the mind carefully upon a slow spelling of an important code message. I saw Quick betray only one sign of emotion. As he swung his clumsy flag to and fro, an end of it once caught in a cactus pillar, and he looked sharply over his shoulder to see what had it. He gave the flag an impatient jerk. He looked annoyed. End of section 12《War Stories》by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 9. This Majestic Lie. Part 1. In the twilight a great crowd was streaming up the Prado in Havana. The people had been down to the shore to laugh and twiddle their fingers at the American blockading fleet, mere colorless shapes on the edge of the sea. Gorgeous challenges had been issued to the far-away ships by little children and women, while the men laughed. Havana was happy, for it was known that the illustrious sailor Don Patricio de Montojo had with his fleet met the decaying ships of one Dewey and smitten them into stuffing for a baby's pillow. Of course, the American sailors were drunk at the time, but the American sailors were always drunk. 
Newsboys galloped among the crowd, crying, La Lucha and La Marina. The papers said, This is as we foretold. How could it be otherwise when the cowardly Yankees met our brave sailors? But the tongues of the exuberant people ran more at large. One man said in a loud voice, how unfortunate it is that we still have to buy meat in Havana when so much pork is floating in Manila Bay. Amid the consequent laughter, another man retorted, Oh, never mind. That pork in Manila is rotten. It always was rotten. Still another man said, But, little friend, it would make good manure for our fields if only we had it. And still another man said, ah wait until our soldiers get with the wives of the americans and there will be many little yankees to serve hot on our tables the men of the main simply made our appetites good never mind the pork in manila there will be plenty women laughed children laughed because their mothers laughed everybody laughed and a word with you these people were cackling and chuckling and insulting their own dead their own dead men of spain for if the poor green corpses floated then in manila bay they were not american corpses the newsboys came charging with an extra the inhabitants of philadelphia had fled to the forests because of a spanish bombardment and also boston was besieged by the apaches who had totally invested the town the apache artillery had proven singularly effective and an american garrison had been unable to face it in chicago millionaires were giving away their palaces for two or three loaves of bread these dispatches were from madrid and every word was truth but they added little to the enthusiasm because the crowd god help mankind was greatly occupied with visions of yankee pork floating in manila bay this will be thought to be embittered writing very well the writer admits its untruthfulness in one particular it is untruthful in that it fails to reproduce one hundredth part of the grossness and indecency of popular expression in havana up to the time when the people knew they were beaten there were no lights on the prado or in the streets because of a military order in the slow-moving crowd there was a young man and an old woman suddenly the young man laughed a strange metallic laugh and spoke in english not cautiously that's damned hard to listen to the woman spoke quickly hush you little idiot do you want to be walking across the grass plot in cabanas with your arms tied behind you then she murmured sadly johnny i wonder if that's true what they say about manila i don't know said johnny but i think they're lying as they crossed the plaza they could see that the cafe tajon was crowded with spanish officers in blue and white pajama uniforms wine and brandy were being wildly consumed in honor of the victory at manila let's hear what they say said johnny to his companion and they moved across the street and in under the portales the owner of the cafe tajon was standing on a table making a speech amid cheers he was advocating the crucifixion of such americans as fell into spanish hands and it was all very sweet and white and tender but above all it was chivalrous because it is well known that the spaniards are a chivalrous people it has been remarked both by the english newspapers and by the bulls that are bred for the red death and secretly the corpses in manila bay mocked this jubilee the mocking mocking corpses in manila bay to be blunt johnny was an american spy once he had been the manager of a sugar plantation in pinar del rio and during the insurrection it had been his distinguished function to pay tribute money food and forage alike to spanish columns and insurgent bands he was performing this straddle with benefit to his crops and with mildew to his conscience when spain and the united states agreed to skirmish both in the name of honor it then became a military necessity that he should change his base 
Whatever of the province that was still alive was sorry to see him go, for he had been a very dexterous man, and food and wine had been in his house even when a man with a mango could gain the envy of an entire Spanish battalion. Without doubt he had been a mere trimmer, but it was because of his crop, and he always wrote the words thus, C-R-O-P. In those days a man of peace and commerce was in a position parallel to the watchmaker who essayed a task in the midst of a drunken brawl with oaths, bottles, and bullets flying about his intent, bowed head. So many of them, or all of them, were trimmers, and to any armed force they fervently said, God assist you. And, behold, the trimmers dwelt safely in a tumultuous land, and without effort, save that their little machines for trimming ran night and day. So many a plantation became covered with a maze of lies, as if thick webbing spiders had run from stalk to stalk in the cane. So sometimes a planter incurred an equal hatred from both sides, and when in trouble there was no camp to which he could flee, save straight in the air, the camp of the heavenly host. If Johnny had not had a crop, he would have been plainly on the side of the insurgents, but his crop staked him down to the soil at a point where the Spaniards could always be sure of finding him, him or his crop. It is the same thing. But when war came between Spain and the United States, he could no longer be the cleverest trimmer in Pinar del Rio, and he retreated upon Key West, losing much of his baggage train, not because of panic, but because of wisdom. In Key West he was no longer the manager of a big Cuban plantation. He was a little tan-faced refugee without much money. Mainly he listened. There was naught else to do. In the first place he was a young man of extremely slow speech, and in the Key West Hotel tongues ran like pinwheels. If he had projected his methodic way of thought and speech upon this hurricane, he would have been as effective as the man who tries to smoke against the gale. This truth did not impress him. Really, he was impressed with the fact that although he knew much of Cuba, he could not talk so rapidly and wisely of it as many war correspondents who had not yet seen the island. Usually he brooded in silence over a bottle of beer and the loss of his crop. He received no sympathy, although there was a plenitude of tender souls. War's first step is to make expectation so high that all present things are fogged and darkened in a tense wonder of the future. None cared about the collapse of Johnny's plantation when all were thinking of the probable collapse of cities and fleets. In the meantime, battleships, monitors, cruisers, gunboats, and torpedo craft arrived, departed, arrived, departed. Rumors sang about the ears of warships hurriedly coaling, and rumors sang about the ears of warships leisurely coming to anchor. This happened and that happened, and if the news arrived at Key West as a mouse, it was often enough cabled north as an elephant. The correspondents at Key West were perfectly capable of adjusting their perspective, but many of the editors in the United States were like deaf men at whom one has to roar. A few quiet words of information was not enough for them. One had to bawl into their ears a whirlwind tale of heroism, blood, death, victory, or defeat, at any rate a tragedy. The papers should have sent playwrights to the first part of the war. Playwrights are allowed to lower the curtain from time to time, and say to the crowd, Mark ye now, three or four months are supposed to elapse, but the poor devils at Key West were obliged to keep the curtain up all the time. This isn't a continuous performance. Yes, it is. It's got to be a continuous performance. The welfare of the paper demands it. The people want news. Very well. Continuous performance. It is strange how men of sense can go aslant at the bidding of other men of sense, and combine to contribute to a general mess of exaggeration and bombast. But we did, 
and in the midst of the furor I remember the still figure of Johnny, the planter, the ex-trimmer. He looked dazed. This was in May. We all liked him. From time to time some of us heard in his words the vibrant of a thoughtful experience. But it could not be well heard. It was only like the sound of a bell from under the floor. We were too busy with our own clatter. He was taciturn and competent, while we solved the war in a babble of tongues. Soon we went about our peaceful paths, saying ironically one to another, War is hell! Meanwhile, managing editors fought us tooth and nail, and we all were sent boxes of medals inscribed incompetency. We became furious with ourselves. Why couldn't we send hair-raising dispatches? Why couldn't we inflame the wires? All this we did. If a first-class armored cruiser, which had once been a towboat, fired a six-pounder shot from her forward thirteen-inch gun turret, the world heard of it, you bet. We were not idle men. We had come to report the war, and we did it. Our good names and our salaries depended upon it, and we were urged by our managing editors to remember that the American people were a collection of super-nervous idiots who would immediately have convulsions if we did not throw them some news, any news. It was not true at all. The American people were anxious for things decisive to happen. They were not anxious to be lulled to satisfaction with a drug but we lulled them. We told them this and we told them that, and I warrant you our screaming sounded like the noise of a lot of seabirds settling for the night among the black crags. In the meantime Johnny stared and meditated. In his unhurried, unstartled manner he was singularly like another man who was flying the pennant as commander-in-chief of the North Atlantic Squadron. Johnny was a refugee the admiral was an admiral. And yet they were much akin, these two. Their brother was the strategy board, the only capable political institution of the war. At Key West the naval officers spoke of their business and were devoted to it, and were bound to succeed in it. But when the flagship was in port, the only two people who were independent and sane were the admiral and Johnny. The rest of us were lulling the public with drugs. There was much discussion of the new batteries at Havana. Johnny was a typical American. In Europe a typical American is a man with a hard eye, chin whiskers, and a habit of speaking through his nose. Johnny was a young man of great energy, ready to accomplish a colossal thing for the basic reason that he was ignorant of its magnitude. In fact, he attacked all obstacles in life in a spirit of contempt, seeing them smaller than they were until he had actually surmounted them, when he was likely to be immensely pleased with himself. Somewhere in him there was a sentimental tenderness, but it was like a light seen afar at night. It came, went, appeared again in a new place, flickered, flared, went out, left you in a void and angry. And if his sentimental tenderness was a light, the darkness in which it puzzled you was his irony of soul. This irony was directed first at himself, then at you, then at the nation and the flag, then at God. It was a midnight in which you searched for the little elusive ashamed spark of tender sentiment. Sometimes you thought this was all pretext, the manner and the way of fear of the wit of others. Sometimes you thought he was a hardened savage. Usually you did not think, but waited, in the cheerful certainty that in time the little flare of light would appear in the gloom. Johnny decided that he would go and spy upon the fortifications of Havana. If anyone wished to know of those batteries, it was the admiral of the squadron, but the admiral of the squadron knew much. I feel sure that he knew the size and position of every gun. To be sure, new guns might be mounted at any time, but they would not be big guns, and doubtless he lacked in his cabin less information than would be worth a man's life. 
Still, Johnnie decided to be a spy. He would go and look. We of the newspapers pinned him fast to the tail of our kite, and he was taken to see the admiral. I judged that the admiral did not display much interest in the plan, but at any rate it seemed that he touched Johnny smartly enough with a brush to make him, officially, a spy. Then Johnny bowed and left the cabin. There was no other machinery. If Johnny was to end his life and leave a little book about it, no one cared, least of all Johnny and the admiral. When he came aboard the tug, he displayed his usual stalwart and rather selfish zest for fried eggs. It was all some kind of an ordinary matter. It was done every day. It was the business of packing pork, sewing shoes, binding hay. It was commonplace. No one could adjust it, get it in proportion until afterwards. On a dark night they heaved him into a small boat and rowed him to the beach. And one day he appeared at the door of a little lodging-house in Havana, kept by Martha Clancy, born in Ireland, bred in New York, fifteen years married to a Spanish captain, and now a widow, keeping Cuban lodgers who had no money with which to pay her. She opened the door only a little way, and looked down over her spectacles at him. "'Good morning, Martha,' he said. She looked a moment in silence. Then she made an indescribable gesture of weariness. "'Come in,' she said. He stepped inside. "'And in God's name couldn't you keep your neck out of this rope? And so you had to come here, did you, to Havana? Upon my soul, Johnny, my son, you are the biggest fool on two legs.' He moved past her into the courtyard and took his old chair at the table, between the winding stairway and the door, near the orange-tree. "'Why am I?' he demanded stoutly. She made no reply until she had taken seat in her rocking-chair and puffed several times upon a cigarette. Then through the smoke she said meditatively, "'Everybody knows you are a damned little mumby.' Sometimes she spoke with an Irish accent. He laughed. "'I'm no more of a mumby than you are, anyhow.' "'I'm no mumby, but your name is poison to half the Spaniards in Havana. That you know. And if you were once safe in Cayo Hueso, tis nobody but a born fool who would come blundering into Havana again. Have you had your dinner?' "'What have you got?' he asked before committing himself. She arose and spoke without confidence as she moved toward the cupboard. Oh, "'There's some codfish salad.' "'What?' said he. "'Codfish salad.' codfish what codfish salad ain't it good enough for you maybe this is delmonico's no maybe you never heard that the yankees have us blockaded eh maybe you think food can be picked in the streets here now eh i'll tell you one thing my son if you stay here long you'll see the want of it and so you had best not throw it over your shoulder the spy settled determinedly in his chair and delivered himself his final decision. That may be true, but I'm damned if I eat codfish salad. Old Martha was a picture of quaint despair. You'll not? No. Then, she sighed piously, may the Lord have mercy on ye, Johnny, for you'll never do here. Tis not the time for you. You're due after the blockade. Will you do me the favor of translating why you won't eat codfish salad, you skinny little insurrecto? Codfish salad, he said with a deep sneer. Who ever heard of it? Outside, on the jumbled pavement of the street, an occasional two-wheel cart passed with deafening thunder, making one think of the overturning of houses. Down from the pale sky over the patio came a heavy odor of Havana itself a smell of old straw. The wild cries of vendors could be heard at intervals. You'll not? No. And why not? Codfish salad? Not by a blame sight. Well, all right, then. You are more of a pig-headed young imbecile than even I thought before seeing you come into Havana here, where half the town knows you, and the poorest Spaniard would give a gold piece to see you go into cabanas and forget to come out. 
Did I tell you, my son, Alfred is sick? Yes, poor little fellow, he lies up in the room you used to have. The fever. And did you see Woodham in Key West? Heaven save us, what quick time he made in getting out. I hear Figtree and Button are working in the cable office over there, no? And when is the war going to end? Are the Yankees going to try to take Havana? It will be a hard job, Johnny. The Spaniards say it is impossible. Everybody is laughing at the Yankees. I hate to go into the street and hear them. Is General Lee going to lead the army? What's become of Springer? I see you've got a new pair of shoes. In the evening there was a sudden loud knock at the outer door. Martha looked at Johnny, and Johnny looked at Martha. He was still sitting in the patio, smoking. She took the lamp and set it on a table in the little parlour. This parlour connected the street door with the patio, and so Johnny would be protected from the sight of the people who knocked by the broad illuminated tract. Martha moved in pensive fashion upon the latch. "'Who's there?' she asked casually. "'The police!' There it was, an old melodramatic incident from the stage, from the romances. One could scarce believe it. It had all the dignity of a classic resurrection. The police! One sneers at its probability. It is too venerable. But so it happened. Who? said Martha. The police! What do you want here? Open the door, and we'll tell you. Martha drew back the ordinary huge bolts of a Havana house and opened the door a trifle. "'Tell me what you want, and be gone quickly,' she said, "'for my little boy is ill of the fever.' She could see four or five dim figures, and now one of these suddenly placed a foot well within the door so that she might not close it. "'We have come for Johnny. We must search your house.' "'Johnny? Johnny? Who is Johnny?' said Martha, in her best manner. The police inspector grinned with a light upon his face. "'Don't you know Signor Johnny from Pinar del Rio?' he asked. "'Before the war, yes. But now, where is he? He must be in Key West. He is in your house.' "'He? In my house? Do me the favour to think that I have some intelligence. Would I be likely to be harbouring a Yankee in these times?' You must think I have no more head than an ordin publico. And I'll not have you search my house, for there is no one here save my son, who is maybe dying of the fever, and the doctor. The doctor is with him because now is the crisis, and any one little thing may kill or cure my boy, and you will do me the favour to consider what may happen if I allow five or six heavy-footed policemen to go tramping all over my house. You may think— Stop it! said the chief police officer at last. He was laughing and weary and angry. Martha checked her flow of Spanish. There, she thought, I've done my best. He ought to fall in with it. But as the police entered, she began on them again. You will search the house whether I like it or no. Very well. But if anything happens to my boy, it is a nice way of conduct, anyhow, coming into the house of a widow at night and talking much about this Yankee and— For God's sake, Signora, hold your tongue. We— Oh, yes, the Signora can, for God's sake, very well hold her tongue, but that wouldn't assist you men into the street where you belong. Take care, if my sick boy suffers from this prowling. No, you'll find nothing in that wardrobe, and do you think he would be under the table? Don't overturn all that linen. Look at you, when you go upstairs, tread lightly. Leaving a man on guard at the street door and another at the patio, the chief policeman and the remainder of his men ascended to the gallery from which opened three sleeping-rooms. They were followed by Martha abjuring them to make no noise. The first room was empty, the second room was empty. As they approached the door of the third room, Martha whispered supplications, "'Now, in the name of God, don't disturb my boy!' The inspector motioned his men to pause, and then he pushed open the door. Only one weak candle was burning in the room, and its yellow light fell upon the bed whereon was stretched the figure of a little curly-headed boy in a white nightie. 
He was asleep, but his face was pink with fever, and his lips were murmuring some half-coherent childish nonsense. At the head of the bed stood the motionless figure of a man. His back was to the door, but upon hearing a noise he held a solemn hand. There was an odor of medicine. Out on the balcony Martha apparently was weeping. The inspector hesitated for a moment, then he noiselessly entered the room and with his yellow cane prodded under the bed, in the cupboard, and behind the window curtains. Nothing came of it. He shrugged his shoulders and went out to the balcony. He was smiling sheepishly. Evidently he knew that he had been beaten. Ah, very good, signora, he said. You are clever. Some day I shall be clever, too. He shook his finger at her. He was threatening her, but he affected to be playful. Then beware, beware. Martha replied blandly, My late husband, el capitan signor Don Patricio de Castellan y Valladolid, was a cavalier of Spain, and if he was alive to-night he would now be cutting the ears from the heads of you and your miserable men who smell frightfully of cognac. "'Poor Dios!' muttered the inspector, as, followed by his band, he made his way down the spiral staircase. "'It is a tongue, one vast tongue!' At the street door they made ironical bows. They departed. They were angry men. Johnny came down when he heard Martha bolting the door behind the police. She brought back the lamp to the table in the patio, and stood beside it, thinking— Johnny dropped into his old chair. The expression on the spy's face was curious. It pictured glee, anxiety, self-complacency. Above all, it pictured self-complacency. Martha said nothing. She was still by the lamp, musing. The long silence was suddenly broken by a tremendous guffaw from Johnny. "'Did you ever see such a lot of fools?' He leaned his head far back and roared victorious merriment. Martha was almost dancing in her apprehension. Hush! Be quiet, you little demon! Hush! Do me the favor to allow them to get to the corner before you bellow like a walrus. Be quiet! The spy ceased his laughter and spoke in indignation. Why, he demanded, ain't I got a right to laugh? "'Not with a noise like a cow falling into a cucumber-frame,' she answered sharply. "'Do me the favor. Then she seemed overwhelmed with a sense of the general hopelessness of Johnny's character. She began to wag her head. "'Oh, but you are the boy for getting yourself into the tiger's cage without even so much as the thought of a pocket-knife in your thick head. You would be a genius of the first water if you only had a little sense.' and now you're here, what are you going to do? He grinned at her. I'm going to hold an inspection of the land and sea defenses of the city of Havana. Martha's spectacles dropped low on her nose, and looking over the rims of them in grave meditation, she said, If you can't put up with a codfish salad, you had better make short work of your inspection of the land and sea defenses of the city of Havana, you are likely to starve in the meantime. A man who is particular about his food has come to the wrong town if he is in Havana now. No, but, asked Johnny seriously, haven't you any bread? Bread? Well, coffee, then? Coffee alone will do. Coffee? Johnny arose deliberately and took his hat. Martha eyed him. And where do you think you are going? she asked cuttingly. Still deliberate, Johnny moved in the direction of the street door. I'm going where I can get something to eat. Martha sank into a chair with a moan which was a finished opinion, almost a definition, of Johnny's behavior in life. And where will you go? she asked faintly. Oh, I don't know, he rejoined. Some café. Guess I'll go to the Café Aguacate. They feed you well there, I remember. You remember, they remember. They know you as well as if you were the sign over the door. Oh, they won't give me away, said Johnny, with stalwart confidence. G -g give you away? 
give you away," stammered Martha. The spy made no answer, but went to the door, unbarred it, and passed into the street. Martha caught her breath and ran after him, and came face to face with him as he turned to shut the door. "'Johnny, if you come back, bring a loaf of bread. I'm dying for one good honest bite in a slice of bread.' She heard his peculiar, derisive laugh as she bolted the door. She returned to her chair in the patio. "'Well, there,' she said, with affection, admiration, and contempt, "'there he goes, the most hard-headed little ignoramus in twenty nations. What does he care? Nothing. And why is it? Pure bread in the bone ignorance. Just because he can't stand codfish salad, he goes out to a café. A café where they know him as if they had made him. Well, I won't see him again, probably, but if he comes back, I hope he brings some bread. I'm near dead for it. End of section 13「Story Nine of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story Nine This Majestic Lie, Parts Two through Four. Two. Johnny strolled carelessly through dark, narrow streets. Near every corner were two orden publicos, a kind of soldier police quiet in the shadow of some doorway, their Remingtons ready, their eyes shining. Johnny walked past as if he owned them, and their eyes followed him with a sort of lazy mechanical suspicion which was militant in none of its moods. Johnny was suffering from a desire to be splendidly imprudent. He wanted to make the situation gasp and thrill and tremble. From time to time he tried to conceive the idea of his being caught, but to save his eyes he could not imagine it. Such an event was impossible to his peculiar breed of fatalism, which could not have conceded death until he had mouldered seven years. He arrived at the Café Aguacate and found it much changed. The thick wooden shutters were up to keep light from shining into the street. Inside there were only a few Spanish officers. Johnny walked to the private rooms at the rear. He found an empty one and pressed the electric button. When he had passed through the main part of the café, no one had noted him. The first to recognize him was the waiter who answered the bell. This worthy man turned to stone before the presence of Johnny. "'Buenas noches, Francisco,' said the spy, enjoying himself. "'I have hunger. Bring me bread, butter, eggs, and coffee.' There was a silence. The waiter did not move. Johnny smiled casually at him. The man's throat moved. Then, like one suddenly re-endowed with life, he bolted from the room. After a long time he returned with the proprietor of the place— in the wicked eye of the latter there gleamed the light of a plan. He did not respond to Johnny's genial greeting, but at once proceeded to develop his position. "'Johnny,' he said, "'bread is very dear in Havana. It is very dear.' "'Is it?' said Johnny, looking keenly at the speaker. He understood at once that here was some sort of an attack upon him. "'Yes,' answered the proprietor of the Café Aguacate, slowly and softly. "'It is very dear. I think to-night one small bit of bread will cost you one centine in advance.' A centine approximates five dollars in gold. The spy's face did not change. He appeared to reflect. "'And how much for the butter?' he asked at last. The proprietor gestured, There is no butter. Do you think we can have everything with those Yankee pigs sitting out there on their ships? And how much for the coffee? asked Johnny musingly. Again the two men surveyed each other during a period of silence. Then the proprietor said gently, I think your coffee will cost you about two centines. And the eggs? Eggs are very dear. I think eggs would cost you about three centines for each one. 
the new looked at the old the north atlantic looked at the mediterranean the wooden nutmeg looked at the olive johnny slowly took six centines from his pocket and laid them on the table that's for bread coffee and one egg i don't think i could eat more than one egg tonight i'm not so hungry as i was the proprietor held a perpendicular finger and tapped the table with it oh senor he said politely i think you would like two eggs johnny saw the finger he understood it e yes he drawled i would like two eggs he placed three more centines on the table and uh, a little thing for the waiter i am sure his services will be excellent invaluable e yes for the waiter another centine was laid on the table the proprietor bowed and preceded the waiter out of the room there was a mirror on the wall and springing to his feet the spy thrust his face close to the honest glass well i'm damned he ejaculated is this me or is this the honourable d hayseed whiskers of kansas who am i anyhow five dollars in gold say these people are clever they know their business they do bread coffee and two eggs and not even sure of getting it fifty da never mind wait until the war is over fifty dollars gold he sat for a long time nothing happened mm, he said at last that's the game as the front door of the cafe closed upon him he heard the proprietor and one of the waiters burst into derisive laughter martha was waiting for him and here you are safe back she said with delight as she let him enter and did you bring the bread did you bring the bread but she saw that he was raging like a lunatic his face was red and swollen with temper his eyes shot forth gleams presently he stood before her in the patio where the light fell on him don't speak to me he choked out waving his arms don't speak to me damn your bread i went to the cafe aguacate oh yes i went there of course i did and do you know what they did to me no oh they didn't do anything to me at all not a thing fifty dollars ten gold pieces may the saints guard us cried martha and what was that for because they wanted them more than i did snarled johnny don't you see the game i go into the cafe aguacate the owner of the place says to himself hello here's that yankee what they call johnny he's got no right here in havana i guess i'll peach on him to the police they'll put him in cabanas as a spy then he does a little more thinking and finally he says no i guess i won't peach on him just this minute first i'll take a small flyer myself so in he comes and looks me right in the eye and says excuse me but it will be a centine for the bread a centine for the coffee and eggs are at three centines each besides there will be a small matter of another gold piece for the waiter i think this over i think it over hard he's clever anyhow when this cruel war is over i'll be after him i'm a nice secret agent of the united states government i am i am here to be too clever for all the spanish police and the first thing i do is get buncoed by a rotten little thimble rigger in a cafe oh yes i'm all right may the saints guard us cried martha again i'm old enough to be your mother or maybe your grandmother and i've seen a lot but it's many a year since i laid eyes on such a ignorant wrong-headed little red indian as ye are why didn't ye take my advice and stay here at the house with decency and comfort but he must be all for doing everything high and mighty the cafe aguacate if you please no plain food for his highness he turns up his nose at codfish salad thunder and lightnin are you going to ram that thing down my throat every two minutes are you and in truth she could see that one more reference to that illustrious beyond would break the back of johnny's gentle disposition as one breaks a twig on the knee 
She shifted with Celtic ease. Did you bring the bread? she asked. He gazed at her for a moment and suddenly laughed. I forgot to mention, he informed her impressively, that they did not take the trouble to give me either the bread, the coffee, or the eggs. The powers! cried Martha. But it's all right. I stopped at a shop. From his pockets he brought a small loaf, some kind of German sausage, and a flask of Jamaica rum. About all I could get, and they didn't want to sell them, either. They expect presently they can exchange a box of sardines for a grand piano. We are not blockaded by the Yankee warships. We are blockaded by our grocers, said Martha, quoting the epidemic Havana saying. But she did not delay long from the little loaf. She cut a slice from it and sat eagerly munching. Johnny seemed more interested in the Jamaica rum. He looked up from his second glass, however, because he heard a peculiar sound. The old woman was weeping. Eh, what's this? he demanded in distress, but with the manner of a man who thinks gruffness is the only thing that will make people feel better and cease. What's this, anyhow? What are you crying for? It's the bread, sobbed Martha. It's the bread. Huh? What's the matter with it? It's so good, so g g good. The rain of tears did not prevent her from continuing her unusual report. Oh, it's so good. This is the first in weeks. I didn't know bread could be so like heaven. Here, said Johnny seriously, take a little mouthful of this rum. It will do you good. No, I only want the b b b b b bread. Well, take the bread, too. There you are. Now you feel better. By Jove, when I think of that Café Aguacate man, fifty dollars gold, and then not to get anything either. Say, after the war, I'm going there, and I'm just going to raise that place to the ground. You see, I'll make him think he can charge me fifteen dollars for an egg, and then not give me the egg. 3. Johnny's subsequent activity in Havana could truthfully be related in part to a certain temporary price of eggs. It is interesting to note how close that famous event got to his eye, so that, according to the law of perspective, it was as big as the capital of Washington, where centers the spirit of his nation. Around him he felt a similar and ferocious expression of life, which informed him too plainly that if he was caught he was doomed. Neither the garrison nor the citizens of Havana would tolerate any nonsense in regard to him if he was caught. He would have the steel screw against his neck in short order, and what was the main thing to bear him up against the desire to run away before his work was done? A certain temporary price of eggs? It not only hid the capital of Washington, it obscured the dangers in Havana. Something was learned of the Santa Clara battery, because one morning an old lady in black accompanied by a young man, evidently her son, visited a house which was to rent on the height in rear of the battery. The portrero was too lazy and sleepy to show them over the premises, but he granted them permission to investigate for themselves. They spent most of their time on the flat, parapeted roof of the house. At length they came down and said that the place did not suit them. The portrero went to sleep again. Johnny was never discouraged by the thought that his operations would be of small benefit to the admiral commanding the fleet in adjacent waters, and to the general commanding the army which was not going to attack Havana from the land side. At that time it was all the world's opinion that the army from Tampa would presently appear on the Cuban beach at some convenient point to the east or west of Havana. It turned out, of course, that the condition of the defenses of Havana was of not the slightest military importance to the United States, since the city was never attacked, either by land or sea. But Johnny could not foresee this. 
He continued to take his fancy risk, continued his majestic lie, with satisfaction, sometimes with delight, and with pride. And in the psychologic distance was old Martha dancing with fear and shouting, Oh, Johnny, me son, what a born fool ye are! Sometimes she would address him thus, And when ye learn all this, how are ye going to get out with it? She was contemptuous. He would reply, as serious as a Cossack in his fatalism, Oh, I'll get out some way. His manoeuvres in the vicinity of Reja and Juanabacoa were of a brilliant character. He haunted the sunny, long grass in the manner of a jack-rabbit. Sometimes he slept under a palm, dreaming of the American advance fighting its way along the military road to the foot of Spanish defences. Even when awake he often dreamed it, and thought of the all-day crash and hot roar of an assault. Without consulting Washington, he had decided that Havana should be attacked from the southeast. An advance from the west would be contested right up to the bar of the Hotel Inglaterra. But when the first ridge of the southeast would be taken, the whole city, with most of its defenses, would lie under the American siege guns. And the approach to this position was as reasonable as any approach toward the muzzles of magazine rifles. Johnny viewed the grassy fields always as a prospective battleground, and one can see him lying there, filling the landscape with visions of slow-crawling black infantry columns, galloping batteries of artillery, streaks of faint blue smoke marking the modern firing lines, clouds of dust, a vision of ten thousand tragedies, and his ears heard the noises. But he was no idle shepherd boy, with a head haunted by sombre and glorious fancies. On the contrary, he was much occupied with practical matters. Some months after the close of the war, he asked me, Were you ever fired at from very near? I explained some experiences which I had stupidly esteemed as having been rather near. But did you ever have him fire a volley on you from close, very close, say, thirty feet? Highly scandalized, I answered, no. In that case, I would not be the crowning feature of the Smithsonian Institute. Well, he said, it's a funny effect. You feel as every hair on your head had been snatched out by the roots. Questioned further, he said, I walked right up on a Spanish outpost at daybreak once, and about twenty men let go at me. Thought I was a Cuban army, I suppose. What did you do? <laughs> I run. Did they hit you at all? Nah. It had been arranged that some light ship of the squadron should rendezvous with him at a certain lonely spot on the coast on a certain day and hour, and pick him up. He was to wave something white. His shirt was not white, but he waved it whenever he could see the signal tops of a warship. It was a very tattered banner. After a ten-mile scramble through almost pathless thickets, he had very little on him which respectable men would call a shirt, and the less one says about his trousers the better. This naked savage, then, walked all day up and down a small bit of beach waving a brown rag. At night he slept in the sand. At full daybreak he began to wave his rag. At noon he was waving his rag. At nightfall he donned his rag, and strove to think of it as a shirt. Thus passed two days, and nothing had happened. Then he retraced a twenty-five-mile way to the house of old Martha. At first she took him to be one of Havana's terrible beggars, and cried, And do you come here for alms? Look out, that I do not beg of you. The one unchanged thing was his laugh of pure mockery. When she heard it, she dragged him through the door. He paid no heed to her ejaculations, but went straight to where he had hidden some gold. As he was untying a bit of string from the neck of a small bag, he said, How is little Alfred? Oh, recovered, thank heaven! He handed Martha a piece of gold. Take this, and buy what you can on the corner. I'm hungry. Martha departed with expedition. Upon her return she was beaming. 
She had foraged a thin chicken, a bunch of radishes, and two bottles of wine. Johnny had finished the radishes and one bottle of wine when the chicken was still a long way from the table. He called stoutly for more, and so Martha passed again into the street with another gold piece. She bought more radishes, more wine, and some cheese. They had a grand feast, with Johnny audibly wondering until a late hour why he had waved his rag in vain. There was no end to his suspense, no end to his work. He knew everything. He was an animate guide-book. After he knew a thing once, he verified it in several different ways in order to make sure. He fitted himself for a useful career like a young man in a college, with the difference that the shadow of the garret fell ever upon his way, and that he was occasionally shot at, and that he could not get enough to eat, and that his existence was apparently forgotten, and that he contracted the fever. But one cannot think of the terms in which to describe a futility so vast, so colossal. He had builded a little boat, and the sea had receded and left him and his boat a thousand miles inland on the top of a mountain. The war fate had left Havana out of its plan, and thus isolated Johnny and his several pounds of useful information. The war fate left Havana to become the somewhat indignant victim of a peaceful occupation at the close of the conflict, and Johnny's data were worth as much as a carpenter's lien on the North Pole. He had suffered and labored for about as complete a bit of absolute nothing as one could invent. If the company which owned the sugar plantation had not generously continued his salary during the war, he would not have been able to pay his expenses on the amount allowed him by the government, which, by the way, was a more complete bit of absolute nothing than one could possibly invent. 4. I met Johnny in Havana in October 1898. If I remember rightly, the USS Resolute and the USS Scorpion were in the harbor, but beyond these two terrible engines of destruction there were not as yet any of the more stern signs of the American success. Many Americans were to be seen in the streets of Havana, where they were not in any way molested. Among them was Johnny, in white duck and a straw hat cool, complacent, and with eyes rather more steady than ever. I addressed him upon the subject of his supreme failure, but I could not perturb his philosophy. In reply he simply asked me to dinner. "'Come to the Café Aguacate at seven-thirty to-night,' he said. "'I haven't been there in a long time. We shall see if they cook as well as ever.' I turned up promptly, and found Johnny in a private room smoking a cigar in the presence of a waiter who was blue in the gills. "'I've ordered the dinner,' he said cheerfully. "'Now I want to see if you won't be surprised how well they can do here in Havana.' I was surprised. I was dumbfounded. Rarely in the history of the world have two rational men sat down to such a dinner. It must have taxed the ability and endurance of the entire working force of the establishment to provide it. The variety of dishes was, of course, related to the markets of Havana, but the abundance and general profligacy was related only to Johnny's imagination. Neither of us had an appetite. Our fancies fled in confusion before this puzzling luxury. I looked at Johnny as if he were a native of Tibet. I had thought him to be a most simple man, and here I found him reveling in food like a fat old senator of Rome's decadence. And if the dinner itself put me to open-eyed amazement, the names of the wines finished everything. Apparently Johnny had had but one standard, and that was the cost. If a wine had been very expensive, he had ordered it. I began to think him probably a maniac. At any rate, I was sure that we were both fools. Seeing my fixed stare, he spoke with affected languor. I wish Peacock's brains and melted pearls were to be had here in Havana. We'd have em. Then he grinned. 
As a mere skirmisher, I said, in New York we think we dine well, but really this, you know, well, Havana? Johnny waved his hand pompously. Oh, I know. Directly after coffee, Johnny excused himself for a moment and left the room. When he returned, he said briskly, Well, are you ready to go? As soon as we were in a cab and safely out of hearing of the Café Aguacate, Johnny lay back and laughed long and joyously. But I was very serious. Look here, Johnny, I said to him solemnly, when you invite me to dine with you, don't you ever do that again. And I'll tell you one thing, when you dine with me, you will probably get the ordinary table d'hôte. I was an older man. Oh, that's all right, he cried, and then he too grew serious. Well, as far as I am concerned, as far as I am concerned, he said, the war is now over. End of section 14「Story Ten of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story Ten War Memories, Part One. But to get the real thing, cried Vernal, the war correspondent, it seems impossible. It is because war is neither magnificent nor squalid. It is simply life, and an expression of life can always evade us. We can never tell life, one to another, although sometimes we think we can. When I climbed aboard the dispatch boat at Key West, the mate told me irritably that as soon as we crossed the bar we would find ourselves monkey-climbing over heavy seas. It wasn't my fault, but he seemed to insinuate that it was all a result of my incapacity. There were four correspondents in the party. The leader of us came aboard with a huge bunch of bananas, which he hung like a chandelier in the center of the tiny cabin. We made acquaintance over, around, and under this bunch of bananas, which really occupied the cabin as a soldier occupies a sentry box. But the bunch did not become really aggressive until we were well at sea. Then it began to spar. With the first roll of the ship it launched its honest pounds at McGurdy, and knocked him wildly through the door to the deck-rail, where he hung, cursing hysterically. Without a moment's pause it made for me. I flung myself head first into my bunk and watched the demon sweep Brownlow into a corner and wedge his knee behind a sea chest. Carrie gave a shrill cry and fled. The bunch of bananas swung to and fro, silent, determined, ferocious, looking for more men. It had cleared a space for itself. My comrades looked in at the door, calling upon me to grab the thing and hold it. I pointed out to them the security and comfort of my position. They were angry. Finally the mate came and lashed the thing so that it could not prowl about the cabin and assault innocent war correspondents. You see, war, a bunch of bananas rampant because the ship rolled. In that early period of the war we were forced to continue our dreams, and we were all dreamers, envisioning the seas with dead grapples, ship and ship. Even the navy grew cynical. Officers on the bridge lifted their megaphones and told you, in resigned voices, that they were out of ice, onions, and eggs. At other times they would shoot quite casually at us with six-pounders. This industry usually progressed in the night, but it sometimes happened in the day. There was never any resentment on our side, although at moments there was some nervousness. They were impressively quick with their lanyards. Our means of replying to signals were correspondingly slow. They gave you opportunity to say, Heaven guard me, and then they shot. But we recognized the propriety of it. Everything was correct, save the war, which lagged and lagged and lagged. It did not play. It was not a gory giant. It was a bunch of bananas swung in the middle of the cabin. Once we had the honor of being rammed at midnight by the USS Machias. 
In fact, the exceeding industry of the naval commanders of the Cuban blockading fleet caused a certain liveliness to at times penetrate our mediocre existence. We were all greatly entertained over an immediate prospect of being either killed by rapid fire guns, cut in half by the ram, or merely drowned. But even our great longing for diversion could not cause us to ever again go near the Machias on a dark night. We had sailed from Key West on a mission that had nothing to do with the coast of Cuba, and steaming due east and some thirty-five miles from the Cuban land, we did not think we were liable to an affair with any of the fierce American cruisers. Suddenly a familiar signal of red and white lights flashed like a brooch of jewels on the pall that covered the sea. It was far away and tiny, but we knew all about it. It was the electric question of an American warship, and it demanded a swift answer in kind. The man behind the gun. What about the man in front of the gun? The warship signals vanished, and the sea presented nothing but a smoky black stretch, lit with the hissing white tops of the flying waves. A thin line of flame swept from a gun. Thereafter followed one of those silences which had become so peculiarly instructive to the blockade-runner. Somewhere in the darkness we knew that a slate-colored cruiser, red below the water-line, and with a gold scroll on her bows, was flying over the waves toward us, while upon the dark decks the men stood at general quarters in silence about the long thin guns, and it was the law of life and death that we should make true answer in about the twelfth part of a second. Now I shall with regret disclose a certain dreadful secret of the dispatch-boat service. Our signals, far from being electric, were two lanterns which we kept in a tub and covered with a tarpaulin. The tub was placed just forward of the pilot-house, and when we were accosted at night it was everybody's duty to scramble wildly for the tub and grab out the lanterns and wave them. It amounted to a slowness of speech. I remember a story of an army sentry who, upon hearing a noise in his front one dark night, called his usual sharp query, Halt! Who's there? Halt! Or I'll fire! And getting no immediate response, he fired, even as he had said, killing a man with a hair lip who, unfortunately, could not arrange his vocal machinery to reply in season. We were something like a boat with a hair lip, and sometimes it was very trying to the nerves. The pause was long. Then a voice spoke from the sea through a megaphone. It was faint, but clear. What ship is that? No one hesitated over his answer in cases of this kind. Everybody was desirous of imparting fullest information. There was another pause. Then out of the darkness flew an American cruiser, silent as death, handled as ferociously as if the devil commanded her. Again the little voice hailed from the bridge, "'What ship is that?' Evidently the reply to the first hail had been misunderstood or not heard. This time the voice rang with menace, menace of immediate and certain destruction, and the last word was intoned savagely and strangely across the windy darkness, as if the officer would explain that the cruiser was after either fools or the common enemy. The yells in return did not stop her. She was hurling herself forward to ram us amidships, and the people on the little three friends looked at a tall, swooping bow, and it was keener than any knife that has ever been made. As the cruiser lunged, every man imagined the gallant and famous but frail three friends cut into two parts as neatly as if she had been cheese. But there was a sheer, and a hard sheer, to starboard and down upon our quarter swung a monstrous thing larger than any ship in the world, the USS Mejias. She had a freeboard of about three hundred feet, and the top of her funnel was out of sight in the clouds like an alp. I shouldn't wonder that at the top of that funnel there was a region of perpetual snow. 
and at a range which swiftly narrowed to nothing every gun in her port battery swung deliberately into aim. It was closer, more deliciously intimate than a duel across a handkerchief. We all had an opportunity of looking miles down the muzzles of this festive artillery before came the collision. Then the Machias reeled her steel shoulder against the wooden side of the three friends, and up went a roar as if a vast shingle roof had fallen. The poor little tug dipped as if she meant to pass under the warship, staggered and finally righted, trembling from head to foot. The cries of the splintered timbers ceased. The men on the tug gazed at each other with white faces shining faintly in the darkness. The Machias backed away even as the three friends drew slowly ahead, and again we were alone with the piping of the wind and the slash of the gale-driven water. Later, from some hidden part of the sea, the bullish eye of a searchlight looked at us, and the widening white rays bathed us in the glare. There was another hail. "'Hello there, three friends!' "'My eye, sir. Are you injured?' Our first mate had taken a lantern and was studying the side of the tug, and we held our breath for his answer. I was sure that he was going to say that we were sinking. Surely there could be no other ending to this terrific bloodthirsty assault. But the first mate said, No, sir. Instantly the glare of the searchlight was gone. The Machias was gone. The incident was closed. I was dining once on board the flagship, the New York, armored cruiser. It was the junior officer's mess, and when the coffee came, a young ensign went to the piano and began to bang out a popular tune. It was a cheerful scene, and it resembled only a cheerful scene. Suddenly we heard the whistle of the boatswain's mate, and directly above us, it seemed, a voice, hoarse as that of a sea-lion, bellowed a command, "'Man the port battery!' In a moment the table was vacant. The popular tunes ceased in a jangle. On the quarter-deck assembled a group of officers, spectators. The quiet evening sea, lit with faint red lights, went peacefully to the feet of a verdant shore. One could hear the far-away measured tumbling of surf upon a reef. Only this sound pulsed in the air. The great grey cruiser was as still as the earth, the sea, and the sky. Then they let off a four-inch gun directly under my feet. I thought it turned me a back somersault. That was the effect upon my mind, but it appears I did not move. The shell went carousing off to the Cuban shore, and from the vegetation there spurted a cloud of dust. Some of the officers on the quarter-deck laughed. Through their glasses they had seen a Spanish column of cavalry much agitated by the appearance of this shell among them. As far as I was concerned, there was nothing but the spurt of dust from the side of a long-suffering island. When I returned to my coffee, I found that most of the young officers had also returned. Japanese boys were bringing liquors. The piano's clattering of the popular air was often interrupted by the boom of a four-inch gun. A bunch of bananas! One day our dispatch boat found the shores of Guantanamo Bay flowing past on either side. It was at nightfall, and on the eastward point a small village was burning, and it happened that a fiery light was thrown upon some palm trees, so that it made them into enormous crimson feathers. The water was the color of blue steel, the Cuban woods were somber, high shivered the gory feathers. The last boatloads of the Marine Battalion were pulling for the beach. The Marine officers gave me generous hospitality to the camp on the hill. That night there was an alarm, and amid a stern calling of orders and a rushing of men, I wandered in search of some other man who had no occupation. It turned out to be the young assistant surgeon, Gibbs. We foregathered in the center of a square of six companies of Marines. There was no firing. We thought it rather comic. The next night there was an alarm. There was some firing. We lay on our bellies. It was no longer comic. On the third night the alarm came early. 
I went in search of Gibbs, but I soon gave over an active search for the more congenial occupation of lying flat and feeling the hot hiss of the bullets trying to cut my hair. For a moment I was no longer a cynic. I was a child who, in a fit of ignorance, had jumped into the vat of war. I heard somebody dying near me. He was dying hard, hard. It took him a long time to die. He breathed as all noble machinery breathes when it is making its gallant strife against breaking, breaking. But he was going to break. He was going to break. It seemed to me this breathing, the noise of a heroic pump which strives to subdue a mud which comes upon it in tons. The darkness was impenetrable. The man was lying in some depression within seven feet of me. Every wave, vibration of his anguish beat upon my senses. He was long past groaning. There was only the bitter strife for air which pulsed out into the night in a clear, penetrating whistle with intervals of terrible silence in which I held my own breath in the common unconscious aspiration to help. I thought this man would never die. I wanted him to die, and ultimately he died. At the moment the adjutant came bustling along, erect amid the spitting bullets. I knew him by his voice. "'Where's the doctor? There's some wounded men over there. Where's the doctor?' A man answered briskly, "'Just died this minute, sir.' It was as if he had said, "'Just gone around the corner this minute, sir.' Despite the horror of this night's business, the man's mind was somehow influenced by the coincidence of the adjutant's calling aloud for the doctor within a few seconds of the doctor's death. It, uh, what shall I say, it interested him, this coincidence. The day broke by inches with an obvious and maddening reluctance. From some unfathomable source I procured an opinion that my friend was not dead at all. The wild and quivering darkness had caused me to misinterpret a few shouted words. At length the land brightened in a violent atmosphere, the perfect dawning of a tropic day, and in this light I saw a clump of men near me. At first I thought they were all dead. Then I thought they were all asleep. The truth was that a group of wan-faced, exhausted men had gone to sleep about Gibbs' body so closely and in such abandoned attitudes that one's eye could not pick the living from the dead until one saw that a certain head had beneath it a great dark pool. In the afternoon a lot of men went bathing, and in the midst of this festivity firing was resumed. It was funny to see the men come scampering out of the water, grab at their rifles, and go into action attired in naught but their cartridge belts. The attack of the Spaniards had interrupted in some degree the services over the graves of Gibbs and some others. I remember Payne came ashore with a bottle of whiskey, which I took from him violently. My faithful shooting boots began to hurt me, and I went to the beach and poulticed my feet in wet clay, sitting on the little rickety pier near where the corrugated iron cable station showed how the shells slivered through it. Some marines, desirous of mementos, were poking with sticks in the smoking ruins of the hamlet. Down in the shallow water crabs were meandering among the weeds, and little fishes moved slowly in schools. The next day we went shooting. It was exactly like quail shooting, I'll tell you. These gorillas who so cursed our lives had a well some five miles away, and it was the only water supply within about twelve miles of the marine camp. It was decided that it would be correct to go forth and destroy the well. Captain Elliot, of C Company, was to take his men with Captain Spicer's Company, D, out to the well, beat the enemy away, and destroy everything. He was to start at the next daybreak. He asked me if I cared to go, and of course I accepted with glee. But all that night I was afraid, bitterly afraid. The moon was very bright, shedding a magnificent radiance upon the trenches. 
I watched the men of C and D companies lying so tranquilly, some snoring, confound them, whereas I was certain that I could never sleep with the weight of a coming battle upon my mind, a battle in which the poor life of a war correspondent might easily be taken by a careless enemy. But if I was frightened, I was also very cold. It was a chill night, and I wanted a heavy topcoat almost as much as I wanted a certificate of immunity from rifle bullets. These two feelings were of equal importance to my mind. They were twins. Elliot came and flung a tent fly over Lieutenant Banion and me as we lay on the ground back of the men. Then I was no longer cold, but I was still afraid, for tent flies cannot mend a fear. In the morning I wished for some mild attack of disease, something that would incapacitate me for the business of going out gratuitously to be bombarded. But I was in an awkwardly healthy state, and so I must needs smile and look pleased with my prospects. We were to be guided by fifty Cubans, and I gave up all dreams of a postponement when I saw them shambling off in a single file through the cactus. We followed presently. Where are you people going to? Don't know, Jim. Well, good luck to you, boys. This was the world's lazy inquiry and conventional godspeed. Then the mysterious wilderness swallowed us. The men were silent because they were ordered to be silent, but whatever faces I could observe were marked with a look of serious meditation. As they trudged slowly in single file, they were reflecting upon what? I don't know, but at length we came to ground more open. The sea appeared on our right, and we saw the gunboat Dolphin steaming along in a line parallel to ours. I was as glad to see her as if she had called out my name. The trail wound about the bases of some high, bare spurs. If the Spaniards had occupied them, I don't see how we could have gone further. But upon them were only the dove-voiced guerrilla scouts, calling back into the hills the news of our approach. The effect of sound is, of course, relative. I am sure I have never heard such a horrible sound as the beautiful cooing of the wood-dove when I was certain that it came from the yellow throat of a gorilla. Elliot sent Lieutenant Lucas with his platoon to ascend the hills and cover our advance by the trail. We halted and watched them climb, a long black streak of men in the vivid sunshine of the hillside. We did not know how tall were these hills until we saw Lucas and his men on top, and they were no larger than specks. We marched on until, at last, we heard, it seemed in the sky, the sputter of firing. This devil's dance was begun. The proper strategic movement to cover the crisis seemed to me to be to run away home and swear I had never started on this expedition. But Elliot yelled, Now, men, straight up this hill! The men charged up against the cactus, and because I cared for the opinion of others, I found myself tagging along, close at Elliot's heels. I don't know how I got up that hill, but I think it was because I was afraid to be left behind. The immediate rear did not look safe. The crowd of strong young marines afforded the only spectacle of provisional security. So I tagged along at Elliot's heels. The hill was as steep as a Swiss roof. From it sprang out great pillars of cactus, and the human instinct was to assist oneself in the ascent by grasping cactus with one's hands. I remember the watch I had to keep upon this human instinct, even when the sound of the bullets was attracting my nervous attention. However, the attractive thing to my sense at the time was the fact that every man of the Marines was also climbing away like mad. It was one thing for Elliot, Spicer, Neville, Shaw, and Banyan. It was another thing for me. But what in the devil was it to the men? Not the same thing, surely. It was perfectly easy for any Marine to get overcome by the burning heat and, lying down, bequeath the work and the danger to his comrades. The fine thing about the men is that you can't explain them. I mean, when you take them collectively. 
They do a thing, and afterward you find that they have done it because they have done it. However, when Elliott arrived at the top of the ridge, myself and many other men were with him. But there was no battle scene. Off on another ridge we could see Lucas's men and the Cubans peppering away into a valley. The bullets about our ears were really intended to lodge in them. We went over there. I walked along the firing line and looked at the men. I kept somewhat on what I shall call the lee side of the ridge. Why? Because I was afraid of being shot. No other reason. Most of the men, as they lay flat, shooting, looked contented, almost happy. They were pleased, these men, at the situation. I don't know. I cannot imagine. But they were pleased, at any rate. I wasn't pleased. I was picturing defeat. I was saying to myself, now if the enemy should suddenly do so-and-so, or so-and-so, why, what would become of me? During these first few moments I did not see the Spanish position, because I was afraid to look at it. Bullets were hissing and spitting over the crest of the hill in such showers as to make observation to be a task for a brave man. No, now, look here. Why the deuce should I have stuck my head up, eh? Why? Well, at any rate, I didn't, until it seemed to be a far less thing than most of the men were doing, as if they liked it. Then I saw nothing. At least it was only the bottom of a small valley. In this valley there was a thicket, a big thicket, and this thicket seemed to be crowded with a mysterious class of persons who were evidently trying to kill us. Our enemies? Yes, perhaps. I suppose so. Leave that to the people in the streets at home. They know and cry against the public enemy, but when men go into actual battle, not one in a thousand concerns himself with an animus against the men who face him. The great desire is to beat them, beat them whoever they are, as a matter, first of personal safety, second of personal glory. It is always safest to make the other chap quickly run away, and as he runs away, one feels as one tries to hit him in the back and knock him sprawling, that he must be a very good and sensible fellow. But these people apparently did not mean to run away. They clung to their thicket, and amid the roar of the firing, one could sometimes hear their wild yells of insult and defiance. They were actually the most obstinate, headstrong, mulish people that you could ever imagine. The dolphin was throwing shells into their immediate vicinity, and the fire from the marines and Cubans was very rapid and heavy. But still those incomprehensible mortals remained in their thicket. The scene on the top of the ridge was very wild, but there was only one truly romantic figure. This was a Cuban officer who held in one hand a great glittering machete, and in the other a cocked revolver. He posed like a statue of victory. Afterwards he confessed to me that he alone had been responsible for the winning of the fight. But outside of this splendid person it was simply a picture of men at work, men terribly hard at work red-faced, sweating, gasping toilers. A Cuban negro soldier was shot through the heart, and one man took the body on his back, and another took it by its feet, and trundled away toward the rear, looking precisely like a wheelbarrow. A man in C Company was shot through the ankle, and he sat behind the line nursing his wound. Apparently he was pleased with it. It seemed to suit him. I don't know why. But beside him sat a comrade, with a face drawn, solemn, and responsible, like that of a New England spinster at the bedside of a sick child. The fight banged away with a roar like a forest fire. Suddenly a marine wriggled out of the firing line and came frantically to me. "'Say, young feller, I'll give you five dollars for a drink of whiskey.' He tried to force into my hand a gold piece. Go to the devil, said I, deeply scandalized. Besides, I haven't got any whiskey. No, but look here, he beseeched me. If I don't get a drink, I'll die, and I'll give you five dollars for it, honest I will. 
I finally tried to escape from him by walking away, but he followed at my heels, importuning me with all the exasperating persistence of a professional beggar, and trying to force this ghastly gold piece into my hand. I could not shake him off, and amid that clatter of furious fighting I found myself intensely embarrassed and glancing fearfully this way and that way to make sure that people did not see me, the villain and his gold. In vain I assured him that if I had any whisky I should place it at his disposal. He could not be turned away. I thought of the European expedient in such a crisis, to jump in a cab, but unfortunately... In the meantime, I had given up my occupation of tagging at Captain Elliot's heels, because his business required that he should go into places of great danger. But from time to time I was under his attention. Once he turned to me and said, "'Mr. Vernal, will you go and satisfy yourself who those people are?' Some men had appeared on a hill about six hundred yards from our left flank. "'Yes, sir,' cried I, with, I assure you, the finest alacrity and cheerfulness, and my tone proved to me that I had inherited histrionic abilities. This tone was, of course, a black lie, but I went off briskly, and was as jaunty as a real soldier, while all the time my heart was in my boots, and I was cursing the day that saw me landed on the shores of the tragic isle. If the men on the distant hill had been guerrillas, my future might have been seriously jeopardized. But I had not gone far toward them when I was able to recognize the uniforms of the Marine Corps. Whereupon I scampered back to the firing line, and with the same alacrity and cheerfulness reported my information. I mentioned to you that I was afraid, because there were about me that day many men who did not seem to be afraid at all men with quiet, composed faces, who went about this business as if they proceeded from a sense of habit. They were not old soldiers, they were mainly recruits, but many of them betrayed all the emotion, and merely the emotion, that one sees in the face of a man earnestly at work. I don't know how long the action lasted. I remember deciding in my own mind that the Spaniards stood forty minutes, this was a mere arbitrary decision, based on nothing, but at any rate we finally arrived at the satisfactory moment when the enemy began to run away. I shall never forget how my courage increased. And then began the great bird-shooting. From the far side of the thicket arose an easy slope covered with plum-coloured bush. The Spaniards broke in coveys of from six to fifteen men, or birds, and swarmed up this slope. The marines on our ridge then had some fine open field shooting. No charge could be made because the shells from the dolphin were helping the Spaniards to evacuate the thicket, so the marines had to be content with this extraordinary paraphrase of a kind of sport. It was strangely like the original. The shells from the dolphin were the dogs, dogs who went in and stirred out the game. The marines were suddenly gentlemen in leggings, alive with the sharp instinct which marks the hunter. The Spaniards were the birds. Yes, they were the birds, but I doubt if they would sympathize with my metaphors. We destroyed their camp, and when the tiled roof of a burning house fell with a crash, it was so like the crash of a strong volley of musketry that we all turned with a start, fearing that we would have to fight again on that same day and this struck me at least as being an impossible thing. They gave us water from the dolphin, and we filled our canteens. None of the men were particularly jubilant. They did not altogether appreciate their victory. They were occupied in being glad that the fight was over. I discovered, to my amazement, that we were on the summit of a hill so high that our released eyes seemed to sweep over half the world. The vast stretch of sea, shimmering like a fragile blue silk in the breeze, lost itself ultimately in an indefinite pink haze, while in the other direction, ridge after ridge, ridge after ridge, rolled brown and arid into the north. The battle had been fought high in the air, where the rain-clouds might have been. 
That is why everybody's face was the colour of beet root, and men lay on the ground and only swore feebly when the cactus spurs sank into them. Finally we started for camp. Leaving our wounded, our cactus pincushions, and our heat prostrated men on board the dolphin, I did not see that the men were elate or even grinning with satisfaction. They seemed only anxious to get to food and rest. And yet it was plain that Elliot and his men had performed a service that would prove invaluable to the security and comfort of the entire battalion. They had driven the guerrillas to take a road along which they would have to proceed for fifteen miles before they could get as much water as would wet the point of a pin. And by the destruction of a well at the scene of the fight, Elliot made an arid zone almost twenty miles wide between the enemy and the base camp. In Cuba this is the best of protections. However, a cup of coffee time enough to think of a brilliant success after one had had a cup of coffee. The long line plodded wearily through the dusky jungle, which was never again to be alive with ambushes. It was dark when we stumbled into camp, and I was sad with an ungovernable sadness, because I was too tired to remember where I had left my kit. But some of my colleagues were waiting on the beach, and they put me on a dispatch boat to take my news to a Jamaica cable station. The appearance of this dispatch boat struck me with wonder. It was reminiscent of something with which I had been familiar in early years. I looked with dull surprise at three men of the engine-room force, who sat aft on some bags of coal, smoking their pipes, and talking as if there had never been any battles fought anywhere. The sudden clang of the gong made me start and listen eagerly, as if I would be asking, What was that? The clunking of the screw affected me also, but I seemed to relate it to a former and pleasing experience. One of the correspondents on board immediately began to tell me of the chief engineer, who, he said, was a comic old character. I was taken to see this marvel, who presented itself as a grey-bearded man with an oil-can who had the cynical, malicious, egotistic eye of proclaimed and admired ignorance. I looked dazedly at the venerable impostor. What had he to do with the battles, the humming click of the locks, the odour of burnt cotton, the bullets, the firing? My friend told the scoundrel that I was just returned from the afternoon's action. He said, that so? And looked at me with a smile, faintly, faintly derisive. You see, I had just come out of my life's most fiery time, and that old devil looked at me with that smile. What colossal conceit! The four times damned doddering old head mechanic of a derelict junk shop. The whole trouble lay in the fact that I had not shouted out with a mingled awe and joy as he stood there in his wisdom and experience, with all his ancient saws and homemade epigrams ready to fire. My friend took me to the cabin. What a squalid hole! My heart sank. The reward after the labor should have been a great airy chamber, a gigantic four-poster, iced melons, grilled birds, wine, and the delighted attendance of my friends. When I had finished my cablegram, I retired to a little shelf of a berth which reeked of oil, while the blankets had soaked recently with sea-water. The vessel heeled to leeward in spasmodic attempts to hurl me out, and I resisted with the last of my strength. The infamous pettiness of it all! I thought the night would never end. But never mind, I said to myself at last, to-morrow at Fort Antonio I shall have a great bath and fine raiment, and I shall dine grandly, and there will be a lager beer on ice, and there will be attendants to run when I touch a bell, and I shall catch every interested romantist in the town and spin him the story of the fight at Cuso. We reached Fort Antonio, and I fled from the cable office to the hotel. I procured the bath, and, as I donned whatever fine raiment I had foraged, I recalled the boy and pompously told him of a dinner, a real dinner, with furbelows and complications, and yet with a basis of sincerity. He looked at me, 
calf-like for a moment, and then he went away. After a long interval, the manager himself appeared and asked me some questions, which led me to see that he thought I had attempted to undermine and disintegrate the intellect of the boy by the elocution of Arabic incantations. Well, never mind. In the end, the manager of the hotel elicited from me that great cry, that cry which during the war rang piteously from thousands of throats, that last grand cry of anguish and despair. Well, then, in the name of God, can I have a cold bottle of beer? Well, you see to what war brings men. War is death, and a plague of the lack of small things, and toil. Nor did I catch my sentimentalists and pour forth my tale to them and thrill, appall, and fascinate them. However, they did feel an interest in me, for I heard a lady at the hotel ask, Who is that chap in the very dirty jack-boots? So you see, that whereas you can be very much frightened upon going into action, you can also be greatly annoyed after you have come out. End of section 15 Story ten of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story ten War Memories Part two. Later I fell into the hands of one of my closest friends, and he mercilessly outlined a scheme for landing to the west of Santiago and getting through the Spanish lines to some place from which we could view the Spanish squadron lying in the harbour. There was rumour that the Vizcaya had escaped, he said, and it would be very nice to make sure of the truth. So we steamed to a point opposite a Cuban camp, which my friend knew, and flung two crop-tailed Jamaica polo ponies into the sea. We followed in a small boat, and were met on the beach by a small Cuban detachment who immediately caught our ponies and saddled them for us. I suppose we felt rather godlike. We were almost the first Americans they had seen, and they looked at us with eyes of grateful affection. I don't suppose many men have the experience of being looked at with the eyes of grateful affection. They guide us to a Cuban camp where, in a little palm-bark hut, a black-faced lieutenant-colonel was lolling in a hammock. I couldn't understand what was said, but at any rate he must have ordered his half-naked orderly to make coffee, for it was done. It was a dark syrup in smoky tin cups, but it was better than the cold bottle of beer which I did not drink in Jamaica. The Cuban camp was an expeditious affair of saplings and palm-bark, tied with creepers. It could be burned to the ground in fifteen minutes, and in ten reduplicated. The soldiers were in appearance an absolutely good-natured set of half-starred ragamuffins. Their breeches hung in threads about their black legs, and their shirts were as nothing. They looked like a collection of real tropic savages at whom some philanthropist had flung a bundle of rags, and some of the rags had stuck here and there. But their condition was now a habit. I doubt if they knew they were half-naked. Anyhow, they didn't care. No more they should. The weather was warm. This lieutenant-colonel gave us an escort of five or six men, and we went up into the mountains, lying flat on our Jamaica ponies, while they went like rats up and down extraordinary trails. In the evening we reached the camp of a major, who commanded the outposts. It was high, high in the hills. The stars were as big as coconuts. We lay in borrowed hammocks, and watched the firelight gleam blood-red on the trees. I remember an utterly naked negro squatting, crimson, by the fire, and cleaning an iron pot. Some voices were singing an Afric wail of forsaken love and death, and at dawn we were to try to steal through the Spanish lines. I was very, very sorry. In the cold dawn the situation was the same, but somehow courage seemed to be in the breaking day. I went off with the others quite cheerfully. 
we came to where the pickets stood behind the bulwarks of stone in frameworks of saplings. They were peering across a narrow cloud-steeped gulch at a dull fire marking a Spanish post. There was some palaver, and then, with fifteen men, we descended the side of this mountain, going down into the chill blue and gray clouds. We had left our horses with the Cuban pickets. We proceeded stealthily, for we were already within range of the Spanish pickets. At the bottom of the canyon it was still night. A brook, a regular salmon stream, brawled over the rocks. There were grassy banks and most delightful trees. The whole valley was a sylvan fragrance. But the guide waved his arm and scowled warningly, and in a moment we were off, threading thickets, climbing hills, crawling through fields on our hands and knees, sometimes sweeping like seventeen phantoms across a Spanish road. I was in a dream, but I kept my eye on the guide, and halted to listen when he halted to listen, and ambled onward when he ambled onward. Sometimes he turned and pantomimed as ably and fiercely as a man being stung by a thousand hornets. Then we knew that the situation was extremely delicate. We were now, of course, well inside the Spanish lines, and we ascended a great hill which overlooked the harbor of Santiago. There, tranquilly at anchor, lay the Oquendo, the Maria Teresa, the Cristobal Colon, the Vizcaya, the Bouton, the Furor. The bay was white in the sun, and the great black-tall armored cruisers were impressive in a dignity massive yet graceful. We did not know that they were all doomed ships, soon to go out to a swift death. My friend drew maps and things, while I devoted myself to complete rest, blinking lazily at the Spanish squadron. We did not know that we were the last Americans to view them alive and unhurt and at peace. Then we retraced our way, at the same noiseless canter. I did not understand my condition until I considered that we were well through the Spanish lines and practically out of danger. Then I discovered that I was a dead man. The nervous force having evaporated, I was a mere corpse. My limbs were of dough, and my spinal cord burned within me as if it were red-hot wire. But just at this time we were discovered by a Spanish patrol, and I ascertained that I was not dead at all. We ultimately reached the foot of the Mother Mountain, on whose shoulders were the Cuban pickets, and here I was so sure of safety that I could not resist the temptation to die again. I think I passed into eleven distinct stupors during the ascent of that mountain, while the escort stood leaning on their Remingtons. We had done twenty-five miles at a sort of a man-gallop, never once using a beaten track, but always going promiscuously through the jungle and over the rocks. And many of the miles stood straight on end, so that it was as hard to come down as it was to go up. But during my stupors the escort stood, mind you, and chatted in low voices. For all the signs they showed, we might have been starting and they had had nothing to eat but mangoes for over eight days. Previous to the eight days they had been living on mangoes and the carcass of a small lean pony. They were, in fact, of the stuff of Fenimore Cooper's Indians, only they made no preposterous orations. At the Major's camp my friend and I agreed that if our worthy escort would send down a representative with us to the coast, we would send back to them whatever we could spare from the stores of our dispatch boat. With one voice the escort answered that they themselves would go the additional four leagues, as in these starving times they did not care to trust a representative. Thank you. They can't do it. They'll peg out. There must be a limit, I said. Uh, no, answered my friend, they're all right. They'd run three times around the whole island for a mouthful of beer. So we saddled up and put off with our fifteen Cuban infantrymen wagging along tirelessly behind us. Sometimes, at the foot of a precipitous hill, a man asked permission to cling to my horse's tail, and then the Jamaican pony would snake him to the summit so swiftly that only his toes seemed to touch the rocks and for this assistance the man was grateful. 
When we crowned the last great ridge, we saw our squadron to the eastward spread in its patient semicircular about the mouth of the harbor. But as we wound towards the beach, we saw a more dramatic thing, our own dispatch boat leaving the rendezvous and putting off to sea. Evidently we were late. Behind me were fifteen stomachs, empty. It was a frightful situation. My friend and I charged for the beach, and those fifteen fools began to run. It was no use. The dispatch boat went gaily away, trailing black smoke behind her. We turned in distress, wondering what we could say to that abused escort. If they massacred us, I felt that it would be merely a virtuous reply to fate, and they should in no ways be blamed. There were some things which a man's feelings will not allow him to endure after a diet of mangoes and pony. However, we perceived to our amazement that they were not indignant at all. They simply smiled and made a gesture which expressed an habitual pessimism. It was a philosophy which denied the existence of everything but mangoes and pony. It was the Americans who refused to be comforted. I made a deep vow with myself that I would come as soon as possible and play a regular Santa Claus to that splendid escort. But we put to sea in a dugout with two black boys. The escort waved us a hearty good-bye from the shore, and I never saw them again. I hope they were all on the police force in the new Santiago. In time we were rescued from the dugout by our dispatch boat, and we relieved our feelings by over-rewarding the two black boys. In fact, they reaped a harvest because of our emotions over our failure to fill the gallant stomachs of the escort. They were two rascals. We steamed to the flagship and were given permission to board her. Admiral Sampson is to me the most interesting personality of the war. I would not know how to sketch him for you, even if I could pretend to sufficient material. Anyhow, imagine, first of all, a marble block of impassivity, out of which is carved the figure of an old man. Endow this with life, and you've just begun. Then you must discard all your pictures of bluff, red-faced old gentlemen who roar against the gale, and understand that the quiet old man is a sailor and an admiral. This will be difficult. If I told you he was anything else, it would be easy. He resembles other types. It is his distinction not to resemble the preconceived type of his standing. When I first met him, I was impressed that he was immensely bored by the war and with the command of the North Atlantic Squadron. I perceived a manner where I thought I perceived a mood, a point of view. Later he seemed so indifferent to small things which bore upon large things that I bowed to his apathy as a thing unprecedented, marvelous. Still I mistook a manner for a mood. Still I could not understand that this was the way of the man. I am not to blame, for my communication was slight and depended upon sufferance, upon, in fact, the traditional courtesy of the navy. But finally I saw that it was all manner, that hidden in his indifferent, even apathetic manner, there was the alert, sure, fine mind of the best sea captain that America has produced since, well, since Farragut. I don't know. I think, well, since Hull. Men follow heartily when they are well led. They balk at trifles when a blockhead cries, go on. For my part, an impressive thing of the war is the absolute devotion to Admiral Sampson's person, no, to his judgment and wisdom, which was paid by his ship commanders, Evans of the Iowa, Taylor of the Oregon, Higginson of the Massachusetts, Phillips of the Texas, and all the other captains, barring one. Once, afterward, they called upon him to avenge himself upon a rival. They were there, and they would have to say, but he said, no, he guessed it wouldn't do any good to the service. Men feared him, but he never made threats. Men tumbled heels over head to obey him, but he never gave a sharp order. 
Men loved him, but he said no word, kindly or unkindly. Men cheered for him, and he said, Who are they yelling for? Men behaved badly to him, and he said nothing. Men thought of glory, and he considered the management of ships. All without a sound, a noiseless campaign on his part. No bunting, no arches, no fireworks, nothing but the perfect management of a big fleet. That is a record for you. No trumpets, no cheers of the populace, just plain, pure, unsauced accomplishment. But ultimately he will reap his reward in... in what? In textbooks on sea campaigns? No more. The people choose their own, and they choose the kind they like. Who has a better right? Anyhow, he is a great man, and when you are once started you can continue to be a great man without the help of bouquets and banquets. He don't need them, bless your heart. The flagship's battle hatches were down, and between decks it was insufferable despite the electric fans. I made my way somewhat forwards past the smart orderly, past the companion, on to the den of the junior mess. Even there they were playing cards in somebody's cabin. Hello, old man. Been ashore? How'd it look? It's your deal, chick. There was nothing but steamy, wet heat, and the decent suppression of the consequent ill-tempers. The junior officer's quarters were no more comfortable than the admiral's cabin. I had expected it to be so because of my remembrance of their gay spirits. But they were not gay. They were sweltering. Hello, old man. Had I been ashore? I fled to the deck, where other officers not on duty were smoking quiet cigars. The hospitality of the officers of the flagship is another charming memory of the war. I rolled into my berth on the dispatch boat that night, feeling a perfect wonder of the day. Was the figure that leaned over the card game on the flagship, the figure with a whiskey and soda in its hand and a cigar in its teeth, was it identical with the figure scrambling, afraid for its life, through Cuban jungle? Was it the figure of the situation of the fifteen pathetic hungry men? It was the same, and it went to sleep, hard sleep. I don't know where we voyaged. I think it was Jamaica, but at any rate, upon the morning of our return to the Cuban coast, we found the sea alive with transports, United States transports from Tampa, containing the Fifth Army Corps under Major General Shafter. The rigging and the decks of these ships were black with men, and everybody wanted to land first. I landed ultimately, and immediately began to look for an acquaintance. The boats were banged by the waves against a little flimsy dock. I fell ashore somehow, but I did not at once find an acquaintance. I talked to a private in the Second Massachusetts Volunteers, who told me that he was going to write war correspondence for a Boston newspaper. This statement did not surprise me. There was a straggly village, but I followed the troops who at this time seemed to be moving out by companies. I found three other correspondents, and it was luncheon time. Somebody had two bottles of bass, but it was so warm that it squirted out in foam. There was no firing, no noise of any kind. An old shed was full of soldiers loafing pleasantly in the shade. It was a hot, dusty, sleepy afternoon. Bees hummed. We saw Major General Lawton standing with his staff under a tree. He was smiling as if he would say, Well, this will be better than chasing Apaches. His division had the advance, and so he had the right to be happy. A tall man with a grey moustache, light but very strong, an ideal cavalryman. He appealed to one all the more because of the vague rumours that his superiors, some of them, were going to take mighty good care that he shouldn't get much to do. It was rather sickening to hear such talk, but later we knew that most of it must have been mere lies. Down by the landing-place a band of correspondents were making a sort of permanent camp. They worked like Trojans, carrying wall-tents, cots, and boxes of provisions. They asked me to join them, but I looked shrewdly at the sweat on their faces and backed away. 
The next day the army left this permanent camp eight miles to the rear. The day became tedious. I was glad when evening came. I sat by a campfire and listened to a soldier of the 8th Infantry, who told me that he was the first enlisted man to land. I lay pretending to appreciate him, but in fact I considered him a great shameless liar. Less than a month ago I learned that every word he said was gospel truth. I was much surprised. We went for breakfast to the camp of the 20th Infantry, where Captain Green and his subaltern, Exton, gave us tomatoes stewed with hard bread and coffee. Later I discovered Green and Exton down at the beach good-naturedly dodging the waves which seemed to be trying to prevent them from washing the breakfast dishes. I felt tremendously ashamed because my cup and my plate were there, you know, and well, fate provides some men greased opportunities for making dizzy jackasses of themselves, and I fell a victim to my flurry on this occasion. I was a blockhead. I walked away blushing. What? The battles? Yes, I saw something of all of them. I made up my mind that the next time I met Green and Exton I'd say, Look here, why didn't you tell me you had to wash your own dishes that morning, so that I could have helped? I felt beastly when I saw you scrubbing there, and me walking around idly. But I never saw Captain Green again. I think he is in the Philippines now, fighting the Tagals. The next time I saw Exton, what? Yes, La Guasimas. That was the Rough Rider fight. However, the next time I saw Exton, I... What do you think? I forgot to speak about it. But if ever I meet Green or Exton again even if it should be twenty years, I am going to say, first thing, why— What? Yes, Roosevelt's regiment and the first and tenth regular cavalry. I'll say, first thing, say, why didn't you tell me you had to wash your own dishes that morning, so that I could have helped? My stupidity will be on my conscience until I die, if before that I do not meet either Green or Exton. Oh, yes, you are howling for blood, but I tell you it is more emphatic that I lost my toothbrush. Did I tell you that? Well, I lost it, you see, and I thought of it for ten hours at a stretch. Oh, yes, he? He was shot through the heart. But look here, I contend that the French cable company buncoed us throughout the war. What? Him? My toothbrush I never found, but he died of his wound in time. Most of the regular soldiers carried their toothbrushes stuck in the bands of their hats. It made a quaint military decoration. I have had a line of a thousand men pass me in the jungle, and not a hat lacking the simple emblem. The first of July? All right. My Jamaica polo pony was not present. He was still in the hills to the westward of Santiago but the Cubans had promised to fetch him to me. But my kit was easy to carry. It had nothing superfluous in it but a pair of spurs which made me indignant every time I looked at them. Oh, I must tell you about a man I met directly after the La Guasimas fight, Edward Marshall, a correspondent whom I had known with a degree of intimacy for seven years, was terribly hit in that fight and asked me if I would not go to Siboney the base, and convey the news to his colleagues of the New York Journal, and round up some assistance. I went to Siboney, and there was not a journal man to be seen, although usually you judged from appearances that the journal staff was about as large as the army. Presently I met two correspondents, strangers to me, but I questioned them, saying that Marshall was badly shot, and wished for such succor as journal men could bring from their dispatch boat, and one of these correspondents replied, He is the man I wanted to describe. I love him as a brother. He said, Marshall? Marshall? Why, Marshall isn't in Cuba at all. He left for New York just before the expedition sailed from Tampa. I said, Beg pardon, but I remarked that Marshall was shot in the fight this morning, and have you seen any journal people? After a pause, he said, I am sure Marshall is not down here at all. He's in New York. I said, 
Pardon me, but I remarked that Marshall was shot in the fight this morning, and have you seen any journal people? He said, No. Now, look here, you must have gotten two chaps mixed somehow. Marshall isn't in Cuba at all. How could he be shot? I said, Pardon me, but I remarked that Marshall was shot in the fight this morning, and have you seen any journal people? He said, But it can't really be Marshall, you know, for the simple reason that he's not down here. I clasped my hands to my temples, gave one piercing cry to heaven, and fled from his presence. I couldn't go on with him. He excelled me at all points. I have faced death by bullets, fire, water, and disease, but to die thus, to willfully batter myself against the ironclad opinion of this mummy, no, no, not that. In the meantime, it was admitted that a correspondent was shot, be his name Marshall, Bismarck, or Louis the Fourteenth. Now, supposing the name of this wounded correspondent had been Bishop Potter, or Jane Austen, or Bernhardt, or Henri Georges Stephane, Adolf Oper de Blowitz, what effect? Never mind. We will proceed to July first. On that morning, I marched with my kit having everything essential save a toothbrush, the entire army put me to shame, since there must have been at least fifteen thousand toothbrushes in the invading force. I marched with my kit on the road to Santiago. It was a fine morning, and everybody, the doomed and the immunes, how could we tell one from the other, everybody was in the highest spirits. We were enveloped in forest, but we could hear, from ahead, everybody peppering away at everybody. It was like the roll of many drums. This was Lawton over El Caney. I reflected with complacency that Lawton's division did not concern me in a professional way. That was the affair of another man. My business was with Kent's division and Wheeler's division. We came to El Poso, a hill at nice artillery range from the Spanish defenses. Here Grimes's battery was shooting a duel with one of the enemy's batteries. Scoville had established a little camp in the rear of the guns, and a servant had made coffee. I invited Wiggum to have coffee, and the servant added some hard biscuit and tinned tongue. I noted that Wiggum was staring fixedly over my shoulder, and that he waved away the tinned tongue with some bitterness. It was a horse, a dead horse. Then a mule, which had been shot through the nose, wandered up and looked at Wiggum. We ran away. On top of the hill one had a fine view of the Spanish lines. We stared across almost a mile of jungle to ash-colored trenches on the military crest of the ridge. A goodly distance back of this position were white buildings, all flying great red cross flags. The jungle beneath us rattled with firing, and the Spanish trenches crackled out regular volleys, but all this time there was nothing to indicate a tangible enemy. In truth, there was a man in a Panama hat, strolling to and fro behind one of the Spanish trenches, gesticulating at times with a walking stick a man in a Panama hat, walking with a stick. That was the strangest sight of my life, that symbol, that quaint figure of Mars. The battle, the thunderous row, was his possession. He was the master. He mystified us all with his infernal Panama hat and his wretched walking stick. From near his feet came volleys, and from near his side came roaring shells, but he stood there alone, visible, the one tangible thing. He was a colossus, and he was half as high as a pin, this being. Always somebody would be saying, Who can that fellow be? Later the American guns shelled the trenches and a blockhouse near them, and Mars had vanished. It could not have been death, one cannot kill Mars, but there was one other figure who arose to symbolic dignity. The balloon of our signal corps had swung over the tops of the jungle's trees toward the Spanish trenches, whereat the balloon and the man in the Panama hat and with a walking stick 
Whereat these two waged tremendous battle. Suddenly the conflict became a human thing. A little group of blue figures appeared on the green of the terrible hillside. It was some of our infantry. The attaché of a great empire was at my shoulder, and he turned to me and spoke with incredulity and scorn. "'Why, they're trying to take the position!' he cried, and I admitted meekly that I thought they were. "'But they can't do it, you know,' he protested vehemently. "'It's impossible!' and, good fellow that he was, he began to grieve and wail over a useless sacrifice of gallant men. "'It's plucky, you know. By God, it's plucky. But they can't do it.' He was profoundly moved. His voice was quite broken. "'It will simply be a hell of a slaughter, with no good coming out of it.' The trail was already crowded with stretcher-bearers and with wounded men who could walk one had to stem a tide of mute agony but i don't know that it was mute agony i only know that it was mute it was something in which the silence or more likely the reticence was an appalling and inexplicable fact one's senses seemed to demand that these men should cry out but you could really find wounded men who exhibited all the signs of a pleased and contented mood when thinking of it now, it seems strange beyond words, but at the time, I don't know, it did not attract one's wonder. A man with a hole in his arm or his shoulder, or even in the leg below the knee, was often whimsical, comic. Well, this ain't exactly what I enlisted for, boys. If I'd been told about this in Tampa, I'd have resigned from the army. Oh, yes, they can get all the same thing if you keep on going, but I think the Spaniards may run out of ammunition in the course of a week or ten days. Then suddenly one would be confronted by the awful majesty of a man shot in the face. Particularly I remember one. He had a great dragoon moustache, and the blood streamed down his face to meet his moustache, even as a torrent goes to meet the jammed log and then swarmed out to the tips, and fell in big, slow drops. He looked steadily into my eyes. I was ashamed to return his glance. You understand? It is very curious, all that. The two lines of battle were royally whacking away at each other, and there was no rest or peace in all that region. The modern bullet is a far-flying bird. It rakes the air with its hot-spitting song at distances which, as a usual thing, place the whole landscape in the danger zone. There was no direction from which they did not come. A chart of their courses over one's head would have resembled a spider's web. My friend Jimmy, the photographer, mounted to the firing line with me, and we gallivanted as much as we dared. The sense of the meeting was curious. Most of the men seemed to have no idea of a grand historic performance, but they were grimly satisfied with themselves. Well, be God, we done it. Then they wanted to know about the other parts of the line. How are things looking, old man? Everything all right? Yes, everything's all right if you can hold this ridge. Ah, hell, said the men, we'll hold the ridge. Don't you worry about that, son. It was Jimmy's first action, and as we cautiously were making our way to the right of our lines, the crash of the Spanish fire became uproarious, and the air simply whistled. I heard a quavering voice near my shoulder, and turning I beheld Jimmy, Jimmy, with a face bloodless, white as paper. He looked at me with eyes opened extremely wide. Say, he said, this is pretty hot, ain't it? I was delighted. I knew exactly what he meant. He wanted to have the situation defined. If I had told him that this was the occasion of some mere idle, desultory fight, and recommended that he wait until the real battle began, I think he would have gone in a bee-line for the rear. But I told him the truth. Yes, Jimmy, I replied earnestly, you can take it from me that this is patent double extra what for and immediately he nodded. All right. If this was a big action, then he was willing to pay in his fright as a rational price for the privilege of being present. 
but if this was only a penny a fray, he considered the price exorbitant and he would go away. He accepted my assurance with a simple faith and deported himself with kindly dignity as one moving amid great things. His face was still pale as paper, but that counted for nothing. The main point was his perfect willingness to be frightened for reasons. I wonder where is Jimmy? I lent him the Jamaica polo pony one day, and it ran away with him and flung him off in the middle of a ford. He appeared to me afterward and made bitter speech concerning this horse, which I had assured him was a gentle and pious animal. Then I never saw Jimmy again. Then came the night of the first of July. A group of correspondents limped back to El Poso. It had been a day so long that the morning seemed as remote as a morning in the previous year. But I have forgotten to tell you about Reuben McNabb. Many years ago I went to school at a place called Claverick in New York State, where there was a semi-military institution. Contemporaneous with me as a student was Reuben McNabb, a long, lank boy, freckled, sandy-haired, an extraordinary boy in no way, and yet, I wager, a boy clearly marked in every recollection. Perhaps there is a good deal in that name, Reuben McNabb. You can't fling that name carelessly over your shoulder and lose it. It follows you like the haunting memory of a sin. At any rate, Reuben McNabb was identified intimately in my thought with the sunny, irresponsible days at Claverick, when all the earth was a green field and all the sky was a rainless blue. Then I looked down into a miserable huddle at Bloody Bend, a huddle of hurt men, dying men, dead men. And there I saw Reuben McNabb, a corporal in the 71st New York Volunteers, and with a hole through his lung, also several holes through his clothing. Well, they got me, he said in greeting. Usually they said that. There were no long speeches. Well, they got me. That was sufficient. The duty of the upright, unhurt man is then difficult. I doubt if many of us learned how to speak to our own wounded. In the first place, one had to play that the wound was nothing, oh, a, a mere nothing, a casual interference with movement, perhaps, but nothing more, oh, really, nothing more. In the second place, one had to show a comrade's appreciation of this sad plight. As a result, I think most of us bungled and stammered in the presence of our wounded friends. That's curious, huh? Well, they got me, said Reuben McNabb. I had looked upon five hundred wounded men with stolidity, or with a conscious indifference which filled me with amazement. But the apparition of Reuben McNabb, the schoolmate, lying there in the mud, with a hole through his lung, awed me into stutterings, set me trembling with a sense of terrible intimacy with this war, which heretofore I could have believed was a dream, almost. Twenty shot men rolled their eyes and looked at me. Only one man paid no heed. He was dying. He had no time. The bullets hummed low over them all. Death, having already struck, still insisted upon raising a venomous crest. If you're going by the hospital, step in and see me, said Reuben McNabb. That was all. At the correspondence camp at El Pozo, there was hot coffee. It was very good. I have a vague sense of being very selfish over my blanket and rubber coat. I have a vague sense of spasmodic firing during my sleep. It rained, and then I awoke to hear that steady drumming of an infantry fire, something which was never to cease, it seemed. They were at it again. The trail from El Pozo to the positions along San Juan Ridge had become an exciting thoroughfare. Shots from large-bore rifles dropped in from almost every side. At this time the safest place was the extreme front. I remember in particular the one outcry I heard. A private in the 71st, without his rifle, had gone to a stream for some water and was returning, being but a little in rear of me. Suddenly I heard this cry, 
Oh, my God, come quick!" and I was conscious then to having heard the hateful zip of a close shot. He lay on the ground, wriggling. He was hit in the hip. Two men came quickly. Presently everybody seemed to be getting knocked down. They went over like men of wet felt, quietly, calmly, with no more complaint than so many automatons. It was only that lad, oh my God, come quick! Otherwise men seemed to consider that their hurts were not worthy of particular attention. A number of people got killed very courteously, tacitly absolving the rest of us from any care in the matter. A man fell. He turned blue. His face took on an expression of deep sorrow, and then his immediate friends worried about him, if he had friends. This was July 1. I crave the permission to leap back again to that date. On the morning of July 2, I sat on San Juan Hill and watched Lawton's division come up. I was absolutely sheltered, but still where I could look into the faces of men who were trotting up under fire. There wasn't a high heroic face among them. They were all men intent on business. That was all. It may seem to you that I am trying to make everything a squalor. That would be wrong. I feel that things were often sublime, but they were differently sublime. They were not of our shallow and preposterous fictions. They stood out in a simple, majestic commonplace. It was the behavior of men on the street. It was the behavior of men. In a way, each man was just pegging along at the heels of the man before him, who was pegging along at the heels of still another man, who was pegging along at the heels of still another man who... It was that in the flat and obvious way. In another way, it was pageantry, the pageantry of the accomplishment of naked duty. One cannot speak of it, the spectacle of the common man serenely doing his work his appointed work. It is the one thing in the universe which makes one fling expression to the winds and be satisfied to simply feel. Thus they moved at San Juan, the soldiers of the United States regular army. One pays them the tribute of the toast of silence. Lying near one of the enemy's trenches was a red-headed Spanish corpse, I wonder how many hundreds were cognizant of this red-headed Spanish corpse. It arose to the dignity of a landmark. There were many corpses, but only one with a red head. This red head. He was always there. Each time I approached that part of the field, I prayed that I might find that he had been buried. But he was always there, red-headed. His strong, simple countenance was a malignant sneer at the system which was forever killing the credulous peasants in a sort of black night of politics, where the peasants merely followed whatever somebody had told them was lofty and good. But nevertheless, the red-headed Spaniard was dead. He was irrevocably dead. And to what purpose? The honor of Spain? Surely the honor of Spain could have existed without the violent death of this poor red-headed peasant. Ah, well, he was buried when the heavy firing ceased, and men had time for such small things as funerals. The trench was turned over on top of him. It was a fine, honorable, soldierly fate to be buried in a trench, the trench of the fight and the death. Sleep well, red-headed peasant. You came to another hemisphere to fight because, because you were told to, I suppose. Well, there you are, buried in your trench on San Juan Hill. That is the end of it. Your life has been taken. That is a flat, frank fact. And foreigners buried you expeditiously while speaking a strange tongue. Sleep well, red-headed mystery. End of section 16. Story 10 of Wounds in the Rain, War Stories, by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 10, War Memories, 
Part Three. On the day before the destruction of Cervara's fleet, I steamed past our own squadron, doggedly lying in its usual semicircle, every nose pointing at the mouth of the harbor. I went to Jamaica, and on the placid evening of the next day I was again steaming past our own squadron, doggedly lying in its usual semicircle, every nose pointing at the mouth of the harbor. A megaphone hail from the bridge of one of the yacht gunboats came casually over the water. Hello? Hear news? No? What was it? The Spanish fleet came out this morning. Oh, of course it did. Honest, I mean. Yes, I know. Well, where are they now? Sunk? Was there ever such a preposterous statement? I was humiliated that my friend, the lieutenant on the yacht gunboat, should have measured me as one likely to swallow this bad joke. But it was all true, every word. I glanced back at our squadron, lying in its usual semicircle, every nose pointing at the mouth of the harbor. It would have been absurd to think that anything had happened. The squadron hadn't changed a button. There it sat, without even a smile on the face of the tiger and it had eaten four armored cruisers and two torpedo-boat destroyers while my back was turned for a moment. Courteously, but clearly, we announced across the waters that until dispatch-boats came to be manned from the ranks of the celebrated horse-marines, the lieutenant's statement would probably remain unappreciated. He made a gesture, abandoning us to our skepticism. It infuriates an honorable and serious man to be taken for a liar or a joker at a time when he is supremely honorable and serious. However, when we went ashore, we found Siboney ringing with the news. It was true, then. That mishandled collection of sick ships had come out and taken the deadly thrashing which was rightfully the due of, well, I don't know, somebody in Spain or perhaps nobody anywhere. One likes to wallop in capacity, but one has mingled emotions over the incapacity which is not so much personal as it is the development of centuries. This kind of incapacity cannot be centralized. You cannot hit the head which contains it all. This is the idea, I imagine, which moved the officers and men of our fleet. Almost immediately they began to speak of the Spanish admiral as poor old boy, with a lucid suggestion in their tones that his fate appealed to them as being undue, hard, undue, cruel. And yet the Spanish guns hit nothing. If a man shoots, he should hit something, occasionally, and men say that from the time the Spanish ships broke clear of the harbor entrance, until they were one by one overpowered, they were each a band of flame. Well, one can only mumble out that when a man shoots he should be required to hit something occasionally. In truth, the greatest fact of the whole campaign on land and sea seemed to be the fact that the Spaniards could only hit by chance, by a fluke. If he had been an able marksman, no man of our two unsupported divisions would have set foot on San Juan Hill on July 1st. They should have been blown to smithereens. The Spaniards had no immediate lack of ammunition, for they fired enough to kill the population of four big cities. I admit neither Velasquez nor Cervantes into this discussion, although they have appeared by authority as reasons for something which I do not clearly understand. Well, anyhow, they couldn't hit anything. Velasquez? Yes. Cervantes? Yes. But the Spanish troops seemed only to try to make a very rapid fire. Thus we lost many men. We lost them because of the simple fury of the fire never because the fire was well-directed, intelligent. But the Americans were called upon to be whipped because of Cervantes and Velasquez. It was impossible. Out on the slopes of San Juan, the dog-tents shone white. Some kind of negotiations were going forward, and men sat on their trousers and waited. It was all rather a blur of talks with officers and a craving for good food and good water. Once Leighton and I decided to ride over to El Caney, 
into which town the civilian refugees from Santiago were pouring. The road from the beleaguered city to the outlying village was a spectacle to make one moan. There were delicate, gentle families on foot, the silly French boots of the girls twisting and turning in a sort of absolute paper futility. There were sons and grandsons carrying the venerable patriarch in his own armchair. There were exhausted mothers with babes who wailed. There were young dandies with their toilettes in decay. There were puzzled, guideless women who didn't know what had happened. The first sentence one heard was the murmurous, What a damn shame! We saw a godless young trooper of the Second Cavalry sharply halt a wagon. Hold on a minute. You must carry this woman. She's fainted twice already. The virtuous driver of the U.S. Army wagon mildly answered, But I'm full up now. You can make room for her said the private of the second cavalry a young young man with a straight mouth it was merely a plain bit of nothing at all but thank god thank god he seemed to have not the slightest sense of excellence he said if you've got any man in there who can walk at all you pull him out and let this woman get in but answered the teamster i'm filled up with a lot of cripples and grandmothers Thereupon they discussed the point fairly, and ultimately the woman was lifted into the wagon. The vivid thing was the fact that these people did not visibly suffer. Somehow they were numb. There was not a tear. There was rarely a countenance which was not wondrously casual. There was no sign of fatalistic theory. It was simply that what was happening today had happened yesterday, as near as one could judge. I could fancy that these people had been thrown out of their homes every day. It was utterly, utterly casual. And they accepted the ministrations of our men in the same fashion. Everything was a matter of course. I had a filled canteen. I was frightfully conscious of this fact, because a filled canteen was a pearl of price. It was a great thing. It was an enormous accident which led one to offer praises that he was luckier than ten thousand better men. As Leighton and I rode along, we came to a tree under which a refugee family had halted. They were a man, his wife, two handsome daughters, and a pimply son. It was plain that they were superior people, because the girls had dressed for the exodus and wore corsets which captivated their forms with a steel-ribbed vehemence only proper for wear on a sun-blistered road to a distant town. They asked us for water. Water was the gold of the moment. Leighton was almost maudlin in his generosity. I remember being angry with him. He lavished upon them his whole canteen and he received in return not even a glance of what acknowledgment no they didn't even admit anything leighton wasn't a human being he was some sort of a mountain spring they accepted him on a basis of pure natural phenomena his canteen was purely an occurrence in the meantime the pimple-faced approached me he asked for water and held out a pint cup my response was immediate. I tilted my canteen and poured into his cup almost a pint of my treasure. He glanced into the cup, and apparently he beheld there some innocent sediment for which he alone or his people were responsible. In the American camps the men were accustomed to a sediment. Well, he glanced at my poor cupful, and then negligently poured it out on the ground and held up his cup for more. I gave him more. I gave him his cup full again, but there was something within me which made me swear him out completely. But he didn't understand a word. Afterward I watched if they were capable of being moved to help on their less able fellows on this miserable journey. Not they, nor yet anybody else. Nobody cared for anybody, save my young friend of the Second Cavalry, who rode seriously to and fro, doing his best for people, who took him as a result of a strange upheaval. 
The fight at El Caney had been furious. General Vera del Rey, with somewhat less than a thousand men (the Spanish accounts say 520), had there made such a stand that only about eighty battered soldiers ever emerged from it. The attack cost Lawton about four hundred men. The magazine rifle. But the town was now a vast parrot cage of chattering refugees. If on the road they were silent, stolid, and serene, in the town they found their tongues and set up such a cackle as one may seldom hear. Notably the women. It is they who invariably confuse the definition of situations, and one could wonder in a maze if this crowd of irresponsible gabbling hens had already forgotten that this town was the deathbed, so to speak, of scores of gallant men whose blood was not yet dry, whose hands, of the hue of pale amber, stuck from the soil of the hasty burial. On the way to El Caney, I had conjured a picture of the women of Santiago, proud in their pain, their despair, dealing glances of defiance, contempt, hatred at the invader, fiery, ferocious ladies, so true to their vanquished and their dead, that they spurned the very existence of the low-bred churls who lacked both Velasquez and Cervantes and instead there was this mere noise which reminded one alternately of a tea-party in ireland a village fete in the south of france and the vacuous morning screech of a swarm of seagulls good there is doña maria this will lower her high head this will teach her better manners to her neighbours she wasn't too grand to send her rascal of a servant to borrow a trifle of coffee of me in the morning and then when i met her on the calle poor dios she was too blind to see me but we were all equal here no little juan has a sore toe yes doña maria many thanks many thanks Juan, do me the favor to be quiet while Doña Maria is asking about your toe. Oh, Doña Maria, we were always poor, always. But you, my heart bleeds when I see how hard this is for you. The old cat, she gives me a head shake. Pushing through the throng in the plaza, we came in sight of the door of the church, and here was a strange scene. The church had been turned into a hospital for Spanish wounded who had fallen into American hands. The interior of the church was too cave-like in its gloom for the eyes of the operating surgeons, so they had had the altar-table carried to the doorway, where there was a bright light. Framed then in the black archway was the altar-table with the figure of a man upon it. He was naked, save for a breech-clout, and so close, so clear was the ecclesiastic suggestion that one's mind leaped to a fantasy that this thin, pale figure had just been torn down from a cross. The flash of the impression was like light, and for this instant it illumined all the dark recesses of one's remotest idea of sacrilege, ghastly and wanton. I bring this to you merely as an effect, an effect of mental light and shade, if you like, something done in thought similar to that which the French Impressionists do in color, something meaningless and at the same time overwhelming, crushing, monstrous. Poor devil! I wonder if he'll pull through, said Leighton. An American surgeon and his assistants were intent over the prone figure. They wore white aprons. Something small and silvery flashed in the surgeon's hand. An assistant held the merciful sponge close to the man's nostrils, but he was writhing and moaning in some horrible dream of this artificial sleep. As the surgeon's instrument played, I fancied that the man dreamed that he was being gored by a bull. In his pleading, delirious babble occurred constantly the name of the Virgin, the Holy Mother. "'Good morning,' said the surgeon. He changed his knife to his left hand and gave me a wet palm. The tips of his fingers were wrinkled, shrunken, like those of a boy who has been in swimming too long. Now, in front of the door, there were three American sentries, and it was their business to 
To do what? To keep this Spanish crowd from swarming over the operating table? It was perforce a public clinic. They would not be denied. The weaker women and the children jostled according to their might in the rear, while the stronger people, gaping in the front rank, cried out impatiently when the pushing disturbed their long stares. One burned with a sudden gift of public oratory. One wanted to say, oh, go away, go away, go away. Leave the man decently alone with his pain, you gogglers. This is not the national sport. But within the church there was an audience of another kind. This was of the other wounded men awaiting their turn. They lay on their brown blankets in rows along the stone floor. Their eyes, too, were fastened upon the operating table, but that was different. Meek-eyed little yellow men lying on the floor awaiting their turns. One afternoon I was seated with a correspondent friend on the porch of one of the houses at Siboney. A vast man on horseback came riding along at a foot-pace. When he perceived my friend, he pulled up sharply. "'Whoa! Where's that mule I lent you?' My friend arose and saluted. "'I've got him all right, General. Thank you,' said my friend. The vast man shook his finger. "'Don't you lose him now?' "'No, sir, I won't.' thank you sir the vast man rode away who the devil is that said i my friend laughed that's general shafter said he i gave five dollars for the bosun small black spry imp of jamaica sin when i first saw him he was the property of a fireman on the Crichton. the fireman had found him a little wharf rat in port antonio it was not the purchase of a slave it was that the fireman believed that he had spent about five dollars on a lot of comic supplies for the bosun including a little suit of sailor clothes the bosun was an adroit and fantastic black gammon his eyes were like white lights and his teeth were a row of little piano keys otherwise he was black he had both been a jockey and a cabin boy and he had the manners of a gentleman after he entered my service, I don't think there was ever an occasion upon which he was useful, save when he told me quaint stories of Guatemala, in which country he seemed to have lived some portion of his infantile existence. Usually he ran funny errands like little foot-races, each about fifteen yards in length. At Siboney he slept under my hammock like a poodle, and I always expected that, through the breaking of a rope, I would some night descend and obliterate him. His incompetence was spectacular. When I wanted him to do a thing, the agony of supervision was worse than the agony of personal performance. It would have been easier to have gotten my own spurs or boots or blanket than to have the bother of this little incapable's service. But the good aspect was the humorous view. He was like a boy, a mouse, a scoundrel, and a devoted servitor. He was immensely popular. His name of Bozen became a Saboni stock word. Everybody knew it. It was a name like hmm, President McKinley, Admiral Sampson, General Shafter. The Bozen became a figure. One day he approached me with four one-dollar notes in United States currency. He besought me to preserve them for him and I pompously tucked them away in my riding-breeches with an air which meant that his funds were now as safe as if they were in a national bank. Still I asked, with some surprise, where he had reaped all this money. He frankly admitted at once that it had been given to him by the enthusiastic soldiery as a tribute to his charm of person and manner. This was not astonishing for Siboney, where money was meaningless. Money was not worth carrying, packing. However, a soldier came to our house one morning and asked, Got any more tobacco to sell? As befitted men in virtuous poverty, we replied with indignation, What tobacco? Why, that tobacco what the little nigger is selling round. I said, Bosun. He said, Yes, master. Wounded men on bloody stretchers were being carried into the hospital next door. "'Bosun, you've been stealing my tobacco.' 
His defence was as glorious as the defence of that forlorn hope in romantic history which drew itself up and mutely died. He lied as desperately, as savagely, as hopelessly as ever man fought. One day a delegation from the 33rd Michigan came to me and said, Are you the proprietor of the Bozen? I said, Yes. And they said, Well, would you please be so kind as to be so good as to give him to us? A big battle was expected for the next day. Why, I answered, If you want him, you can have him. But he's a thief, and I won't let him go save on his personal announcement. The big battle occurred the next day, and the bosun did not disappear in it. But he disappeared in my interest in the battle, even as a waif might disappear in a fog. My interest in the battle made the bosun dissolve before my eyes. Poor little rascal! I gave him up with pain. He was such an innocent villain. He knew no more of thievery than the whole of it. Anyhow, one was fond of him. He was a natural scoundrel. He was not an educated scoundrel. One cannot bear the educated scoundrel. He was ingenious, simple, honest, abashed ruffianism. I hope the 33rd Michigan did not arrive home naked. I hope the bosun did not succeed in getting everything. If the bosun builds a palace in Detroit, I shall know where he got the money. He got it from the 33rd Michigan. Poor little man! He was only eleven years old. He vanished. I had thought to preserve him as a relic, even as one preserves forgotten bayonets and fragments of shell. And now, as to the pocket of my riding breeches, it contained four dollars in United States currency. Bosun! Eh, Bosun! Where are you? The morning was the morning of battle. I was on San Juan Hill when Lieutenant Hobson and the men of the Merrimack were exchanged and brought into the American lines. Many of us knew that the exchange was about to be made and gathered to see the famous party. Some of our staff officers rode out with three Spanish officers, prisoners, these latter being blindfolded before they were taken through the American position. The army was majestically minding its business in the long line of trenches when its eye caught sight of this little procession. "'What's that? What are they going to do? They're going to exchange Hobson.' Wherefore every man who was foot-free staked out a claim where he could get a good view of the liberated heroes, and two bands prepared to collaborate on the star-spangled banner. There was a very long wait through the sunshiny afternoon. In our impatience we imagined them, the Americans and Spaniards, dickering away out there under the big tree like so many peddlers. Once the massed bands, misled by a rumor, stiffened themselves into that dramatic and breathless moment when each man is ready to blow, but the rumor was exploded in the nick of time. We made ill jokes, saying one to another that the negotiations had found diplomacy to be a failure and were playing freeze-out poker for the whole batch of prisoners. But suddenly the moment came. Along the cut roadway, toward the crowded soldiers, rode three men, and it could be seen that the central one wore the undress uniform of an officer of the United States Navy. Most of the soldiers were sprawled out on the grass, bored and wearied in the sunshine. However, they aroused at the old circus parade, torchlight procession cry, Here they come! Then the men of the regular army did a thing. They arose en masse and came to attention. Then the men of the regular army did another thing. They slowly lifted every weather-beaten hat and drooped it until it touched the knee. Then there was a magnificent silence, broken only by the measured hoof-beats of the little company's horses as they rode through the gap. It was solemn, funereal, this splendid, silent welcome of a brave man by men who stood on a hill which they had earned out of blood and death, simply, honestly, with no sense of excellence, earned out of blood and death. Then suddenly the whole scene went to rubbish. Before he reached the bottom of the hill, Hobson was bowing to right and left like another boulanger, 
and above the thunder of the massed bands one could hear the venerable outbreak, Mr. Hobson, I'd like to shake the hand of the man who... But the real welcome was that welcome of silence. However, one could thrill again when the tail of the procession appeared, an army wagon containing the blue jackets of the Merrimack adventure. I remember grinning heads stuck out from under the canvas cover of the wagon, and the army spoke to the navy. Well, Jackie, how does it feel? And the navy spoke up and answered, Great! Much obliged to you fellers for coming here. Say, Jackie, what did they arrest you for, anyhow? Stealing a dog? But the navy still grinned. Here was no rubbish. Here was the mere exchange of language between men. Some of us fell in behind this small but royal procession, and followed it to General Shafter's headquarters some miles on the road to Saboni. I have a vague impression that I watched the meeting between Shafter and Hobson, but the impression ends there. However, I remember hearing a talk between them as to Hobson's men, and then the Blue Jackets were called up to hear the congratulatory remarks of the General in command of the Fifth Army Corps. It was a scene in the fine shade of thickly-leaved trees. The general sat in his chair, his belly sticking ridiculously out before him, as if he had adopted some form of artificial inflation. He looked like a joss. If the seamen had suddenly begun to burn a few sticks, most of the spectators would have exhibited no surprise. But the words he spoke were proper, clear, quiet, soldierly the words of one man to others. The jackies were comic. At the bidding of their officer they aligned themselves before the general, grinned with embarrassment one to the other, made funny attempts to correct the alignment, and looked sheepish. They looked sheepish. They looked like bad little boys flagrantly caught. They had no sense of excellence. Here was no rubbish. Very soon after this the end of the campaign came for me. I caught a fever. I am not sure to this day what kind of a fever it was. It was defined variously. I know, at any rate, that I first developed a languorous indifference to everything in the world. Then I developed a tendency to ride a horse even as a man lies on a cot. Then I—I I am not sure— I think I groveled and groaned about Saboni for several days. My colleagues, Scovel and George Ree, found me and gave me of their best, but I didn't know whether London Bridge was falling down or whether there was a war with Spain. It was all the same. What of it? Nothing of it. Everything had happened, perhaps. But I cared not a jot. Life, death, dishonor, all were nothing to me. All I cared for was pickles, pickles at any price, pickles. If I had been the father of a hundred suffering daughters, I should have waved them all aside and remarked that they could be damned for all I cared. It was not a mood. One can defeat a mood. It was a physical situation. Sometimes one cannot defeat a physical situation. I heard the talk of Saboni, and sometimes I answered, but I was as indifferent as the starfish flung to die on the sands. The only fact in the universe was that my veins burned and boiled. Rhea finally staggered me down to the army surgeon who had charge of the proceedings, and the army surgeon looked me over with a keen, healthy eye. Then he gave a permit that I should be sent home. The manipulation from the shore to the transport was something which was Rea's affair. I am not sure whether we went in boat or a balloon. I think it was a boat. Rea pushed me on board, and I swayed meekly and unsteadily towards the captain of the ship, a corpulent, well-conditioned, impickled person, pacing noisily on the spar-deck. Ahem, yes, well, all right. Have you got your own food? I hope, for Christ's sake, you don't expect us to feed you, do you? Whereupon I went to the rail, and weakly yelled at Ray, but he was already afar. The captain was, meantime, remarking in bellows that for Christ's sake I couldn't expect him to feed me. I didn't expect to be fed. I didn't care to be fed. 
I wished for nothing on earth but some form of painless pause, oblivion. The insults of this old pie stuffed scoundrel did not affect me then. They affect me now. I would like to tell him that although I like collies, fox terriers, and even screw curled poodles, I do not like him. He was free to call me superfluous and throw me overboard, but he was not free to coarsely speak to a somewhat sick man. I, in fact, hate him. It is all wrong. I lose whatever ethics I possessed, but I hate him, and I demand that you should imagine a milk cow endowed with a knowledge of navigation and in command of a ship, and perfectly capable of commanding a ship. Oh, well, never mind. I was crawling along the deck when someone pounced violently upon me and thundered, Who in hell are you, sir? I said I was a correspondent. He asked me did I know that I had yellow fever. I said no. He yelled, Well, by God, you isolate yourself, sir. I said, Where? At this question he almost frothed at the mouth. I thought he was going to strike me. Where? he roared. How in hell do I know, sir? I know as much about this ship as you do, sir, but you isolate yourself, sir. My clouded brain tried to comprehend these orders. This man was a doctor in the regular army, and it was necessary to obey him, so I bestirred myself to learn what he meant by those guerrilla outcries. All right, doctor, I'll isolate myself, but I wish you'd tell me where to go. And then he passed into such volcanic humor that I clung to the rail and gasped, Isolate yourself, sir, isolate yourself. That's all I've got to say, sir. I don't give a goddamn where you go, but when you get there, stay there, sir. So I wandered away and ended up on the deck aft with my head against the flagstaff and my limp body stretched on a little rug. I was not at all sorry for myself. I didn't care a tent peg, and yet as I look back upon it now, the situation was fairly exciting a voyage of four or five days before me, no food, no friends, above all else no friends, isolated on deck, and rather ill. When I returned to the United States I was able to move my feminine friends to tears by an account of this voyage, but after all it wasn't so bad. They kept me on my small reservation aft, but plenty of kindness loomed soon enough. At mess-time they slid me a tin plate of something, usually stewed tomatoes and bread. Men are always good men, and at any rate most of the people were in worse condition than I, poor bandaged chaps looking sadly down at the waves. In a way I knew the kind. First lieutenants at forty years of age, captains at fifty, majors at a hundred and two, lieutenant colonels at six hundred and twenty, full colonels at a thousand, and brigadiers at nine million seven hundred sixty-eight thousand two hundred and ninety-five plus. A man had to live two billion years to gain eminent rank in the regular army at that time, and of course they all had trembling wives at remote western posts waiting to hear the worst, the best, or the middle. In rough weather the officers made a sort of common pool of all the sound legs and arms, and by dint of hanging hard to each other they managed to move from their deck-chairs to their cabins, and from their cabins again to their deck-chairs. Thus they lived until the ship reached Hampton Roads. We slowed down opposite the curiously mingled hotels and batteries at Old Point Comfort, and at our masthead we flew the yellow flag the grim ensign of the plague. Then we witnessed something which informed us that with all this shipload of wounds and fevers and starvations we had forgotten the fourth element of war. We were flying the yellow flag, but a launch came and circled swiftly about us. There was a little woman in the launch, and she kept looking and looking and looking. Our ship was so high that she could see only those who rung at the rail. But she kept looking and looking and looking. It was plain enough. It was all plain enough. But my heart sank with the fear that she was not going to find him. 
but presently there was a commotion among some black doughboys of the twenty fourth infantry and two of them ran aft to colonel liscomb its gallant commander their faces were wreathed in darky grins of delight colonel ain't dat miss liscomb colonel what said the old man he got up quickly and appeared at the rail his arm in a sling he cried alice the little woman saw him and instantly she covered up her face with her hands as if blinded with a flash of white fire she made no outcry it was all in this simply swift gesture but we we knew them it told us it told us the other part and in a vision we all saw our own harbor lights that is to say those of us who had harbor lights i was almost well and had defeated the yellow fever charge which had been brought against me and so i was allowed ashore among the first and now happened a strange thing a hard campaign full of wants and lacks and absences brings a man speedily back to an appreciation of things long disregarded or forgotten in camp somewhere in the woods between saboni and santiago i happened to think of ice cream soda i had done very well without it for many years in fact i think i loathe it but i got to dreaming of ice cream soda and i came near dying of longing for it i couldn't get it out of my mind try as i would to concentrate my thoughts upon the land crabs and mud with which i was surrounded it certainly had been an institution of my childhood but to have a ravenous longing for it in the year eighteen ninety eight was about as illogical as to have a ravenous longing for kerosene all i could do was to swear to myself that if i reached the united states again i would immediately go to the nearest soda-water fountain and make it look like spanish fours in a loud firm voice i would say orange please and here is the strange thing as soon as i was ashore i went to the nearest soda-water fountain and in a firm loud voice i said orange please i remember one man who went mad that way over tinned peaches and who wandered over the face of the earth saying plaintively have you got any peaches most of the wounded and sick had to be tabulated and marshalled in sections and thoroughly officialized so that i was in time to take a position on the veranda of chamberlain's hotel and see my late shipmates taken to the hospital the veranda was crowded with women in light charming summer dresses and with spruce officers from the fortress it was like a bank of flowers it filled me with awe all this luxury and refinement and gentle care and fragrance and color seemed absolutely new then across the narrow street on the veranda of the hotel there was a similar bank of flowers two companies of volunteers dug a lane through the great crowd in the street and kept the way and then through this lane there passed a curious procession i had never known that they looked like that such a gang of dirty ragged emaciated half-starved bandaged cripples i had never seen naturally there were many men who couldn't walk and some of these were loaded upon a big flat car which was in tow of a trolley car then there were many stretchers slow moving when the crowd began to pass the hotel the banks of flowers made a noise which could make one tremble perhaps it was a moan perhaps it was a sob but no it was something beyond either a moan or a sob anyhow the sound of women weeping was in it the sound of women weeping and how did these men of famous deeds appear when received thus by the people did they smirk and look as if they were bursting with the desire to tell everything which had happened no they hung their heads like so many jailbirds most of them seemed to be suffering from something which was like stage fright during the ordeal of this chance but supremely eloquent reception no sense of excellence that was it evidently they were willing to leave the clacking to all those natural-born major-generals who after the war talked enough to make a great fall in the price of that commodity all over the world 
the episode was closed, and you can depend upon it that I have told you nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. End of section 17